I've always been a believer in both religion and the paranormal. I would see shadows standing outside my door when I was at my dad's house, and I would see and hear the occasional door slam. I never really thought my mom's house was haunted, though. Sometimes things would be out of place, but that's about as far as it would go. This one instance in particular, however, has changed my whole perspective on my mother's home. It was about one in the morning and I was playing PS4 with some friends from back home. My grandmother was sitting in her lazy boy and my brother was getting in the shower. we just gotten through a game when all of a sudden I heard an eight note jingle of we wish you a merry Christmas. It sounded straight up like some kind of festive ringtone. I ignored it at first as I assumed that it was coming from my brother's phone. But he always brings his phone with him into the bathroom when he showers, so I didn't know what to think. The source of the sound was coming from the back room just opposite of mine. It was a decrepit old room filled with toys from my childhood, as well as some leftover decorations. I tried to ignore it, but it persisted, growing louder. I finally got up and walked toward the room, hesitantly. I could hear it coming from just to my left side as I was about to enter the room. And then it stopped, without warning. It didn't finish the tune like it was a toy off the rails. It was as if it sensed my presence and just decided to cease. I was both creeped out and dumbfounded. I looked around in that room for at least 30 minutes, but I have seen all of our Christmas decorations and we don't have anything that plays a jingle like that. I know this sounds silly, but I couldn't sleep that night. The air felt a lot heavier, and I just couldn't sleep. I felt something was watching me from that back room. I've tried to find anything that resembles that jingle on YouTube, but to no avail. I mean, surely I've heard we wish you a Merry Christmas, but not the same sound and tone like this thing. I've honestly never heard anything like it. It freaks the hell out of me. Last night, I went to pick up my dog from my dad's house and something really weird happened. It was around 10 p.m and I picked up my dog. I've driven from my dad's house at night a thousand times, and I know the road back like the back of my hand. He lives on a ranch, and to get back to the freeway, you have to turn left when the road forks. So I'm driving to the end of this road, but the fork never comes. I keep driving on and on and on, but the road isn't ending. After a good 10 minutes, and note that this road is rather short and should have only taken me about two minutes, the road finally forks. I make a left, and on the side of the road I see glowing eyes, like cat eyes. Then the road just ends into a big ditch. This road should have led to the freeway. I turned around and started driving back, when all of a sudden a dog jumps on the side of my car this thing is growling and snarling at the window. This is gonna sound lame, but it's the truth. I got chills and a really bad feeling of dread, and I'm like 90% sure that that was not a dog. I slowed down, panicking, because I thought I was going to accidentally hit this dog. I love dogs, even demonic ones. But then it just disappears. I looked around the car with my flashlight, and this thing was just gone. I floored it out of there and turned back onto what I thought was the main road, and kept driving. I got the GPS to navigate back to my house, and it said that I was a little less than 10 miles away from the freeway. This is literally impossible, because the road that my dad lives on is not that long, nor does it lead to any other road that long. I was so panicked that I floored it home, and I forgot to expand the map to see where the heck I was. Once I got home and calmed down, I went on Google Earth to try to see where I went. 
and it doesn't exist. There is not a single road that long, nor anything that resembles what I saw anywhere in that area. I have no clue what happened, and my friend and I are convinced that I traveled into an alternate universe for a little bit last night, that the cat that turned into the dog was a skinwalker. Whatever else, we don't really know. This is something my grandma told me. It was summer in the late 70s. My grandpa was stationed in California while my grandma, mom, and uncle were living in Oklahoma. My grandma and great-grandpa decided to take a trip with the kids to visit my grandpa in California. They made it there safely and had a really good time while they were there. The morning they left, my great-grandpa called my great-grandma back in Oklahoma to let her know they were about to hit the road. It was about a three-day drive, taking the scenic route and stopping to sleep at rest stops. It was a normal trip, my mom and her younger brother playing in the back seat. They had made it to New Mexico and were only about eight hours away from home, when they were suddenly hit by a freak blizzard. They could barely see where they were going, so they were driving slowly and looking for somewhere safe to pull over and wait out the storm. They saw a bunch of lights on the road coming toward them, and assuming it was emergency vehicles, they pulled over to the side of the road to let them pass. The next thing they know, an officer tapped on their window, waking them all up and asking them to move along. They were confused, but just kind of brushed it off, thinking maybe they had just decided to sleep where they were rather than continue driving through the blizzard. Except, when they started to look around, there was no snow. There was no sign whatsoever of any storm. They stopped at a gas station, and my grandma said something to the attendant about the storm. He didn't say anything, but looked at her like she was nuts. They got back on the road and were home that evening. When they got home, my great-grandma was in a full panic, asking them what the hell happened to them. Apparently, it had been ten days since my great-grandpa called to say they were heading home. They all have an entire week of their life missing, and they have no idea what happened to them, or where they were during that week. It's currently 12.03 a.m. and I'm still processing what happened today. I was home with just my nephew, who was taking a shower so nobody could have opened the door. A little backstory. My dog Ziggy and I were outside so he could take care of business. When he was done, we came back in. As we're coming inside, my nephew is pulling up. He comes in and gets in the shower. I come into my bedroom, leaving Ziggy in the living room. I walk up to my bedroom window, and I see Ziggy running from the china berry tree in the yard to the corner of the house. Instantly tripping, I run from the bedroom to the front door, which is right by my bedroom. I open the door and call for him. As I'm calling his name, my nephew opens the bathroom door. He's right here, he says. Now when I tell you my mind was warped, I mean it was gone. I stood there for five minutes, staring. I didn't know what to think. He was literally just running in the yard two seconds ago. How the hell did that happen? I was so confused. Has this happened to anybody else? I was 18 and living in a big house in a small village with my mom. We had a large garden with a designated area for our eight rabbits. Every evening, we would take turns to go out to feed the animals before it got dark. However, this particular evening, we had arrived home so late that it was already darker than usual. We agreed to feed the rabbits together because it can be quite creepy out in the garden alone at night. I went to the bathroom and told my mom that I would meet her out there in a minute. 
When I was done, I went straight to the garden, where I heard my mom call, Jess? As she heard the door close behind me. I answered, yes, and I saw her upper body pop up from behind the trampoline to make sure it was me. There were no lights outside. However, the combination of the moon, stars, and distant low light of the motorway was enough to illuminate the area to be able to see quite clearly. I was only around 10 meters from her, so I could see her face and her very distinct big curly blonde hair. She said, okay, and bent back down behind the trampoline to continue feeding the rabbits. I looked down at the grass as I made my way to the bottom of the garden, so as not to step in any holes dug out by the rabbits during their runaround time. As I made my way down, I spoke to her about how naughty one of the rabbits was acting that day. It took me no longer than seven seconds to get to the rabbit area. As I approached behind the trampoline where the rabbit's hutches were, I looked up and expected to see my mom standing there, as I had just seen and spoken to her a few moments before. She wasn't there. I looked around for a few seconds thinking she might be hiding in order to give me a playful scare, when, to my horror, I heard the back door of the house close. I looked up quickly and saw my mom walking out into the garden. I immediately speed walked up that garden toward her so fast with total terror in my eyes. She asked me what was the matter and I just said, I'm never going down there again. I just saw you and spoke to you and by the time I got down there, you were gone. Then you walked out the door. She looked at me wide-eyed and assured me that she had been in the kitchen getting her shoes on the entire time. She's not skeptical at all about these kinds of things, and from the look on my face, she could tell that I had experienced quite a scare, so she believed me straight away. We were both quite nervous about going back down there. However, the rabbits needed feeding, so we had a nervous laugh and cautiously went down to feed the rabbits together. We had a look around, and there was nothing there. I don't know who or what I spoke to in my garden. Maybe it was a glitch in the matrix and my mom from another timeline appeared to feed my rabbits. Or perhaps some darker forces were at work that night. I've read a little bit about doppelgangers and how some people recognize them as warnings of death. I don't know if it's related, but not long after this incident, half the rabbits dropped dead within a few days of each other. I still can't explain what happened. I'm not sure if this is a numerical glitch or just an uncanny coincidence. This story isn't anywhere near as interesting or eerie as some of the stuff I've seen and heard. It might be one of those guess you had to be there stories. But this rather strange thing happened to me and I strongly feel like it was either a glitch or a synchronicity of some sort and I've always wanted to tell this story. When I was in my early teens, I always liked the numbers 2549. They were just my favorite numbers, specifically those four, specifically in that order. I don't know why, but I always felt like they rolled off the tongue, and being a dumbass kid, I'd go around saying, 2549, 2549. If I needed a password for something, it was 2549. When my parents let me choose their lottery numbers, it was 2549. My brother would always tell me to shut up and that nobody cared about my favorite numbers and that they weren't cool or significant in any way. I knew that. I just liked them. Fast forward to me turning 14. I got my first cell phone. My parents were very strict. I never had a phone as a child. Anyway, I'm really bad with technology. So I asked my tech savvy brother to help me with setting it up and with SIM activation and whatnot. A few minutes after fiddling around, he looks at me in disbelief. He goes, Lainey, have you seen your cell phone number? I hadn't even looked at it, let alone tried to memorize it. So I was like, no, why do you ask? He was like, come over here and have a look. I swear that the last four digits of my cell phone number were 2549 in that order. My favorite four numbers, in the correct order, just happened to be the last four digits of my first cell phone number, a randomly generated number that nobody had picked. 
My brother is the only one who understands the strangeness of it, because he had heard me harp on about those numbers our entire childhood. We both just stared at it and then laughed at how coincidental it all was. To this day, my phone number is still the same, and I always chuckle to myself when I give people my number, because I still enjoy saying the numbers out loud, just as I did when I was a kid. Life is weird. My mother is the sweetest woman. Sometimes, she slips money into my wallet for things, even though at this point in my life I don't really need it, thankfully. I recently used my PayPal account to order and ship something for her, because she had forgotten the password to her own account. It cost about $20, and I never thought about it again. She, not surprisingly, left a $20 bill on my kitchen counter a week or so later. I found it after she left, stuck it in my purse, and then went to sleep. I randomly remembered it a couple of days later, and I sent her a quick text message while she was at work that said, Oh, I did find that $20 you left. Thank you. That's all it said. She sent me a message about an hour later that said, That was the cutest picture of you, but now I can't find it. I asked which photo, because of course all I had sent was the text no photo. She said she was busy at work, but on the screen, she saw the small unread text and a photo, so she quickly opened it to see the full photo of me. She showed it to her co-worker, so she's not the only one who saw this. She described the photo. She said I was holding a $20 bill right under my face and cheesing hard. She described my shirt and my hairstyle. Here's the thing. She described exactly how I was dressed, and exactly how I had done my hair that day. But I am a million percent sure that I never took a photo, nor did I send her one. Just a thank you text. She was trying to figure out how I could delete the photo after sending it to her phone. If that is possible, I certainly am not capable of doing it, nor would I. All I can think is that there was some kind of glitch. This isn't the first time I've experienced a glitch, but it is the first in a long time, and I just thought I would share. Let me just start this off by saying that in our culture, Apple trees are said to be cursed. They're said to be homes for children who died young, women who were killed or died while pregnant, and things like that. It is said that if you pick an apple or a leaf off the tree, you're going to have bad luck, or even die. My half-sister lives in an old village in Bosnia, and many deaths happened there, so it would be no surprise that elders said the trees were cursed and that the kids shouldn't eat the apples that were on them. Apparently in the 30s, a pregnant woman died of blood loss while giving birth underneath that tree, the one that's in front of my half-sister's house. It was common for women to give birth under trees in that village, and it's not a myth because her grave can actually be found in the graveyard, and some of her family members are still alive to confirm it. Anyway, my niece and I, as the foolish kids we were, shook the tree one day until a bunch of apples fell down. We put them in a bucket and ate a couple, and threw the rest into a lake near my half-sister's house, just for fun. Around one month later, I came back to the village for my half-brother's wedding, and saw that the tree was gone. I asked my sister about this, but all she said was, there never was a tree there. Everybody knew about this tree. Everybody talked about this tree but now everybody's acting like it never was there. I am legit so creeped out. A few years ago in college, I was on a dance team. 
Every fall, we would hold auditions, and a new girl would join the team. Her nickname to me is Panda, so that's what I'm going to call her for this story. She was really nice, but I also didn't think much of it, as she was just an acquaintance at this point. Anyway, I was going through some dark shit in college, and I was journaling one day. I remember specifically writing a line like, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. Immediately after writing that, Panda's name popped into my head. It's almost like it was implanted in my head, rather than a thought that came from the conscious me. I wrote her name with a question mark after it. I didn't really know what to think. It was entirely random to me. At this point, I hadn't known her well enough to assume that she'd been going through anything. I wasn't sure what made me write her name down after that statement, but I moved along with my journaling. Later that same day, our dance team met at a party, and I could tell that something was off with her. Based on the weirdness of journaling earlier that day, I felt compelled to pull her aside and ask what was wrong. It turns out she was struggling with self-harm, which I could entirely relate to based on my past. I was taken aback. That's a weird enough coincidence. But what really floored me is that right after she admitted that to me, she said, I don't want to be here anymore, and I don't know what to do about it. It was the exact sentence I had written in my journal with her name next to it with a question mark. I guess it could be considered a common statement, and I know that it's not the craziest glitch in the matrix if that's even what it is, but I'm also not somebody that expects things like this to happen to me. I know the universe is weird, but my life feels very average and normal. What are the chances that I would write something down like that with her name next to it, hours before it was said to me, accurately predicting who was going to say it? Ultimately, she and I ended up becoming best friends, and it was that day that made all the difference. But it still weirds me out to this day. Last year, I was off work for five months because of tumors in my throat. After surgery, I started a new job and my first week back at work, I was cashing through a lady who had two carts full of stuff, so obviously I was helping her for a while. She had her daughter with her, who was probably 12 to 14 and was very high on the autism spectrum. She wasn't nonverbal per se, but she apparently didn't like to talk to strangers at all and generally preferred not to speak whatsoever. Her mom said that there are only three people she ever speaks to, otherwise she ignores everybody. So anyway, she's talking to me the whole time, telling me about the balloon she's getting and how she likes going to stores, which had her mom so happy and surprised she was trying not to cry. The girl was talking to me the entire time, and I was honored. Then, suddenly the girl asks, so how's your throat feeling? Her mom looks at her and says, that's such an odd question to ask someone. Why are you asking her that? The mom laughs and the girl asks me again. I told her it's feeling pretty good and I asked how hers is. She said, mine's good too, but I was worried about you. It was so weird and her mom's like, sorry, I don't know why she's being so odd. I told her, no, it's okay. It's just super ironic because I just had surgery on my throat in April. The girl goes, yeah, I know, that's why I asked. The mom freaked out, thinking her daughter must be sensitive or have a connection to the world that we can't understand. I have no idea what it was, if it was a glitch or an encounter with someone who was psychic, but it was really strange and kind of beautiful. I wondered if maybe she knew me in another dimension, or maybe she's just in tune with another dimension. Maybe time is more fluid to her and she can know these things. Maybe another me met her before my surgery. Maybe it was just coincidence though, who knows. But it was interesting nonetheless.
When I was about four years old, my great grandpa gave me a soft clown doll for Christmas. It had long noodly arms and legs and it was about the same length as me. I liked clowns at the time. The 80s were a different time and I was a bit of a strange kid anyway. So I never thought about them in any kind of negative way. I used to lay it down parallel with me in bed between me and the wall and would usually wake up to find it on the floor as I usually turn over and am generally restless during the night. One morning I woke up laying on my left hand side facing into the room and my back facing toward the wall. I woke up aware of some movement behind me out of the corner of my right eye. So I turned my head slowly to see that this thing was sitting up from the waist and had its head turned almost right around so it was looking down at my face. Its head was flicking slightly from side to side in the same way that people do when they look at different parts of your face. I didn't understand what was happening beyond knowing that this wasn't right, so I started to sit up and turn to face it. As I did, its head turned back and it lowered itself slowly back down to the bed until it was just laid there staring at the ceiling and lifeless again. I know I wasn't pushing it against the wall or moving it in any way. My own hand could have been doing it from an angle, but seeing as both hands were in front of me, I don't think that was the case either. It was daylight and morning. It just wasn't right. I threw the thing across the room and ran to my parents' bedroom. Nothing happened with it again or any other toys after that. My great grandpa was still alive at that point, so it's not like he was haunting me. I'm pretty sure nobody will believe this story because it sounds like a scene out of a movie. It's easy to say that I must have just remembered it wrongly or been mistaken, but I know what I saw and I'll never forget it because it forever changed the way I look at everything. Years ago, I worked at a mall. I was assigned the evening shift, so there was never that much action. I would usually come into work and just read a book or call some of my old friends to see how they were doing. The fun of this job all changed eventually. One evening, my manager decided to come in and keep me company. My manager and I developed a close friendship. I was leaning against the counter talking to her and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black shadow man dash right by me, heading to the back of the store. The back of the store is locked, so nobody can gain entrance or exit through that way. I asked my manager if she saw it, and she did not. I searched the whole store to find nobody and nothing weird. I just thought my mind was playing tricks on me. Another night, I was working by myself when I heard a loud bang. The store I worked in was one of those mystery room games where people would solve clues to break out, like an escape room. One of the themes of the room was special ops, so the loud bang was from a military helmet prop. I realized that some things may fall, but this object was tightly secured on a shelf. Plus, military helmets are not the lightest of objects. It's not like they get blown off. Another night when I was working there alone, I was reading a book by my favorite author, Stephen King. I believe the book was It. Very faintly, I heard my name called. Again, I looked all through the store and nobody was there. I thought I was just a crazy person. About an hour later, I felt a hand on my shoulder and the hand exerted some force. This freaked me out. I closed the store about an hour early and went home. All the activity got quiet for a few months and I started working the morning shifts. My manager asked me to come in early so I could reset some of the rooms from the previous night. About 30 minutes into my shift, I get a phone call from a strange but normal looking number. I picked up the phone and all I heard was static for a while. Very faintly, I could hear a man talking. Then all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a robot, like in the movies say my name and hang up. I legit thought I was losing my mind at this point. 
On my last day of work before leaving for university, I was saying goodbye to my coworker. She just casually mentions how lucky I am to leave this spooky place. I felt relieved because she shared similar stories to mine. About a year after I quit, somebody on a forum page asked if anybody had had experiences at this particular mall. I told them some of the same stories I just told you, and it turns out a lot of people there had weird experiences. I had a dream one night about my sister's ex-husband's sister. In real life, she was sweet yet troubled. She was bipolar, grew up with an abusive father, partied a lot, moved many times, and changed her name a few different times. Sometimes her first name, sometimes a variation of her first name, sometimes a nickname, or sometimes even her middle name. I never got to know her very well. She was kind, and she and her brother were very close. I hadn't thought about her in a solid year or more. I didn't have a deep connection to her or anything. And one night, she's in my dream. The dream didn't really have anything to do with me. It was her and her baby. She didn't have a baby in real life that I knew of. And they were so joyful and happy and peaceful together. At one point, her mom was there being happy and peaceful with them. I can't even explain the premise of the dream, but that's how dreams go, I guess. It was just about her and her baby and them being so happy together. I woke up and thought it was weird, but I didn't think that much of it, as I often have pretty colorful dreams. I check my phone and I have a text from my sister saying that this woman I had just dreamed of had committed suicide the day before. So of course I was like, whoa, I just had a dream about her. I told my sister all about it. I made her ask her ex-husband if there was any kind of baby involved. To everyone's shock, he told my sister that in her note, she had admitted she was pregnant. So of course, my sister told her ex about my dream and she said she felt it brought him some comfort, thinking that she and her baby were at peace now from such a conflicted and difficult life. I wasn't really sure why she would come through my psyche as opposed to anyone else's, especially someone who knew her better. But I have seen ghosts since I was eight, and I've had a few kind of paranormal or spiritual experiences in my life, so maybe I'm just the one that's most open to that kind of thing. Has anyone else had people that have passed away come through in their dreams? To add to her tragic story, her boyfriend had just been killed in a hit-and-run accident while he was on the side of the road working on his car about a month prior. The whole thing was just so sad. I know it was a dream, but I like to think she really did find peace, that they both did, and that somewhere they're okay. This happened to me not long ago, and it confirms to me that our house is haunted. We have had some questionable experiences living here, but this, to me, is a no-brainer. I was walking through the hallway and down the stairs to get to the kitchen, empty thermos in hand, acquiring some water for my girlfriend and myself. When I got to the kitchen, I heard someone coming down the stairs behind me. Knowing people were home, I thought nothing of it. I continued toward the sink, but I turned around just to see who it was. When I got to the sink and had turned all the way around, prominent footsteps faced me and stopped at the bottom of the stairs. There was nobody there. I stood there for a second, wondering if something would appear or walk back up the stairs or something, but nothing. So I filled up the bottle and went back upstairs, and as it turns out, nobody had been up. I've never thought about glitches in the Matrix as a serious thing, 
until I started reading more about them. All this time, I've blamed my weird experiences on ghosts. Though I've never seen one, I still believe in them, since my experiences are, at least to me, still unexplainable. I moved into my current house six years ago. It's almost a hundred years old, in the oldest neighborhood in my very large city. Weird things would happen, but we would just shrug it off. You know, lights flickering when we would tease each other about ghosts, things falling off the shelves and out of the cabinets, things going missing and then reappearing in weird places, or by weird means. And then, these three events happened. 1. Our living room TV remote disappeared for two years. Then, one afternoon, I was sitting on the couch, picking up little play balls and throwing them to my toddler. I went to pick up another ball, and right in the middle of the ball pile was the remote. It wasn't there when I made the ball pile. I still thought that maybe somehow the toddler had put it there, but I really don't think so. Number two. I used our garden hose, which has a very specific cap on it. I was done with the hose, wound it back up, turned it on to wash my hands off, turned it off, capped it, and walked away. As I was walking away, my roommate walked to the hose and immediately asked where the cap was. I turned, walked the several feet back to the hose, and sure enough, that cap was gone. Not on the ground, not in the bushes, nowhere. I still just thought that maybe somehow it got lost, but that doesn't make a bit of sense. I had just put that cap back on a few seconds before, and nobody else had walked up in that amount of time. Last, but definitely not least, the weirdest incident that actually made me believe it was a ghost was this. I was sitting on one side of the couch, and my roommate was on the other side. He started the movie that we were going to watch. I had an ashtray and a lighter sitting next to me. I put everything down right where it was supposed to go, and then leaned the lighter onto the ashtray. A few minutes later, I went to get it again, but the lighter was gone. I figured maybe it slipped between the couch cushions or went somewhere else, but nope. We took all the cushions off, and it wasn't there. My roommate picked the entire couch up, and nothing was underneath it. The lighter just vanished. I ended up having to use a book of matches. After the movie, I went to bed, but I left everything else, minus the lighter, on the couch. I woke up the next morning, but where I had left my matches was my lighter, laying right in its spot. At first, I was like, let's be reasonable here, and called my roommate. He said that he didn't find or see the lighter, but he remembers the matches because he used one in the morning before he left for work and put them right next to the ashtray. Ever since then, I was convinced that there was a ghost in my house, but maybe these are glitches in the matrix. What do you think? This spring, I took a trip with six other friends of mine. Throughout this trip, all of us except for one kept having strong feelings that we were missing a person when we weren't. A few examples that I can remember. We would have the cars packed up and ready to go, but nobody was leaving because we thought we were missing someone, like they were in the bathroom or at the campsite. But then we would realize that everyone was present. A different night, we were sitting by the fire Six of us were around the fire and one person was at the picnic table, maybe 10 feet away, so I was fully aware of where they were, when I suddenly got a strong feeling that someone was missing. But I physically counted how many people we had and all seven were present. Lastly, we had dealt a round of cards. All seven of us were sitting at this table, but we didn't start the game because we were waiting for someone, until somebody finally said something like, Oh, everyone's here. I thought we were missing somebody. 
to which all of us but one said that we had also felt that way. I'm not a super big believer in the paranormal or glitches or anything like that, but this was straight up bizarre. The only somewhat explanation I have is that our friend group does have more than seven of us in it, but we all knew how many were on the trip. I remember specifically feeling that someone was missing, not a specific person, just an absence that we all felt even though there wasn't one. I couldn't figure out who it was that I thought wasn't there, and no one else could either. Maybe it was just a weird thing, but it definitely felt strange, and I still don't know what happened. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn, just talking, when dusk started to settle in. I told John that I had to be going, or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember that it was just a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I look up and I notice a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he had been following me and I hadn't really questioned it. I asked if he saw it too, but as soon as I opened my mouth to ask, he was gone. I turned back and the figure stood in the same spot, so for some reason I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it, and suddenly I was able to make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure up close, I recognized it immediately as Death or the Grim Reaper, but it was unlike any iteration I had ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in sunlight, with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remember disturbing me most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled those of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice, though it was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he said, You're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I woke up and the only dream or thought that I've ever been absolutely compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Can't really explain why. Does anyone have any theories on what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend that was in the dream about it, and he thinks that it's connected to the time when I was around 14 and drowned in the reservoir. My brother pulled me out and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go and a peace coming over me before I blacked out, and then nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I'd been underwater for at least a few minutes before he had managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and I didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anyone else thinks this might be. In June of 2007, I was at the hospital at 1 in the morning because my friend got his fingers caught in a taxi door and one was visibly broken. The wait in the emergency room was long, and the vending machine didn't have any coke. The receptionist told me that there was another machine in the next building, which was always stocked because it's not as busy. The receptionist gave me the directions, and I exited the A&E department 
walked down two long corridors and an enclosed bridge which connected the two buildings and got to the other end. When I got to the other end of the bridge and opened the double doors, I was back at the emergency room entrance, which was impossible because I would have had to double back on myself. And to add, it was probably six minutes of walking. I've never been able to explain this. Everyone I've ever told has said that I must have been drunk or tired. Sure, I might have been tired, but I was not drunk because I was driving. I wish I could have found a way to get a CCTV of that night. I still can't really explain it, other than a glitch. My house was built in 1904. It is a single family home, wood frame setting on a concrete block foundation. I've been living here for about 12 years. Of all the weird things that my siblings and I have seen and heard in this house, this one event is my favorite. This happened to my brother. About 10 years ago, my brother and his best friends had started a garage band playing mostly Spanish rock alternative music, but in Spanish. His friends could only get together on Sunday afternoons. They would practice into the early evening. They would usually call it quits by about 8 p.m. This was the time I usually showed up and went to bed, because I worked the graveyard shift. This happened in late fall, so the days were getting shorter. They had just finished a long session when the decision to head to somebody else's house came about. My brother handed his car keys to his buddy so that they could load up the equipment. Everyone had filed out of the basement. The tricky part was they needed to walk all the way to the back of the basement, up the back stairs, through the kitchen doorway, down the hall into the living room, and out into the front porch. Everybody was outside, sitting in my brother's truck waiting for him. My brother was walking up the back stairs when he remembered that he had left his pancakes in a to-go container, sitting on a speaker in the basement. He made the decision to go back. Now, the basement is not clean, with full sight lines. There had been partitions made, and the boiler and main heating unit are right smack in the middle. So after my brother walks back, he's about to retrieve his food container, when out of the corner of his eye, he sees it. It's a shadowy figure, right at his peripheral vision. This feeling of dread and uneasiness washed over my brother. We had been taught that if you're in the presence of a spirit or a ghost and you felt a bad vibe, to say a quick prayer or to swear at it. My brother chose the latter. My brother started to walk to the back of the basement after telling off the presence and briskly up the stairs closing doors and turning off lights as he was walking out. The last light switch is on the opposite side of the front door. Luckily, the door was open and the light from the street lamp was flooding the living room with its amber light. My brother said he felt something at his back, but at no point did he turn around. As he flicked off that last switch, the living room went dark, as the rest of the house. As he stepped out, he pulled on the door closing it behind him, still holding his food container in one hand. He jogged down the few porch steps, walks towards the front gate. Now our house resides far from the main street, essentially having a large front yard but no rear garage. As he closed the gap between himself and his friend-laden truck, he kind of smiled and thought things over in his head, mad at himself for freaking out when there was clearly no reason to. He climbs into the driver's side of the truck and puts on his seatbelt, getting ready to pull out of the parking spot directly in front of the house. When one of his friends goes, Hey, wait, what about your brother? Isn't he coming with us? My brother answered, What do you mean? He went to work early tonight. He's already gone. Do you see his car anywhere? The next question that they asked was, Well, then who was walking behind you when you were leaving the house?
It was late at night, 15 years ago. My friends and I were walking down Main Street, past the neighborhood cemetery, Evergreen. None of our parents had a clue. They thought that we were safe at our friend's house. Her parents were away, so it was a prime sleepover location and a great opportunity to adventure after dark like the rebels that we clearly were. As we were walking and talking, my friend Marissa stops and yells, Do you guys see that? We had no idea what she was talking about. It was a light, she said, and it flew through the cemetery. Tell me you guys saw that. After some debate, my best friend of the group, Casey, looked at me, cocked her head, and wagged her eyebrows. She and I were known to be the more daring types in our grade which was hilarious because we were only 11. We weren't bullies or anything, although Casey's rough and tough attitude often left people intimidated. It's just that we were never ones to turn down a challenge. She and I dashed across the street and up the hill. We strolled deeper into the cemetery, remaining on the narrow designated footpath riddled with weeds protruding through stone crevices. We weaved through rows, glancing at graves, unable to read their occupants' names. We neared the edge of the graveyard and end to our adventure, having seen nothing but a whole bunch of darkness. Casey stopped, took one last survey of her surroundings, and said, There's nothing here. Let's just go. She started back the way we came. I sighed, half disappointed. I wouldn't say that I believe in ghosts, but I'm pretty open-minded. If somebody gave me hard proof, I'd still be a little bit skeptical. I'm the kind of person who needs to witness it for herself. I guess I had just hoped to see something. As I turned, ready to follow my best friend away from this way too black darkness, something caught my eye. It was a light, coming from the woods. I whipped around and my feet were set in stone, like concrete. Every ounce of blood seeped from my body, and my lungs felt deflated. Between two trees stood, or floated, a figure. A woman in a white dress. Only the woman herself was also as white as snow, with a soft white glow surrounding her. Her hair cascaded over her shoulders. She wasn't moving. I couldn't even see a face. Casey could see it too. As quickly as she came, the woman disappeared, as if somebody flicked off a light switch. The glow vanished, leaving Casey and I in complete darkness that seemed somehow darker than before. We bolted out of there, neither of us saying a word. I ran so fast I nearly tumbled down the hill. With a strong desire to flee, I wouldn't have been against it. It would have gotten me to the bottom a lot quicker, albeit with some scrapes and bruises, but I would have gladly taken the chance. When we made it back to our friends, we told them what we saw. A woman as white as snow, wearing a white dress and glowing white. Marissa replied with, The light that I saw was yellow, not white. Neither Sarah nor Marissa believed us. Casey and I defended our case, and the argument went on and on until we reached Sarah's house. By the end of it, Sarah and Marissa still weren't convinced, though Marissa went on about the light she swore she saw. To be completely honest, Casey and I started to doubt what we had witnessed. Eventually, our experience morphed into tricks of the eyes from internalized paranoia and fear. We couldn't even tell our parents, since they didn't know that we were walking around town at night, and we had no intentions of ratting ourselves out. Casey and I stopped talking about it, and soon the memory faded. Flash forward three years. We were in high school. On a Saturday, I was with my other friend, Marissa, a different Marissa from earlier, and we were loitering at the local ice cream shop, as most locals did. We sat at an outside table, talking. After a while of some catching up, she goes, My friend told me this creepy story the other day. Want to hear it? As a huge fan of horror, I told her to go for it. 
She shifted in her seat, facing me, her eyes wide. It's about Evergreen, the cemetery. My friend said it's haunted, that the stories go back decades. Can you believe that? When the words left her lips, my spine straightened. I felt every hair on the back of my neck stand up. I didn't want to believe her, so I immediately dismissed the issue. That's when she took a deep breath and said, No, it's true. A woman appears in the woods at the far end of the cemetery, usually right between those two really big trees, you know? They call her the woman in white. I have four kids. I know that I have four kids. But recently, I just feel like there should be another one. But they're missing. When we go out, I head count and I get flustered because I can't find the extra one. I have to consciously remind myself that there are only four. But my heart just doesn't believe it. I had just put it down as one of those weird feelings and I pushed it aside. Then, my parents sent money to my kids. They sent $100 to each kiddo. They sent me $500. I called them and asked them why they had put in so much, and they were confused and said that they told me they were sending $100 per child. I reminded them that I only have four kids. They were silent for a moment, and then just kind of laughed and said they must be getting old because they thought there were five. Then tonight, my daughter walked into the lounge room. She looked around and said, I know we're all here, but our family feels small. My son agreed. I hadn't said anything to anybody about my feelings lately because they already think I'm ancient and forgetful at 40. I don't really know what this means, but it's definitely strange. And apparently it's not just me. Does anyone else ever have these feelings? Was my other kid lost in a glitch? I don't know what it could be. Over the weekend, I was out of dental floss. I can't stand that. So I looked around for a forgotten roll. I looked in my son's bathroom as well. Nothing. On Tuesday night, my son and I went shopping and I picked up a floss, Tom's, that I had never tried before. I grabbed one because I'm very picky about floss and I was not sure whether or not I would like it. My son then asked if he could get one too and of course I said yes. We go home and my son unpacks the groceries. The two boxes of floss are on the counter. I take mine upstairs, unwrap it, throw the box in the bathroom trash, and try it that night. I hated it. Last night, I go to floss again, and there is now a second one in the drawer. The exact same. I think, well that's weird. Why did my son bring his floss into my bathroom? But I forgot about it because sometimes he uses my bathroom, so whatever. This evening, I'm cleaning up the kitchen, and there's his dental floss, on the counter, unopened. I go back upstairs. There are still two flosses in the drawer. They're both completely new, except that the one that I have used has, of course, a slightly smaller roll. The containers are transparent, so you can see it. But I had never tried that kind before, and I only bought one. So how did I end up with two? I hate to admit it, but I have often read accounts of things like this happening with more skepticism. I always figured that people just forgot that they had two of something because the items are so often insignificant. But here I am, in the possession of a mystery floss. I'm kind of honored and excited by the possibilities of what this could mean, but that's my glitch story.
So the other night, my friends and I were drinking, and we stumbled into the realm of scary stories. Every single one of us has had a paranormal experience, except this one friend, D. He doesn't really believe in supernatural stuff, but he still told us the story of one of his friends that he's known since middle school. I'm just gonna tell it like he did. My friend is an avid Tinder user. He goes on a lot of dates, and this one time he was chatting with a girl, very shy but cute and all. So they finally meet, and she's okay. They have a lot in common, and they have a good time. However, the girl seems to be increasingly nervous as time goes by. Finally, they're about to say their goodbyes, and she says something along the lines of not wanting to go home. When my friend asks why, she replies it's because her new house is really scary, and, being honest, she would be grateful to get my friend to sleep over, just so she could feel more at ease. My friend thought, yeah, sure, we'll sleep. She clarified soon enough that she actually didn't want to have sex, and my friend was fine with that too. He drove them to the girl's house, and it is kind of creepy. He feels a little uneasy, but not enough to prevent them from making out a little. They slept on the same bed, and at some point in the night, my friend wakes up to go to the bathroom, which was a hallway away from the main bedroom. He goes and does his business, and when he comes out, he sees a dark figure standing in the dark. For a second, he thinks it's the girl and calls her name. The figure moves and starts walking the opposite direction, and it's definitely not the girl. He bolts to the bedroom, scared to death, and that's when he realizes that the girl isn't in bed. In fact, there's no trace of her. He looks up and down from the bathroom to the kitchen, and she's just not there. Nor did it seem like she was ever there to begin with. He took his things from the bedroom and escaped the house as fast as he could, driving aimlessly around for about 30 minutes until he could calm down a little, and then he drove home. When he finished telling the story, we asked if the Tinder profile still existed after the girl mysteriously disappeared, and Dee says he doesn't think so, but he's not certain. It seems a little bit fictitious, but Dee's friend swears by it, and at the moment, it seemed pretty creepy to me. This friend isn't one to make up stories or pull pranks, which is the only reason that Dee even almost believed him to begin with. I'm not sure if this is considered a glitch, but most nights, and I mean not every night, I can hear people talking. I can never fully hear what they're saying, but I hear people chatting back and forth. I wish I could say I hear the same people talking, but every time I hear them, it's not always the same voices. I do live in a building with four other tenants. But the thing is, I usually hear this chattering at odd hours of the night. It's when my well-known neighbors are asleep. I work in a kitchen, and I usually don't get home from work until at least 1 a.m., so I'm usually up until about 6. I could chalk it up to spiritual activity, but it doesn't feel like that. It's almost like I'm hearing a life that I've lived somewhere else or that other people have lived here over the years. Like, I'm hearing things from other dimensions or past times. It may be odd to say, and I'm okay with being completely wrong, but it's as if the memories of these walls are speaking at night. The word is that the building I live in used to be a bed and breakfast, so this place definitely has some stories and has seen a lot of different faces in its day. It would make sense that I would be hearing different voices every time, but... It's really interesting to me. I am very interested in learning about what it is I'm experiencing, so if you have any ideas, let me know.
My mom, who passed away about three years ago, seemed to attract something off. Every house we lived in had activity, and one house in particular in Merritt Island, Florida, was particularly dark. I sometimes have nightmares about this house, which was in the area where a fierce tribe lived long ago. We were also just about a mile or so away from the famous Georgiana Church and Graveyard, which is reputed to be haunted. My mom had some psychological issues, but they were never clarified to my brothers and I. There's so much that happened over the years that I don't know where to begin. My mom was always complaining about the ghosts, and things happened a lot. Even my skeptic dad felt touched one night while he was cooking fish or something on the stove, and I could tell that he was a little unnerved. Faucets would turn on, lights would flicker, an electronic battleship buried in my closet started beeping one day. My younger brother and I started searching for the source of the noise, and we found the game under a bunch of junk in my closet. We took it out and opened the battery case to take the batteries out when it wouldn't turn off, but there weren't any batteries in it. As soon as we took off the battery cover though, it stopped beeping. The smoke detectors at every single house we ever lived in would go off every so often when they weren't supposed to. It was completely unnerving. It still happens occasionally when I walk under one. One time when I was very little, I had a dream about a fire. In a half-sleeping state, I thought, stop, drop, and roll, just like we were taught in school. I rolled out of bed and sleep crawled into the living room where my parents were watching TV. I guess I sat on the couch at that point, but I don't remember that part. What I do remember is that when my dad walked me back to my room, as we passed under the smoke detector, it went off loudly. Weird for that to happen after I'd had a dream about a fire. It blared once and then stopped. I never sleepwalked again to my knowledge. I remember many times when the smoke detector would go off when I was home alone after school, and I would run outside and sit in the yard until someone else came home. The scariest thing happened when I was grown, and my oldest daughter was about four years old. My dad had had a heart attack and was recovering from surgery. I was an Air Force lieutenant at the time, and I took some leave to come home and help out for a week or so. We arrived at the house and let ourselves in. The guest bedroom used to be my older brother's bedroom. My old bedroom and my younger brother's bedroom, along with the bathroom we shared, was at that end of the house. My parents had set up a toddler bed for my daughter against the wall, opposite the queen-sized bed. From the toddler bed, you could see clearly into the hallway. I tucked my daughter into bed and crawled into the queen-sized bed. I had just pulled up the blanket when my daughter started screaming like a banshee. My instincts kicked in and I ran to scoop her up. I noticed that she was crying and frantically pointing into the hallway, like something was there terrifying her. I took her back into the bed with me and held her until she calmed down. I was afraid to ask her what she'd seen, but I had to know. Her answer chills me to this day. She said, a baby man. Over the years, as I grew older and eventually had two more children, my mother would frequently complain about the ghosts haunting her at a few other places she lived, and the kids and I also experienced minor bits of activity at each home. Kids would hear their names being called by family members who weren't home at the time. One time, while visiting my mom with my three kids after my dad passed, my mom and I arrived home to find my three kids and my nephew, who was also visiting, waiting outside. They had all heard me calling them from the kitchen in the loft where they were watching TV upstairs. Of course, I wasn't home, and they were pretty shaken. One time I woke up to the very strong smell of talcum powder, which brought back the memories of my grandmother, who had to sleep in my bed with me when she used to visit when I was young. I hated my grandmother having to sleep in my bed at the time, but this experience was sort of comforting. About six years ago, my mom became too ill to live by herself, and she came to live with me and my three kids in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. 
She complained about the ghosts in her room, saying that they would growl and run around her room like dogs. She said the growling noises weren't scary, though. It just sort of sounded like a man saying, grr, grr. My mom had terminal emphysema, and my house had zero paranormal activity before she moved in. So I tried to attribute her experiences to lack of oxygen. Keep in mind that I never talked about these experiences with my mom in front of my kids. I continued to blame my mom's hallucinations, as I thought they were, on her lack of oxygen. Until my youngest daughter heard the growl too. She was about 13 at the time. Like I said, my mom and I never talked about the ghosts to the kids because we didn't want to scare them. But one night, my daughter came into my room crying and scared saying she heard a man growling and saying, grr, grr, in exactly the same way my mom had explained. I have two theories about why my mom attracted this activity, but I don't know that they matter. So many strange experiences happened with her, and although these memories aren't exactly pleasant, they do make me think about my mom. I kind of wish I had asked her more questions about her and her life before she passed. Either way, these are just some of the things that happened. I lived in Salt Lake, Utah over the span of about four years. I lived there in 1981, then again in 1993, in 2002 and 2006. The east, now central part of the city, used to have a major train junction, all sorts of tracks coming together. Side tracks where they would group trains together. At this junction were two large train depots, Union Train Depot to the north at about 200 west and 100 south, and the Rio Grande Depot at about 500 south and 400 west. Union is now a large event center that holds rock bands, conventions, and things like that. Rio Grande Station is still there and actually is a museum and Amtrak depot. Amtrak still stops there daily. Sundays are very boring in Salt Lake City. A lot of businesses are closed down, and there's not much going on unless you want to go to church. Well, I had left the Mormon church by then, 2006, so I was on my way to Crossroads Mall, which had an open food court on Sundays. They had air conditioning and plenty of parking. I had no AC in my small apartment, which was super hot and muggy, so I decided to go to the mall to get something to eat and eat in their air-conditioned surroundings. Lots of young people would go there on Sunday to socialize with each other and enjoy the coolness and its place today is City Creek Mall. Anyway, I go to the mall and find that it's closed for the day for renovations, so I drive over to the Gateway Mall, just a few blocks to the east. The Gateway Mall was an outdoor mall, built over the many train tracks which used to be just to the east of Union Station. Gateway Mall was not indoor, but it was also not particularly large. I was hoping to find some food court open, but no such luck. Gateway Mall was heavily Mormon-owned, and everything looked closed. Finally, I was driving north on 200 West Street up toward Union Station, which was now a convention and event center, and I see a little woman, in full makeup, in a huge white wedding dress, standing on the northwest corner of 400 West and 100 South, holding a bouquet of flowers looking at me. I slow down and look at her. The dress appears to shine. I thought, oh, having a Sunday wedding. I look around and notice nobody around her. No photographer, no groom, no bridesmaids. Strange, I thought. I drive past her and look at Union Station, figuring that they're holding a wedding there. But it was closed nobody around. So I turn around and drive back to get a better look. She turned her head and started staring at me again, still holding the flowers. 
The dress looked very old-fashioned, and it was massive. I figured it was some kind of magazine shoot, but again, there was nobody there. Just her. I thought maybe it was a wedding store advertisement, but I turned east and looked for a wedding store. Nothing there. I drove all over the streets on that outside mall and couldn't find a single wedding store. Nothing. So I went back to where she was standing, and she was gone. I drove over and looked down that street, and the only street that she could have walked up or down, and she was nowhere. Nothing was open, and nobody was around. She just vanished. I don't know how she could have gotten anywhere that fast, especially with that dress. Many years later, I think in 2016, I was doing research about haunted houses in various cities, and I checked out the haunted houses in Salt Lake City. Boom. I found a story about the Ghost Bride of Salt Lake. Apparently, from what I read, around the year 1912 or so, a man and a woman get married and they plan to take a train from Salt Lake City to wherever they were going to go on their honeymoon. The wife and the groom got into some sort of an argument, and the wife took her ring off and threw it over on the train tracks. She was still in her wedding dress. Upset at what she'd done, she rushed over to the tracks to retrieve her ring, and was struck and killed by the oncoming train. Since then, the bride has been seen a number of times on or near the train tracks, or even in other parts of Salt Lake City, for example walking along the freeway late at night. I saw her in full daylight. There were no train tracks near here when I saw her, but long ago, even before Gateway Mall was built, she would have been about a half a block away from the main train track, maybe even closer. So either that was the ghost of the jilted bride who was killed by the train in her wedding dress, still awaiting her new husband's arrival so they could go off on their honeymoon, or it was something else I can't explain. I can't imagine. Still waiting after over a hundred years. Still waiting. Maybe she thought I was him. Maybe that's why she was staring at me so intently. I've had paranormal stuff happening in my house for a few years now. I've always been able to see ghosts around and hear them. Recently though, there have been more experiences. I've heard footsteps and I've seen shadow figures way more often recently. It's always when I'm alone in my home. I hear people shout my name even though nobody else is there. I've always believed in spirits and demons. Recently, I bought this doll. It was really old, and it definitely had a sense of creepiness. We had purchased this doll from a boot sale in the street. It's where people park their cars and you shop out of the boot or the trunk. My stepdad and I have been the only ones to touch the doll. We both touched the doll on Tuesday this week when we were setting it up. I put it on the drawers at the end of my bed and I fell asleep. At 2.58 in the morning, I woke up feeling ill, and I felt like I was being watched. I put the doll in one of the drawers, as I didn't like the sense that it was giving me. My stepdad and I woke up the next day with horrible symptoms. We ended up with a non-viral bacterial tonsillitis infection. I spent the whole of Thursday in bed violently shaking from this illness. That night, my fan flew off the bedside table. It had been there for weeks, and I didn't move, so there was no reason for it to move. I don't know if this is all just a big coincidence or not. I don't know if we have a haunted house, a haunted doll, or nothing. But it's definitely been weird. One time I was in Russia. It was the first time that I had ever traveled there and I was 19. 
It was actually Ukraine. I found a bar that I thought was so cool. I met a girl there and we went back to her flat and hooked up. Six years later, I went to the exact same bar. I met another chick and I went home with her. Only it wasn't another chick. It was the same one as before. I didn't realize it until I was at her apartment. We hooked up and I left with my hair standing on end. She spoke Ukrainian. I didn't. I don't even know if she recognized me, and it wasn't like I could ask her, so... There was a guy named Nikolai as well, and I met him on both trips too. The first time, I met him at a bar. The other time, I ran into him on some side street one day when I visited for the second time. This is the second biggest city in Crimea, with a population of over 330,000 people. What the hell are the chances of this happening twice? Interesting. My family and I live in Brazil, in the city of Belém, a city that is known for its supernatural activity. It was in the 70s. My great-grandmother on my mother's side, whom we call Maria, was a very rich person. She lived in a mansion with her husband and sons and daughter. Since the house was so big, she had a few people who worked in the house, a few gardeners, a chef, a couple of maids, and a few other people. Among the workers, there was a woman who we'll call Beth. Beth, according to my great-grandmother, was a really nice and pleasant person. She had a natural charm about her, so much so that a neighbor, who we'll call Carlos, fell madly in love for her, as she fell for him as well. Carlos's mother found out about their relationship and severely disapproved of it. She was a terrible bigot. As Carlos and Beth's relationship solidified more and more, and their engagement became official, Carlos's mother concocted a terrible plan, hell-bent on ending the relationship. She invited Beth for a tea. Both had a long conversation, and it turned out that Carlos's mother told a terrible lie to Beth. She told her that Carlos had been unfaithful and had never intended to marry her. She relayed the content of the conversation to my great-grandmother as soon as it ended. Beth, driven by intense grief and anguish at the perceived betrayal, put on her wedding gown, walked to the laundry area of my great-grandmother's house, a nice outdoor area of the house, doused herself in kerosene, and lit her dress on fire. Safe to say nobody knew what was happening, until her blood-curdling screams began. Every single person in the house ran to help to put the fire out and call emergency, attempting to save Beth's life. They managed to put out the fire, but Beth's entire body was burned in the process. Pieces of fabric were melded into her skin due to the intense heat. She was in unimaginable pain. The ambulance arrived as she blacked out. My great-grandmother was in intense shock from seeing a friend commit such a horrible action against herself. She was not able to accompany Beth to the hospital, so she stayed at home, anxiously waiting for news on Beth's condition. Getting tired of staying by the phone, she excused herself to the bathroom to take a shower. As she was on her stairs to go to her personal bathroom, she starts to hear blood-curdling screams, terrible, anguishing screams, calling out her name. According to her, it came from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. My grandmother stood frozen in intense shock and fear, not knowing whether she should run or cower in fear. Once a few terrifying minutes went by, she started screaming for it to stop, while clutching her head but the screaming would not stop. So, inexplicably, she screams, Please, Beth, stop. As soon as those words came out of her mouth, the screams stopped. 
She remained frozen, sitting in abject terror on the stairs, until she heard her telephone ringing. She ran to the phone and picked it up. It was her husband, my great-grandfather, calling from the hospital. He called to regretfully tell my great-grandmother that Beth had just passed away from her injuries. My great-grandmother had a mental breakdown due to the stress of everything that had happened and had to move out of her house for a long time to try healing her psyche from such terrible events. Fast forward decades later in 2003, I was a child, eight years old at the time. My sister was six. My family still lives in the same house that the terrible event happened in. We were playing in our pool with my mother and everything was fine. Until my little sister started staring at the doorway that leads to the laundry area of the house. She kept staring at it for a few minutes until my mother noticed and grew concerned. She asked my sister what she was staring so intently at. My sister replied, at the bride. She's pretty and she's smiling at me. My mother turned white as chalk and grabbed us and ran toward our section of the house. Later, I asked her why she had acted so strangely, and she told me this story, just as I have told you. I have two stories to share. Let me first start by explaining why most corner rooms in hotels are always the most haunted places. In my culture, we believe that corner rooms must be avoided in any hotels due to the fact that it's the least populated or visited area by humans, since they don't walk toward the end of the hallway often. Thus, spirits can have that space to themselves without much disturbance. Starting with my personal story. Back in 2017, my mother and I visited Korea and went to Jeju Island. We stayed in a pretty new hotel. It was spacious and big, and the price was rather cheap for a four-star hotel. Upon our dismay, we were allocated the corner room. Thinking it was a new hotel, my mom and I brushed off any unpleasant feelings and checked into our room. It was pretty late at night, around 11 p.m. when we checked in. In Chinese beliefs, when checking into a hotel room, you always knock on the door and politely tell any spirits inside that you're merely staying for a few days and won't disturb them. Flush the toilet immediately upon entering, and also place your shoes in a somewhat messy manner. We did everything. However, upon entering the room, we felt really drained and uncomfortable. We received two keys in a card format, one for electrical usage in the room and one for the door key. My mother put the card on the table and we started unpacking. To our horror, after unpacking and wanting to go to the convenience store to buy some snacks, the keys had disappeared and were not on the table anymore. My mother immediately started blaming me for misplacing them and we spent a good 20 to 30 minutes arguing while flipping the whole room over for the key. When we were about to give up, the keys sort of magically appeared at the same spot on the table again. There's no way we would have missed it. It was right smack dab in the middle of the table in front of us. Also, we realized that the beverages in the fridge were all half drank. Not sure if the hotel staff just didn't change it or if it was something supernatural but it's worth mentioning. The feeling in the room was still particularly ominous, so we decided to check out. I called the receptionist hotline with the phone provided by them in the room, but all I heard was static. In the end, we packed everything and went down to the reception to request a room change. The next room we checked into didn't have any heavy or ominous feelings, and we had a good and comfortable stay overall. The next story is my friend's, we'll call her Giselle. Giselle went to Perth on a school trip and was paired with Lindy to be her hotel roommate. Unfortunately, they got the corner room. 
Giselle was strongly against this as her dad is a medium and had always advised her to stay away from corner rooms, or if the room made her feel uncomfortable regardless of where it was. She immediately felt cold and uncomfortable in the room upon entering it, but she tried her best to shrug it off. Giselle and Lindy turned on the TV. The only thing that came up on every single channel was horror shows. They started to feel a little bit creeped out, because no matter how many channels they changed, it was always horror shows or previews. What broke the camel's back was when they checked on their water supply. They all received a full water bottle from their school since they had to compete in a choir competition. It was essential to finish the water at designated timings. The water bottle only had half the water left. Neither of them had touched or drank any of the water, but it was only half filled for both bottles. They were 100% sure and adamant that they received a full bottle of water. They were unable to change rooms despite telling their teacher in charge what happened. So they packed up all their stuff and crashed in other people's rooms. It was a late night in summer, and there were some families gathered for a birthday party at my friend's farmhouse. Most of the people had already left, but we stayed because our families were good friends. They had set up a fire outside, and everybody was gathered around it. There were four of us kids in the group, and we were all around nine to ten or so. Behind the fire gathering, there was a medium-sized hill which the four of us decided to run to the top of and then roll down. We did this a couple of times and thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. From the top of the hill, you could see the farmhouse facing straight forward, and off to the side of the hill was a barn. There was a light somewhere near us that allowed our shadows to show up on the side of the barn. So we would continue going up the hill, see our shadows, and sometimes we would try to make little shadow puppets and things like that. One of these times that we climbed the hill, we decided to try and make letters with our body shadows on the barn wall. We had all lined up four in a row, and that's when we noticed that there was a fifth shadow on the barn. A little confused, we looked around at each other, looking to see if there was a fifth person up there with us, but there wasn't. I remember looking back at the barn, and the fifth shadow, which hadn't moved at all, immediately took off in a running motion and completely disappeared from view. This startled all of us, and we ran back down the hill to our parents and the fire. I'm not really sure what it was that we saw, but it definitely freaked us out, and it's something we still bring up every now and again, and we're all still a little spooked by it. So, this happened a week ago, and my whole family is still kind of freaked out about it. Our last upstairs neighbors moved out about six months ago, and the house had been empty until about two months ago. We put it at about that time that we first detected the presence of our new neighbors. Now, we were close with the first family who had lived there, and they were tenants. They were moving out because they had bought a house of their own and we had even helped them with the process. This is an important detail, because on their last day there, I remember as clear as day my mother asking them if the original owner had found somebody else to rent it out. They replied that they hadn't, as far as they knew. We had never met the owner. The incident that I'm about to describe was all the more surprising, considering we had never seen a mover's truck or any other items being unloaded and moved, but we just chalked that up to our own ignorance. We lived in a huge apartment complex, after all. These things happen. Fast forward a month later and we were already annoyed by their presence. 
we would hear loud footsteps, both running and walking, in the middle of the night, sometimes extending to the wee hours of the morning, the creaking of heavy furniture being dragged, weird scurrying noises, like there was an animal with them, and on some particularly nasty days, even steel vessels being dropped, a ball being dribbled, a glass marble bouncing, or the ringing sound of a coin being dropped before it settled, and many other sounds we could never identify, but you get the idea. In case you haven't gleaned from this point on already, the walls here are pretty thin. On this particularly chilling day last week, it was about 11 p.m. at night. That's when we heard the first set of knocks. It was just a tiny rap of three, one quickly after the other. And you couldn't have heard it unless you were really quiet. They weren't so much knocks made with fists as someone using an object to probably tap on the floor repeatedly. So when that first set came, we were surprised because it was pretty late in the night and we weren't expecting anybody. Everyone was home. We waited a while and when we didn't hear anything again, we shrugged and thought it was a prank or a mistake and went back to doing our own thing. For context, we were not in the living room opposite where our front door was. We were at the other end of the house. So these knocks were louder than what you would expect to hear in case somebody really was at the front door. Half an hour later, we hear, yet again, another set of knocks, this time five, each one oddly drawn out and increasingly heavy. This is when we realized that it was coming from upstairs. Now, you have to realize that this did not phase us in the slightest. They were habitually noisy, so while we did freeze for a moment or two, we just carried on. At about this time, my parents start talking about how this was their last straw, and the next time they were to even so much as move, they would get put on blast on our building's WhatsApp group. The next and final set came an hour later. It was just two this time. Except they sounded less like knocks and more like sacks of beets being dropped. I think I even heard something tiny roll after that second one, but I'm not sure about that part. At this point, it was around 12.30 in the morning, and my mother really did lose it. She did what she had promised to do. She posted for all to see how rude our neighbors were, and how inconsiderate and inconveniently loud, and she went back to sleep. Now this is where things get really weird. My mom awoke to a flurry of messages asking her who she was talking about. One lady who lived on the same floor as our neighbors told my mom that nobody had moved in there after the last ones had left. On hearing this, we were all very alarmed and upset because the four of us couldn't have imagined the exact same things, right? My father completely flipped and banged on the door countless times to no avail. We did consider the possibility of squatters, but we could never verify because the owner wasn't in town and we would be breaking and entering if we tried to see for ourselves. We were convinced that it was very much real and had a perfectly rational explanation. But after that day, we didn't hear a single noise and the paranoia had very much set in. So we were always on our guard, ready in wait for when they slipped up. It's been a week now and I can't tell if we just experienced the weirdest glitch for two entire months or if something else is going on. So make of it what you will. Nobody believes us. Some even questioned why we put up with them for that long if we genuinely believed that they were a nuisance to us, and we don't really know how to answer that one. Maybe high tolerance? Maybe it's ghosts or some kind of haunting, but there's never been any issue with that before. Maybe it's a glitch in the Matrix, and they're from a parallel universe or something. Either way, it seems that our upstairs neighbors aren't real and we have no idea what to do about it. I am a 30-year-old male. When I was in my early 20s, I had a strange encounter with a man who claimed to be from my future. I'm not entirely sure that this could be considered a glitch, 
However, this incident was definitely peculiar and I haven't been able to completely forget about it since. Admittedly, some details are now hazy as this happened to me over 10 years ago, but I have tried my hardest to remember as much information as I could in hopes of getting some closure. Around 2011, I was taking Japanese night classes once per week at a local university here in the UK. At the time, my classes would finish at around 9pm, and I would usually return home via train. I was still living with my parents back then, and I distinctly remember having a small window of time to catch the infrequent night train back to my hometown after my lessons would end. It was winter, and I recall the station being busy with Christmas shoppers. I had unfortunately missed my usual train, and had to wait over an hour for the next arrival. I was looking up at the live departure board with frustration when I was approached by a friendly American man in his early to mid 40s. I remember that he was underdressed for the weather, or even the season, as it had been snowing for days and was particularly cold outside. He was wearing only a baseball cap, a sweatshirt, and a light windbreaker. Nothing about this struck me as too odd at the time, as I gathered he must just be a tourist who had not anticipated how cold it could be. Back then, I was incredibly shy and I wasn't the type to strike up conversations with strangers. However, I recall feeling entirely at ease from the moment I saw him. He was tall, athletic, and spoke with a strong accent. He was friendly and approachable. Nothing about him gave off any warning signals. If anything, I was taken aback at how unconventionally attractive he was. Our first interaction was brief. He initiated our conversation by asking if I had been waiting long. I naturally replied out of politeness if he had been stuck waiting for a while too. He was in fact, quote, waiting for a friend and had just gotten into town. This quickly evolved into us both making small talk, with him introducing himself as John. Eventually, he asked if I wanted to grab a coffee on the account of how easily we hit things off. My train was due to arrive and I didn't have much time, so John quickly asked if I wanted to pick up where we'd left off again over coffee tomorrow. I agreed, we exchanged numbers, and I left to catch my train home. I remember after this instance, I felt a feeling similar to deja vu. It was like a wave of familiarity had washed over me. I was 100% sure that I had never met John in my life. However, I was left with this strange, overwhelming feeling after departing. I felt intrigued by him. When I arrived home, I received a few text messages from John and we agreed to meet up in the same location the following day. At this time in my life, I was still closeted and I hadn't come out to my parents as being gay and I wasn't prepared to tell them I was meeting with a stranger. I usually pride myself on being a good judge of character, and I would not have agreed to meet John if I hadn't felt that the situation was safe. After all, it was difficult to meet guys at that age, and I wasn't about to pass up the opportunity of a date with this handsome older dude who I just felt an abundance of chemistry with. However, I did make sure to let some of my friends know my situation in case anything were to happen. The following day, John was waiting for me at the same location we had met the night before. Despite the freezing weather, he was still wearing the same light clothing and baseball cap. I can recall him being incredibly charming and I felt the same overwhelming sense of being familiar with him from the moment we met. I was definitely curious, and I was eager to find out more about him. At this point, we couldn't decide on a location and wandered aimlessly around before deciding to grab coffee at a local Starbucks. As we started to make conversation, I noticed that he was only interested in talking about what I had to say. I remember that he seemed overly happy to be talking with me. When I would speak, he was often so excited that he would barely let me finish before moving on to another topic of conversation. I almost got the impression that he knew what I was about to say already. For instance, he knew that I had a sister before I told him. I also noticed that he would rarely talk about himself, 
often sidestepping my questions or changing the flow of conversation when I asked him anything directly. He was definitely quirky, and for the most part we spoke about our shared interests. I remember thinking that he was odd, but I definitely didn't feel suspicious of him, despite the fact that he seemed rather private. The only information I remember about him was that he was from America, but that he had been traveling for some time, the way he put it. He claimed to play several instruments and was in a band, and he mentioned that he had a troubled religious upbringing. However, this is where things get strange. John and I left the coffee shop and decided to go for another walk around the city. We spoke for a long time, and I remember that we'd been laughing a lot and generally enjoying the time we'd spent together. However, we eventually stopped along the riverfront that runs throughout my city, leaning over a bridge as we spoke some more about each other's lives. This is when John asked if he could give me a hug. I remember looking up at him, and his expression seemed genuinely melancholic all of a sudden. Almost bittersweet. Although I was feeling a little confused, I said of course, and hesitantly leaned in for the embrace. I remember that he hugged me incredibly tightly, and when we eventually let go, there were tears in his eyes. I asked him if he was okay, and asked what was going on. Admittedly now feeling incredibly confused and a little bit concerned by what was happening all of a sudden, he said, you're never going to believe me. I can't quite remember the entire flow of the conversation that followed, however, I will try to summarize everything as best I can. We took a seat on a nearby bench, where I remember that his composure was incredibly calm, and he said everything with the sincerest conviction. He told me that he was somebody from my near future, and that we knew each other very well. He told me that he had traveled back in time to visit me. However, he was incredibly adamant about not answering how or why he had managed to do so, only stating that it was, quote, recreational, and that time travel, quote, doesn't work how we think, stating to me that he had only wanted to visit me once more, adding that I was much younger than he had anticipated, and that I looked so different from when he knew me. He almost hinted that he had found me at the wrong age. I could tell that there was a feeling of sadness throughout everything he was telling me, as he kept repeating over and over how happy he was to see me, yet he said everything with tears in his eyes. I instantly began taking everything he was saying as a joke, feeling skeptical and ready to leave immediately. I remember standing up and telling him that I had to go. The information was too much for me to process, and I felt the same overwhelming flood of deja vu creep back into my system. The sensation was so intense that I remember trembling as I stood up to leave, with the atmosphere around me suddenly experiencing a drop in pressure. This is when he took me by the hand and said, I'll see you again someday. I ran away without saying anything. I remember being so overcome by emotion that I burst into tears as soon as I was out of sight. Afterwards, I was so confused and disturbed by the situation, it took me days to process it all before attempting to articulate it to my younger sister and friends, all of whom remember this incident as the crazy tourist I went on a date with. However, 10 years have passed, and I can't help but feel affected by this incident. Every now and then, I remember the face of John and the strange feeling of contentment and familiarity I had around him. After our date, I remember trying to text or call the number that he contacted me on, only to be notified that that number no longer exists by an automated message. He had seemingly vanished without a trace, with no further instances of seeing or being contacted by him since. This definitely could have been a case of an individual who was clearly unhinged, but it was so eerie that I haven't been able to forget about it. I have always wondered who John was, or perhaps who I was to him in this possible future. Nowadays, I am currently in a happy relationship with my partner of six years, whom I have no intention of ever leaving. But every time I recall this enigmatic encounter I had with John, 
I can't help but wonder if I had glimpsed into a possible or parallel future, one where things have drastically changed for me on a personal level. I have so many questions surrounding what he told me. Was I still alive in his time? Were we romantically involved? Was he a future colleague or even family? Every time I recall these long, distant memories, I'm overcome by an inexplicable wave of emotion, almost like I've lost something. It's incredibly difficult for me to articulate the feeling that I felt that night. I have never been able to forget about it, and I am entirely sure that I would still recognize John today if I ever encountered him again. This is the first time I have ever shared the full version of this story outside of my immediate circle, but after discovering the community here, I felt the need to share. Has anyone ever experienced anything similar? Or have perhaps read other relatable stories or have suggestions or ideas? I've felt almost haunted by this meeting since it happened, and I would love a little bit of insight from those more experienced in theories and concepts of time travels and glitches. I love a good scary story, a good horror movie, and I absolutely love exchanging ghost stories. I'm a firm believer in the supernatural. I'm a green witch and Wiccan, of course, so it's in my blood. All my life, as long as I can remember, I've loved anything to do with ghosts and hauntings. It's my dream to be one of those YouTube paranormal investigators like Mindseed. And lucky me, I've had a few experiences myself, so I haven't been able to go exploring to haunted places as much as I would love to. But this experience happened in a house I lived in with my family years ago, in a place called Stevensville, in Newfoundland, Canada. I was still in the early elementary school ages, quite young. I had the big room adjoined with the living room. The living room was just right outside my door, and these were the only two places that had carpet. So back then, I used to have quite a lot of times where I would have trouble sleeping. My go-to when that happened was books. I had these little finger lights hidden everywhere so that I wouldn't have to turn on the room light and let my parents know that I was reading instead of sleeping. I really was obsessed with reading. If I stayed up past bedtime reading, the books would be taken away as a punishment. Another side note, in my room, there was what looked like a trap door, which led to an attic, but it was painted over. We never went up there. So one night, I couldn't get to sleep, and I remember that the book of choice for that night was a Guinness Book of World's Record books. I loved stuff like that. Also Ripley's Believe It or Not, horror books, things like that. It was well past midnight, because both of my parents were asleep and they stayed up pretty late. Like any normal night, I kept on hearing creaking on my ceiling, as if somebody was walking around. Keep in mind, this is only a one-story house, and the only way to the attic was through my room, but nobody had touched that door in years upon years, and the owners of the house we rented never mentioned it. I heard these creakings all the time, so I'd gotten pretty used to it. But later on that night, I heard a door open and close in the direction of my parents' room, and I heard what sounded like bare footsteps on a hard floor directly outside of my bedroom door as somebody walked to the bathroom. Me, as a kid, thinking that it was my mom, went out to go tell her that I was having trouble sleeping. The footsteps were lighter, and she was the kind parent, so I assumed it was her, and that's why I felt comfortable telling her. But when I went out there, I saw no one. No one in the kitchen. No one in the bathroom. And that's when I started to hear these faint whispers, and I started getting a little creeped out. I went back to my room, and that's when it hit me. There's carpet in front of my room. 
I should never have been able to hear footsteps on a hard floor in front of my door. At that point, I ran back in my room and I ended up going to school the next day with no sleep. That is the most prominent ghostly memory that I have of that house, but there were other things that happened often. For instance, we had black mold all the time. Yes, the mold, it's really bad for your health. Like, no matter what we did, it would come back, and worse, especially in the room that I was in. We couldn't have furniture against the wall because of it. We got rid of it once, but then it showed up, and that cycle kept repeating. The TV kept turning on and off on its own for no reason, too. Despite all of this, though, it's still one of my favorite childhood houses, and I really do miss it. I've had three UFO encounters. I'll tell them here. Number one. In the summer of 2011 or 2012, I was 12 years old, and my mom, my sister, and I were all driving out to California to drop my sister off at boarding school. I was sitting in the back seat doing whatever, when all of a sudden my mom says, hey, look up in the sky. You may never see this again in your life. When I looked up, I remember seeing this orange dot in the sky, just sitting there. Well, to me it looked like that, but my mom said that it followed us throughout the whole ride. People on the highway were slowing their cars down and looking out their windows to try to see what this thing was, when it suddenly let out this really bright flash and continued to hover. I still vividly remember seeing a plane fly by it as well. We called my brother, who was an astronomy enthusiast at the time, and tried to ask him what he thought it was that we were seeing, but he had no idea. Months later, I told a former science teacher of mine the story and asked what he thought of it, but he couldn't explain it either. Number two. This one takes place three years after the first event. By now, I was 15 and it was winter. I was getting ready for the night and already had my PJs on, when suddenly my mom said, Hey, you want to see a UFO? I, being an enthusiast of the unknown, happily obliged and went outside. When I got there, I remember seeing these lights just hovering over our backyard. I remember seeing two, but my mom and stepdad said that there were three and that they were in a perfect triangle. I remember they kept changing color and we were all sitting out there trying to figure out what they were. From what I can recall, they had been out there for days. Finally, in 2016, I was 16 years old, and I was driving with a friend of mine back from camp. We were near our home when we saw this bright light just hovering. At first, I thought it was a helicopter, but he pointed out that it was too close to be that. As we got closer, we saw that it was triangular in shape. I told him to pull over and get a picture. We pulled over, and I remember that it took him forever to eventually get the camera. By then, I was watching this thing, and it was slowly moving away. When he finally got his camera together, it had already disappeared. This one could easily be explained, as it could have been a military drone. We were close to some military base thing. But either way, it was still very interesting. I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campground. So if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew that I was on had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of as well, 
and one that was about two and a half hours way up a windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made people play on their phones, but I digress. So for my creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things as well working up there. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, sleeping outside with no tent for the uninitiated, and he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling, but there was no one and nothing there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there ever again, which leads me to believe that he was telling the truth. Now for my story. I've had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still and I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by the window. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I kept saying no. Pretty quickly, their voice started changing to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I was frozen. It was sort of a demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving, while they continued to yell at me. Eventually it stopped, and somehow I fell asleep. I woke up the next day, and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but somehow I knew that he wasn't, and asking the question was just too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but it was still scary. We have a home video of me at around three years old. I'm just sitting in the bathtub talking to my mom about whatever three-year-olds have to talk about. The video seems like your average home video of a toddler, talking, until I stopped my current train of thought and abruptly insert that my dad has broken his neck. My mom stops me and asks why I would say that, and of course I didn't have an answer. I just repeated myself and said it again and then went back to talking about whatever I had been talking about before. The video was filmed in a house in the town I was born in, and soon we moved into my old grandparents' house in another town. My dad had been working the graveyard shift when we moved into the new house, and one night he was later than usual coming home. My mom had stayed up waiting for him, but his dad showed up at our house instead, saying that we had to go to the hospital. My dad had been falling asleep at the wheel and had hit a car head-on while coming home. The crash broke his neck. I remember going to see him at the hospital that night, but I didn't remember having said that this exact thing was going to happen some six or seven months before. My dad lived and is all right now, and my mom showed me the video when I was around 12. My dad said that his brothers had predicted things or said things out of nowhere that ended up happening too. I feel like it's all just an odd coincidence rather than having a family of people who have predicted multiple events, but the date on the tape and the house that we lived in are from before my dad's accident. The tape is there and the date shows it to be true, but I still have a hard time believing I said what I did, when I did.
My great-great-grandpa swore that the devil appeared to him in a Mexican desert when he was a young man. Some time ago, my grandpa was telling me the story that he had once heard from his own grandfather when he was a boy. My great-great-grandpa lived in Mexico and worked in agriculture. One day, he was out in the fields, sitting down under a tree, kind of grumbling and feeling sorry for himself. He wished that he was a rich man so that he would never have to work so hard again in his life. While he sat there daydreaming about how much better his life could be if he had money, this man literally just appeared out of nowhere. He was dressed in cowboy garb with leather chaps and everything, and dangling from his entire body were gold coins that jingled with every slight movement. The strange man also had money pouring from his palms. He held it out to my great-great-grandpa and said, Timoteo, do you want to be rich? My great-great-grandpa, realizing that this had to be some sort of trick, tried to figure out what to do next. He knew there had to be a catch. No one would walk around wearing money, handing it out for free. He panicked and went to fetch his horse. But when he turned back around just a few seconds later, the cowboy dude had vanished. It was like he blinked and the guy was gone. My great-great-grandpa rode home like crazy and locked himself in the house the rest of the day, convinced that Satan himself had just shown up and tried to tempt him into sin and damnation. Apparently, he was very insistent that he hadn't just dreamt it or imagined the whole thing. My grandpa still tells this story without the slightest hint of humor. It's like he totally believed what his grandpa had told him so many years ago. I guess I'll never know for sure, but I always wonder. When I was in the third or fourth grade, I saw a UFO with my older cousin and little brother. This was in Voorhees, New Jersey, during our summer vacation. We were in a high-end apartment complex and had gone outside to go play. This was in the late 90s. We had decided to first see who was out before deciding on what toys to bring out with us. Think water guns, bikes, scooters, Pokemon cards, things like that. We were going to go to the park first, but heard a strange high-pitched whistling noise down the hill from our apartment building near the mailboxes. It was the kind of whistling noise that brought about a strange energy. I noticed everything seemed really quiet, except for this whistling. I say whistling, but that's the closest sound we have in this world that people would collectively be able to understand. But it wasn't exactly whistling. It gave me the creeps. I wasn't scared, I just felt uneasy. My older cousin decided to go check it out. He ran down the hill, and I saw him turn his head left and just stop dead in his tracks. I saw his jaw drop and his eyes go big. He said, oh my gosh, come look at this, it's a UFO. My brother and I were both younger and weary of him since he was known to be a prankster and mischievous. We didn't want to come, and he was like, you won't regret it. He looked at us in such a way that I believed him, so I went down to go look as well. There was an apartment building blocking the view of the UFO, so I walked slowly to where I would pass it and be standing by my cousin. As I neared the location, this whistling noise became louder. I started to see the UFO floating and hovering right next to the balcony of a family we knew because they had older kids that would sometimes play with us. The UFO was about the size of a large pickup truck, and it was giant and metallic, but not a metallic ball. It was spinning really fast and looked as if it should have been able to reflect its surroundings because it was so shiny, but it didn't. The whistling was this ball spinning so fast, yet so slowly as well. It had that saucer thing around it, but not huge or anything. Maybe the saucer it was spinning inside was only about three feet in width. 
but the UFO had to have had a diameter about the length of a Ford Tundra. I was in absolute awe. I felt like I'd won something, like yes, there's proof, and I know something that my parents don't know. My brother had been calling to us, and I hadn't been paying attention. I just told him to come and look. He was always shy and a crybaby, but he came reluctantly. I was just observing this thing spinning and thinking that it had to be observing me too. I noticed in the sky there was like a tunnel of a spinning energy or clouds in the air. That tunnel went straight up into the sky and far away, and the UFO, or its copy, was on the other side way off in the distance. My cousin wanted to throw a rock at it and tell them to get out. My little brother screamed his panic scream and told him no. I also told him not to do that. He listened to us, but I guess they felt his hostility, and the UFO moved back and higher. My cousin said, see, they're scared, let's make them go, and he started screaming and saying go away and get out. My brother and I joined. I can't remember if we actually did start throwing rocks or not, but I don't think we did. That part gets murky. The tunnel looked like it got bigger in size, and the UFO started looking like it was appearing in the tunnel, even though it was right in front of us. It was like there was a delay, and we could see snapshots of the UFO in the tunnel going up, like a loading bar where it's copying itself. There was a loud sound like a whoosh, and my little brother screamed and bolted home. The UFO was no longer in front of us, but the tunnel was still there, and we could see like a bright light and the UFO at the end of the tunnel, and then it was gone. We ran home to tell my mom. When we got there, my mom was pissed and thought that my cousin and I had tricked my brother and scared him. She couldn't quite understand through my brother's hysterical crying what he was saying, only heard that they made me see the aliens. We saw no aliens, and we explained this to my mom. We explained what we saw, and I said, Mom, it's real. I was the only girl, and my mom believed me because I wasn't one to lie or prank. I used to keep a diary, and I wrote this experience down. I forgot about it, and somehow it had felt like a dream over the years. We had moved to a new house, many strange things happened there. And something absolutely terrifying and awe-inspiring happened that made me check my diary. I had asked my brother if he remembered the UFO, and he said he did. He told me the story and it matched what was in my diary. We called my uncle and cousin and had my cousin retell his side of the story. Years later, all of our stories matched. Ever since I was a child, I've gotten random snippets of deja vu. These episodes last from a few seconds to a minute. Whenever I have them, though, I always get the sense that what just happened was something I had dreamt about. I don't have particularly vivid dreams often, and I rarely remember the details when they are vivid. The real-life occurrences trigger the feelings of deja vu, but when I think about it logically, I know that it's not something I've experienced before, but rather something from a dream, or maybe an alternate reality or something that my mind just interprets as a dream. I'm not sure what to make of it, and I've never told anyone else about this. I guess I just want to know that I'm not alone. I was an assistant librarian in a Hawaiian middle school. As usual, I was asked to print copies and fix a machine as one of my many tasks. Every machine I walked next to, in more than one room, made a loud electronic hum when I was near, or a beep, which was odd but not unsettling. It only made me slightly curious. 
The broken machine worked just fine, and people would look at me strangely when I said that. The music in the library was always on the AM station. That's right, only classical music was allowed in there. I was cleaning the glass door, and the music went from classical to static for a bit, and then to full-on hip-hop. The librarian screamed at me, saying, Why did you change the radio station? I was fed up with her always yelling at me, so I finally spoke up for myself and yelled back, You're closer to the radio. You're right next to it. I'm cleaning the glass door. There's no way I could have changed it. We stared at each other with anger like an old western showdown for a long minute or two. Then the hip-hop music went to static and back to classical. We stopped staring at each other then and carried on with our daily duties. The radio didn't malfunction after that. The day continued and school teachers entered the library asking me how my day was going. Cheerfully and kind of joking, standing with my hands on my hips like a superhero, I said, I'm an electric girl because all the machines were coming to life with noise when I walked by them. That there was a broken machine that only worked for me and that weird things happened with the radio station. So today, I must have electrical powers, so I am electric girl. A little later, the librarian screamed for me saying that I had a phone call. My sister called me to tell me that her dad had died that day at 12 p.m. We were half-sisters, and she just wanted to let me know. When I got off the phone, the librarian yelled at me not to have people call me at work. Mind you, this was the first time that it ever happened. I told her what my sister said and told her maybe that's why the radio station was being weird. She said she didn't care what the reason was, nobody should ever call me there, and that there must have been rain somewhere to mess up the station. It was a sunny and peaceful day all over the island that day. I worked there for three years, and the radio station never did that before. When I arrived at my apartment complex, the elevator acted weird for me too. I stretched my hand out to the button, and it made a weird noise right before I touched it. Then, when I was in the elevator going up, it fell a floor or so and bounced back. I said out loud, Okay, this is enough. Now you're scaring me. You need to stop. The elevator then started to move properly back up to my floor, the fourth floor. Nothing weird happened after that. I think I might have scared my sister's dad's ghost away. I told my half-sister and her siblings what happened that day, and they said it sounded like something that their dad would do because he was a prankster. I know my half-sister sounded mad. She asked me, why would her dad visit me? I said, I don't know. I thought it was weird too. Why would my sister's dad's ghost visit me? I wasn't even blood related. I wasn't raised by him or with him or near him. I knew I visited him on holidays and just the last week before he died, with lots of people knowing that he might die soon, hence the visit. He was losing his mind a bit toward the end. My half-sister told me that her father told her I had visited, but he told her this days after I had actually visited because he'd only just then figured out who I was. It's also strange that this spirit visited me quickly after his death if not exactly at the time that he died and stuck around for hours after. So after writing my personal experience down, I thought, hey, maybe I should see if this ghost reached out to his family. So I messaged his family members individually on Facebook to see if they had had any paranormal experiences too. Her dad had a shit ton of kids by different ladies. I guess he was one of the first to ask in ancient times for friends with benefits. I guess they were still living their hippy-dippy days with free love, even though babies with diapers does not sound free to me. My mom would say, he must be doing something right. Yuck. Then she went on to tell me that she couldn't share a man, so she left. However, she still dragged me to all these shindigs that they would go to. I guess I was a human shield for my mom to feel brave, who knows. Let's just say the holiday gatherings felt a little weird, with all these women and kids there and the only man there was my half-sister's dad. I sensed some jealousy with these fake-ass smiles coming from thirsty women. Thirsty for one dude, regardless of the obstacles. They always talked shit about each other to me. Then they told me not to say anything like they thought my mom was a prostitute. So there's no confusion. Whenever I use the word his, I am probably referring to the dead guy, so just keep that in mind. 
We'll start with his grumpy daughter, my half-sister, who worked two jobs 16 hours a day. Not sure if she was just sleep-deprived when she experienced this, but she would never admit it. She said the night before her dad died, she saw his face in her bedroom curtain. He was alive in Pukalani when this happened, and she was on the other side of the island in Napoli, in her house. Now I introduce to you his widow, a long-term groupie. I only say that because I saw her at all the holiday gatherings and never understood the connection until 20 plus years later when she finally married him. He never had kids with her, so I thought, maybe just friends? All my sister's dad's groupies passed away from old age, except for one. He snagged the last one alive and put a ring on it when he had one foot in the grave. It's like marrying your caretaker but with benefits. Anyway. She said the night he passed, she had a clear dream of him being with others, happy and joyful. Three days after he died, she could feel the weight of someone sitting on her bed. When she thought of him, a song on the radio about magic came on. He was a magician. And she found a painted rock with an angel on it and thought that it must have been from him. His youngest kids both said that occasionally they had very vivid, almost lucid dreams where their dad was talking to them, giving them advice telling them how much he loves them and so on. The youngest daughter is a badass skater chick. I only say that with mad respect because she won a lot of competitions. She said whenever she was trying to make very hard decisions about her life, her dad always tried to protect her by pointing her in the right direction, in her very vivid, almost lucid dreams. Her dad's ghost once told her in a dream to take the offer. He was referring to a plane ticket that her sister had offered her to get away from an abusive ex. Later, the ex told her he was going to get counseling and that he had changed. At the time, she was very torn and wanted to go back to him, believing that he was sorry and that he would go to counseling. Her dad warned her again in a dream and she didn't listen. She left the safety of the women's shelter to see him and got kidnapped. He strangled and beat her almost to death in front of their baby. He put bruises on the baby too. The ex is sitting in prison now, and she said basically nothing good has ever come from ignoring her dad dreams. And now I finally bring you to his youngest son, little bro, who I will always remember as the naked kid running around the house while everyone screamed for him to put clothes on and he giggled. He's grown up now. I shared my experience with him. He said his dad used to have a radio show when he was young and always seemed to be interested in the way that electronics worked. So he became an electrician. So, it's kind of ironic what happened to me. He went on to share his story, that an old light in his garage where his dad used to hang out turned on and off a lot after he died. He said that he really wanted to dream about his dad, and years later he finally did. In his first dream, his dad was sitting in a chair next to his wife in a room. He asked his dad, What are you doing here? His dad's response? I've always been here. Three or four months later, he had a very vivid dream in full color with him in a magic prop studio. He used to be a magician too. He was able to have a full on hour long conversation where he could ask his dad questions and he gave back answers. He asked his dad, does everyone want to be happy? The dad said, no. His dad would always say inspirational stuff to him like, do what you want to do, not what other people say you have to do but mostly they talked about magic. Before you know it, his son was getting constantly booked for magic shows. He said that his dreams really helped give him the confidence he needed to become the magician he is today. He said that he feels he channels his dad's spirit at all of his shows. He's still getting advice from his dad and his dreams to this very day. After he messaged me all this info, he went to go pick up his friend, and his car smelled like his dad. Weed, cigarettes, beer, and incense. He said that he got kind of teary-eyed after that. And now to his sweet vegan daughter. She said she didn't have anything paranormal happen to her. That sucks, I guess, but it happens sometimes. I have had a lot of ghost experiences in my life, but I was super bummed when I didn't have one when I really wanted to, when one of my best friends hanged himself over a heartbreak. I begged his spirit to show me a sign, but I never got one. I don't understand why sometimes paranormal things happen and sometimes they don't. I don't always understand why spirits choose to show themselves to some people and not others. Maybe there was a sign, but 
It never looked paranormal to me, so I didn't notice it. This happened when living in Indian Springs across from the base. We lived in a one-story, older home. One night, my significant other heard a noise outside, got a flashlight, and shone it out an open window. He called his oldest son over to the window too. They saw what my partner, who was a scientist by the way, working on the installation there at the time, described as a dark, human-like creature, about two and a half to three feet tall. He quickly retreated from the window to wake me up. At this time, the creature jumped up onto the roof. So as he was shaking me awake, all I saw was my partner's white face and then heard two thumps on the roof. Then I heard something hit the ground behind us, outside the window that was facing the backyard. My partner grabbed the flashlight again and he and his son went to the back door to look out. The creature was now lurking by some bushes in the backyard. After a few minutes of watching it, it skittered away outside of flashlight range. They were both white as ghosts and trembling as they described this thing. My significant other's son was friends with the son of the police chief. He told his friend what they'd seen, and the friend related it to his father. His father, the police chief, came over shortly afterward, off the record of course, and told us that he had gotten calls from tourists and people passing through who had also described encounters with this creature. He was highly intrigued himself and wanted more information on it. He said that he had seen fuzzy pictures of it and that these sightings were years apart and that the people who called in to report it didn't know one another. We are miles away from the springs now, but every time I've mentioned that night to my significant other, he still goes white as a sheet. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home and I was about 13 years old. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here besides the odd being watched feeling that I would experience. My mom has hired my biological father, whom I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at that house. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I came to learn that my stepfather had a lot of problems and was sleeping with prostitutes, some younger than his own children. His oldest daughter was 30, and he was sleeping with prostitutes that were about a decade younger. I found this very concerning. Of course, he was cheating on my mom and also just the behavior in general, and some other details that I won't get into that I experienced with him. But it was very evident that this guy had some real serious problems, and he gave me the creeps. I told my mother and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that she knew exactly what was going on. I wanted to get away from him and everything that he does, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and so I moved down there and was living on my own. He had most of the items and furniture from his old home in this home that I was staying at. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed alone in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was scared shitless and I couldn't sleep after that. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems, so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bathroom as well as the master bedroom and the closet there. 
It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that room, and I was frightened to be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I felt like I was being watched again. And then I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped up and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds later, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was so frozen in fear that I stood up at my desk, and all I could do was scream. I called my mother, hysterical, and explained to her what had happened, and two days later she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I had found out that she was divorcing my stepdad and sending him to the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside the same feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home, with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of it, growling, completely frozen. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state and I haven't experienced anything like that since. I'm wondering if anybody might have an explanation as to what occurred, paranormal or otherwise. I believe this may have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything at all until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lived in. I was about 11, and I was just laying in my bed, but the way my bed was positioned in my room made it so that I could look straight down the hallway, as in the bottom of my bed faced the door, and my head was near a wall. Anyway, I was laying there, and I was trying to go to sleep, when I heard a door open. So I looked down the hallway, and all I saw was a completely nude woman standing down at the end of the hallway staring at me. She was kind of a pretty woman. She had long, dark hair, and I could even see her pale blue eyes. She was probably in her late twenties or early thirties. She was moving closer and closer to me. I was already afraid because there was this strange naked woman in my house, but what was even weirder is that her legs weren't moving. They weren't even touching the ground. The weirdest part, though, is that the closer she got to me, the older she looked. By the time she was at my door, she was hunched over, had gray hair that looked like it had never been brushed, wrinkled skin, and all the other features of an old woman that you would expect. As soon as she entered my room, she started screaming at me, which scared me, so I pulled the blankets above my head. I closed my eyes, but... When I pulled the blankets off, I didn't see anything. If anyone has ever experienced something like this, or you know what kind of entity this was, please let me know. So my boyfriend and I were staying at my grandma's house for about a week. We both like late night walking, so I decided to take him out on one and show him what it's like at my grandma's. He's used to the city, and my grandma's house is in the middle of nowhere. We ended up walking a direction that I never go, and we had walked for a few minutes before we hit a field clearing on either side of the road. We were talking when all of a sudden we heard coyotes toward the back part of the fields and mountains. 
I told him they move fast and that we should probably turn back and get back to the house. We did, but it seemed like the moment we turned to walk back, they begin to close in. Within a matter of seconds, they seemed to be right behind us and were closing the distance fast. We began to panic and power walk and then jog because they sounded like they were in a frenzy. After a minute or two of fear and adrenaline, the sound died to a near silence. Almost home, a dog ran out in front of us wanting attention. However, as soon as I went to pet him, he seemed to notice something and immediately positioned himself behind us toward the coyote area we had just left and began barking and growling. We took it as our cue and booked it the rest of the way home with his frantic barks in the background. When we made it back, my boyfriend wanted to sit on the steps to see if they had tracked us all the way back. We sat for a moment before everything went silent. All of a sudden, a low, deep growling noise filled the air. It was everywhere, all at once, like a jet taking off. It began to get louder as an ice-cold chill ran straight down my back. We both looked at each other for a second before I spoke up and told him something wasn't right and we needed to go in now. We darted in the house and locked the doors done exploring for the night. The coyotes are normal for our area, and we're on their normal trail, but what made them go silent and stop tracking us? What was the dog so frantic about? And more importantly, what was that sound? Last night, I had a really weird experience. I was laying down, ready to fall asleep, but still fully awake. My boyfriend turned on the noise machine that he has so he could fall asleep. He always does this, and it's never bothered me before. However, not too long after he turned on the machine, I started hearing a sequence of individual tunes that eventually became a melody. It's like a sound that starts and stops. First, I thought that he had changed the machine itself, or that the sound coming out of the machine was different. I asked him if he could hear the music, and he said no. He asked me what it sounded like, and he still couldn't hear it, even when he was intentionally listening for it. Then he changed the sound, and I stopped hearing the first melody. And a few minutes later, I started hearing a new one. I asked him again, and he said he couldn't hear anything but I was hearing something completely different. This time it sounded almost like a symphony, but with very few instruments. Then he turned the machine on and off a couple of times, and finally, he told me he could hear something. He said that he could hear small pitches when the machine was on, but it was completely different from what I was hearing, as this was a third distinct and different melody that I was hearing. He eventually turned the machine off, but I could still hear melodies all night long. I never figured out what that was. I've seen spirits all of my life. I interact with human ones. I've seen the spirits of some of my deceased pets, but last week I saw something different. I work more than one job, but one has a stockroom. It is on land leased from one of several local tribes. It was tribal land for centuries before there was a highway built through the center of it in a mountain pass. In the stock area, we have racks that can be rolled. These are called Lundias. About a year ago, I confided in a friend that there were in fact some odd spirits there. My friend asked me if I had seen the ones in the stockroom. He said they were some sort of gremlin-like shadows and that he had seen them at night. 
I did not see or sense any of them for a long time. When I saw some last week, I remembered his comments. They are odd. They're black, shadowy things. They're different, about two and a half to three feet long. They run in the lundias, low to the ground. A former co-worker asked me over two years ago if I had seen them running through the nearby desert. I told her I had never seen anything like them, but I have seen them now. They are hunched over at the spine, so their heads are lower than their backs. Their backs are rounded. The vertebrae are fairly well defined. They don't expect to be seen. They're sort of coyote-like, and sort of dog-like, as if they were the victims of some terrible spinal disease. They have dark fur or hair on the spine, thinning to bare skin on the bellies. Their legs are bent at the knees like dogs, in the back, and bent at the knees in the front. Their faces are dog-like with canine-style teeth. I know they have been there for many, many centuries. Some sort of nature spirits, maybe? Either way, I don't plan to bother them at all. This was not a dream. I was fully awake, but I was having a hard time trying to go to sleep. I was in my room, but I couldn't fall asleep there, so I moved to the living room. Usually, as I'm trying to go to sleep, I'll let my mind wander on its own, and I always end up thinking of nonsense, like sentences or scenarios that don't mean anything. This time was different, though. I can almost always control the thoughts and steer them into the direction I want them to go, but this time I couldn't. It's like my thoughts were not my own. My mind was just racing with random sentences that I would never be able to think of. I had my eyes closed, but suddenly every thought racing through my head just stopped on a dime, and I hear a high-pitched female voice scream, someone is home. She said a name, but I couldn't make it out. It seriously sounded like it was being yelled directly into my ear, and it turned into an echo chamber in my brain. I heard it replay over and over and over until it faded out. All of this happened in maybe five seconds, but it felt like I had heard it 15 times. I lifted my head up off the couch to see who was there, but it was no one. So I decided to try to go to sleep again, and as soon as I closed my eyes, all I could see was dirt, a field, and eight blue orbs. I'm still awake at this point, and out of nowhere, I hear the voice again, this time inside of my head, saying, eight people died here. I'm really not sure what to think of this. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I used to experience sleep paralysis and lucid dreaming quite often, but not like this. With everything I was hearing and seeing, I felt like it was completely out of my control. It was so weird. I had a lot of creepy experiences as a child, but I never truly realized how unnatural they were until I got older. The first of many weird experiences was when I was six. This one by far was probably the creepiest and scariest one I can recall. It was your average night. I don't remember anything from earlier that day. I was upstairs in the bathroom having just cleaned up before dinner. I opened the door to exit the bathroom into the upstairs hallway. Now, the way my house is laid out is when you exit the bathroom, you come into the small hallway. At the end of the hallway is the door to the attic, and to the right of that is my parents' master bedroom. The minute I look down the hall, I'm about to turn out the bathroom light, and that's when it happened. There was a figure at the end of the hall, in front of the attic door. 
It was a completely blacked out shadow person, but he looked exactly like my dad. Same height, same build, same everything. Just without any discernible features or details. Except for one thing. My dad wore glasses. As I'm looking at it, this thing did as well. But the area where the clear lenses would be were completely white. They also had no discernible details except for the shape. I was thinking to myself, why would my father be upstairs? And that's when my blood ran cold, because I could hear my father yelling to my mom from downstairs. She was making dinner in the kitchen. I instantly knew that this wasn't my dad. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. It was like this thing took control over my whole body. The next thing I know, I'm walking back into the bathroom, and I rested my head on the towel rack. The only thing I can remember after that was my mother calling me from downstairs. I am now 20 years old, but I can still remember this horrifying experience vividly to this day. I've always wondered what that thing was, and why it looked like my dad. We had a few things happen in our old house. We lived there for 13 years, a mid-terraced Victorian house in the United Kingdom. My partner has two sons that used to come over on the weekend to stay. The youngest would never walk down the hall on the ground floor by himself to go to the toilet because he said he didn't like it. We used to think it was just because it was a dark house. You'd have to leave the living room walk down a hall that had a little dog leg before you got to the kitchen, and then into the bathroom. He wasn't bothered about the kitchen. It was just the hall he didn't like. That just happened all the time, and we would just moan that he wouldn't go to the toilet, but we would walk him through the hall anyway, trying to convince him that it was fine, and that it was just an old house. We also used to have our PC desk under the stairs, it was open to the hall, but it was a nifty little space to work from. I was making dinner one night and chopping something when I saw my partner pop his head round the door from my peripheral vision. I knew he was working at the PC and thought, what does he want? So I walked down to the door and asked him. He looked really confused, so I told him what had just happened. He swore that he hadn't moved from the spot. I believed him because of his reaction. I have no idea who it was, but it was the head and shoulders of a man, and it was so domestic, that's why I was positive it was my partner to start with. A few months later we were redecorating, and the stairs were boxed in with plywood. We had thought it looked pretty ugly for such an old house, so he pulled it all down. The next thing we both felt was a fresh air breeze building up. No doors or windows were open. We joked around, saying it was the spirit trying to get out, and he opened the front door and said goodbye. The weird thing was that his son started going to the toilet all by himself after that happened. He never said anything else about the hallway, and had no issues with it. We're pretty realistic and have a healthy skepticism, but that was a little bit odd. That whole place was a little bit odd. I started recording my sleep a month ago to hear myself sleep talk, but haven't really heard myself. However, yesterday morning I came across a very strange voice clearly saying, wake up, at 4.30. It's definitely not me, as I'm a female and the voice is very deep. My partner was in the spare room that night, and you can hear no entrance into the room previous to the recording, which you can hear with other recordings on the app where we enter or leave the bedroom, no matter how quiet we are. I have no idea what this could be. 
Nothing was heard after this, apart from me possibly moving around. And then when I woke up a few hours later, now I'm scared, especially as we've had some weird things happening in our house. Also, just some answers to some questions or assumptions I know I'll get. My partner pranking me. It couldn't be that. I started using the app as my partner told me that I sleep talk. I hadn't really heard much in the month that I was using it, so I stopped using it for a couple of weeks. Therefore, he had no idea I was recording on this night. My partner is a terrible prankster and always ends up laughing. Even he's a bit freaked out. Me pranking? Definitely not. Like my partner, I'm not good at holding it out. And also, I would probably come up with something a little bit better. Another assumption is that it's my voice, but it's too low to be mine, and it sounds robotic. When I've heard myself sleep talk on this app in the past, it sounds nothing like it. According to Fitbit, at this time I wasn't dreaming, so I couldn't have been sleep talking. Although I accept that this isn't exactly the most highly accurate data. It's not a noise coming from outside, either. It's too clear. Noises from farther away sound, well, farther away, and the phone is right next to me on the bedside table. We have no idea what said it. I lost my very brilliant, witty, overachieving son to opioids almost five years ago. He was extremely intelligent, had a high IQ, was a gifted student who graduated college in three years. He was self-sufficient with a great job and had a very dark, terrible secret. He became addicted to pills in college and managed to hide it for four years. He didn't smoke and rarely drank. I found out about his addiction just five weeks before his death, and I was able to get him into treatment. He would only stay there 11 days, and I was with him at his apartment the last six days of his life. On November 10th, 2014, he gave me two red roses. He said, because you deserve these, mom. And I then dropped him off at an AA meeting, but he didn't go to the meeting. He was found 45 minutes later and responsive in a pet smart bathroom with a needle in his arm. Since his death, and I can't remember exactly when it started, I have had roses come into my life time and time again in many different forms. I moved to Portland, the Rose City. I adopted a cat. She was already named Rosie. I decided to start photographing two roses which appear frequently. I swear if anybody could figure out how to reach beyond the other world, it would be my brilliant son. They appear randomly and also on important dates. His birthday. My birthday. Mother's Day. For example, on his birthday in 2016, I was at a thrift store the night before, feeling sad and like a loser, really. I frequently beat myself up over losing my son the way I did. As I was leaving, I saw two red roses in a glass display case. It stopped me in my tracks, and as I looked at it, I saw a little note. Pull my pin close to you. It was a music box. As I wound it up and pulled the pin, it played Close to You by the Carpenters. On the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to create a dream come true. A song about a birthday. Of course I bought it. I planted a red rose bush for my son when I moved to Portland in 2015. It has struggled and has never really produced much. Last year, in 2018, I noticed that it had two buds. The bush produced two perfect red roses, side by side, that bloomed from Mother's Day to my birthday. It produced no other flowers that year. So odd. My other roses had dozens of blooms. I have countless other signs, sometimes roses, sometimes other unexplained events that leave me wondering. At any rate, this is my story.
My father's house is a creepy one. It isn't secluded, as we had many neighbors, but it was by no means in a suburb, if you get what I mean. This story is about my father's first experience, and also my first experience with the paranormal. My father is a skeptical man when it comes to the paranormal. Skeptical meaning that if something is explainable, he won't bother with it. That fact is what makes everything I'm about to tell you so much more terrifying. As he used to work graveyard shift for the school district in our town, he would sleep during the day. Back when this incident happened, we only had a cheap futon for a couch. The futon had a metal frame with a dingy cover as the cushion portion of it, and the back of the futon, when locked up into a couch, had vertical, hollow bars. He told me that one day, while everyone was away at either work or school, he was having trouble sleeping and was awake for about an hour before being able to fall back asleep. He told me that while he was laying there trying to convince himself to sleep, he heard someone open our front door, but he never heard it close. It's a finicky door, so you have to slam it to get it actually closed. Essentially, he would have had to have heard someone close it. He had a reason to believe it was his girlfriend, now ex, coming home from work early for lunch and he thought nothing of it. While he's waiting for her to come to the bedroom, he suddenly hears heavy footsteps walk around what he believes is our living room and slowly run their fingers, theoretically, across the back of our futon. This is where the description earlier comes in. What he thought was fingers ran across the back of the futon. There's a distinct metallic thunk, thunk, thunk when someone does this. It's not mistakable for anything else in the house. It's the only object that could make that sound. He immediately thinks that it's an intruder and rushes into the living room, but no one is there. The door is wide open and nobody's anywhere in the house. I should also mention that we have a deck made of wood that has a flight of stairs leading down to the ground level. Also, the walls are paper thin. You can hear anything from one place in the house to another. I can hear my father sneeze when he's in his room while I'm in the living room. This means that he would have had to have heard, or at least seen, somebody walk out the front door and down the stairs to leave the house, and he did not. This experience had him on edge for months. He tried talking to whatever manifested in the house and taking pictures of it, just to get some sense of closure from that day. As for my encounter, when I was a teenager, my sisters and I would hang out in our bathroom to talk and whatnot. Don't ask why, it was a thing for us for some reason. One particular day, one of my sisters and I were in there talking to each other when we heard somebody sprinting down the hall. It's a very short hallway, so it didn't phase us when it stopped abruptly at the end of the hall. We were on edge, as we thought it was our younger sister and we didn't want to get in trouble. As mentioned, my father worked nights and he would be upset when woken up while sleeping. So I open the door and as soon as I do, this huge gust of wind hits me in the face. Like, you know, if someone's running past you. I look out into the living room and see my father's now ex sitting on the futon watching television. I asked her where my sister was and she pointed next to her and motioned that she was sleeping. I asked if she had just heard that running and she gave me a funny look. As my heart sank, I slowly closed the door and looked at my sister, who was frozen with fear. We both knew what it was and didn't really mention it for a while. We didn't want to make the story feel any more real than it already did. I always get random intrusive thoughts at night when everything is quiet and I can't sleep. They're thoughts composed of words I sometimes don't even say or know the meaning to, 
and they just pop into my mind without any prior thoughts related to them. Often, they lead me to have to look up definitions. I'm legitimately afraid that some sort of frequency wave is intruding on my mind and manipulating my cognitive functioning. Also, sometimes when I nod out at night, when I'm tired but I'm trying to stay awake, as soon as I nod out but am still mostly conscious, I'll hear fragments of a voice making a sound. Sometimes it will say my name. And one time, I didn't even nod out, and to the right of me, I heard the name of my boyfriend out loud. I swear my house is haunted by some kind of energy. My father died here eleven years ago, by killing himself. I was the last one to enter his bedroom where he passed to shut the windows because it was storming heavily outside before leaving to spend the night at my grandmother's house. I was very close to my dad and took after him in many ways, features and all. However, years before he passed, I was very resentful and nothing but mean and nasty to him. Literally minutes before he passed, I gave him a dirty look, for no reason. Flash forward eleven years, and I have found myself exactly where he was before he died. Isolated, depressed, and addicted to opioids. At first I thought I was haunted by him, but maybe there's a dark energy that followed him throughout his life, and now it's attached to me. I just feel so haunted here all the time, alone in my mom's basement. Late at night when everything is quiet, around midnight until four o'clock when the sun is just about to rise and the birds start chirping, I always feel a strong presence around me, and sometimes my lamp and bedroom lights will glow brighter and cause all the shadows in my room to become darker and darker. It's creepy. And to make my mom's house even creepier, it's full of my grandmother's old furniture from the 50s and 60s. Everything is old with weird energies attached. Everyone that I've asked who's come over to my house has told me that they feel a very strange and dark and sinister energy here. We moved into it newly built, and it's only about 14 years old now, so I really don't know what's going on. It was October 26th of 2017. It was the night before season two of Stranger Things came out. As a huge fan, I was super excited and decided to stay up the whole night to watch all of it. I was half awake, half asleep, watching YouTube when I started hearing a light banging noise on the downstairs window. It was almost like a bird had flown into it and was flapping its wings against it. Keep in mind, I live in a heavily wooded area, so it's not that uncommon to have animals around your house at night. I just ignored it and figured it was a bird. About two to three minutes later, I hear three sets of three bangs, except it sounded more like a human doing it this time. I tried to listen to see if I could hear anything like talking or laughing. I hear nothing at all, like absolutely nothing. So I kind of just ignore it again. Time goes on, and again, two to three minutes later, more bangs. Except this wasn't like a bang that a human could do without tools. It sounded like the equivalent of someone banging a hammer against the side of my house. At this point, I am scared to death, and I'm thinking about calling the cops. But I decide I'm just going to wait, and if it happens one more time, I will. This time, it's at least five minutes before the next knocks. These were just like the last one, where it sounded like a hammer. Except this time, it was all around my house. It sounded like there were a hundred people banging all at once. The speed at which the bangs were happening was just not something a human could do. At that point, I decided to run to the kitchen to grab a knife. I grabbed my dog and ran up to my room, locking the door. I calmed down for a second and, out of nowhere, my neighbor texts me, asking if I hear the banging too. So at this point, I know I'm not crazy. 
I decided to call 911 as the knocking was still happening. I'd say a minute later, the knocking stops, and soon after, a few cops came and searched the entire house, yard, and a decent bit of the woods. They looked on the windows and siding for any sort of handprint or any sort of proof that somebody was knocking. Absolutely nothing. Now this is the part that really gets me. Earlier that night, it was raining, so the ground was quite muddy. They looked for any sort of shoe print or even an animal print. Absolutely nothing. The only prints they found were their own. Years later, about two weeks ago actually, I was walking through the woods grabbing my motion-activated camera to check the footage. It's about 7 p.m., so it's by no means dark, but it's starting to get a little bit. I'm a decent way into the woods at this point, when I hear this god-awful noise. I don't even know what to call it. It was like a wailing, but it was so loud. It was like oohs and ahs and screeches all mixed together. It sounded like screaming, but higher and more intense. It was horrific. No human could make a noise like that. There was absolutely no way. After that, I hopped on my ATV and gunned it home, not looking back. No joke. When I got home, I checked my phone and the same neighbor that had asked about the knocking years earlier asked me if I had heard screaming while I was in the woods. I have absolutely no idea what this could be, but I know it was real because I wasn't the only one that heard it, and I sure as hell don't want to run into it. I wanted to share an experience that my best friend and I had about three to four years ago. I'm 17 currently, and he is 18. At the time, we were both Christian, and this experience scared the living hell out of us. I was spending the night at his house, and his mom wanted us to walk their dog before it got too late. It was around 8 to 9 at night. This wasn't the first time that we had walked around at night. In my friend's neighborhood, there's this elementary school. We would always go there and let his dog run around on the field. We arrived at the school, but we didn't feel like going on the field, so instead we decided to just walk around it. After passing the classrooms and the gym, we walked around the perimeter of the field, which has a chain link fence. I noticed that when we made a left toward the last stretch of fence, there were two people waiting on the curb across the street. We assumed it was just a couple out walking, but we couldn't really make them out, except for dark, human-like figures. We got a little spooked and decided to pick up the pace, not walking fast, but definitely not as slowly as we were before. I turned around, and they were following us. I whispered to my friend, and he saw them about 20 feet behind us on the corner that we had just turned. At this point, we weren't just spooked, we were pretty scared. We started to fast walk down the sidewalk. When we made it to the end of the chain link fence, about 30 feet from where I turned and whispered to my friend, we noticed that they had already made it all the way down the sidewalk before the corner we turned and first saw them at. There's no way they could have turned and made it there in time, even sprinting. My friend's dog started to whine, and we just decided to book it back to his place. This was the neighborhood he grew up in, and he knew a shortcut back to his house. The only other way to get to his home is to walk about two blocks on the main road. We were out of breath by the time we made it back, and we sprinted as fast as our legs could carry us. We opened his front gate, and I turned around just to see if anything was there. Lo and behold, there were two black, human-like figures on the main road, walking toward the house. There's no way that any people could have made it there in time, even if they did know where to go. We ran inside, locked the door, and prayed to God that nothing would happen. 
We googled how to get rid of demons, prayers we could use, and so on. Nothing else happened that night. We talked to our pastor, and he told us about an experience with a demon that he had as a child. He told us to memorize certain prayers and to trust in God. Since then, I haven't really thought about it until I read some other stories. We have no idea what it was that night that followed us. All we knew was that we had to run away as fast as possible. I've always had a belief in the unknown and spirits, but I had never really experienced anything from the unknown other than the typical deja vu we all experience from time to time. And then high school happened. I have two stories about my own personal experiences. They are true events, even if people are skeptical. I know what I saw. I know what I felt. Believe whatever you want to believe, or believe what will help you sleep at night. But either way, these are true. Before I get into the stories, it's probably worth pointing out that I used to use Ouija boards with one of my friends. Stupid, I know. So when I was in high school, we lived in this neighborhood with an old textile mill in it. I always had a creepy vibe about the mill. I've never looked up if anything happened there, because I've always been, and still am, afraid of what I might find. My bus stop used to be in front of the mill, and I had to start walking to school, because I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched by someone, or something, at the mill. Now, two things happened after I started walking to school. One, I started seeing a little girl out of the corner of my eye, about four or five in the mornings as I was getting ready for school. I was the only one awake at the time, so maybe she just felt comfortable appearing then. I never felt threatened by her, and I don't know her name, but she looked like she was maybe from the 20s. I actually stopped seeing her after a while, which made me kind of sad, even though her presence also sent a shiver down my spine. The second thing that happened was my brother and his friend decided to go in the mill where, according to them, they found markings where a body was and dried blood. I don't know how true that is because I refuse to go into that place, but I still can't ever shake the feeling that something is watching me, even to this day. In fact, I think it has intensified since my brother and his friend went in there. Apparently now it's being remodeled and reopened. I hope they cleansed that building of any negative energies and spirits first, but somehow I doubt it. My second story takes place a few years after the incident with the little girl at my sweet 16. My parents threw me a surprise party with a luau theme. I had a few of my close friends over, some staying overnight. One of my friends, let's call her Cat, needed to go home, so we all decided to walk her home. I mean, she didn't live that far, maybe two or three blocks at most. Well, we get there and we're all hanging out. Kat lived near a cemetery, and another friend who I'll call Sam suggested that we just walk around for a little bit. Now, it's maybe 9.30 at night. This cemetery has been known to have fog only in the cemetery. Fog that doesn't affect the area outside of its cobblestone walls. I didn't tell anyone, of course, and we all thought it would be a great idea. So we all hop over the wall, which really isn't that tall, and we just start walking around, looking at who's buried there. In this cemetery, there is an area that has its own fence, and after a while, Sam and I get a little bored and decided we wanted to go inside. So we did, and immediately she starts feeling sick to her stomach and we can't figure out why. So we tell everybody still in the cemetery, and we leave. The second we leave, Sam is feeling better. No nausea, no stomach pain, nothing. Then I started feeling nauseous, which freaked me out a little bit. So I convinced everyone to go back to my house, because I didn't want to be around that place anymore. 
We told Kat goodbye and we left. I didn't stop feeling nauseous until we were inside my house. I don't think whatever was in there wanted us there. And I'm glad that all that ever happened to me was a wave of nausea. I assume it could have been a lot worse. I had just gotten back from the beach and I went inside the house looking for my grandmother. The door was unlocked and she never leaves without locking the door. I didn't see her on the couch and her bedroom door was not closed so I knew she wasn't taking a nap, but it was just odd that she wasn't on the couch or the front porch. I glanced at the table and there was no note. I called for her and I heard a kind of muffled sound that I thought might have been a muffled call for help. I ran to the back. I didn't see her on the bed, so I ran to the bathroom and she wasn't there either. I called again for her and I didn't hear anything. So I looked around the bathroom once more and then back to the bedroom. I swear that I saw her laying on the floor in the bedroom. I saw her long enough and well enough to see what she was wearing a blue sweater and jeans. I blinked and she wasn't there. For a moment, I thought I just imagined it, so I ran to the front of the house and looked around. I thought maybe I should go get my mom. This time though, I saw my grandma's neon yellow notepad on the kitchen table, so bright that it was impossible not to see. And there was a note saying she'd gone across the street for a second. I looked at that table and there was no note before. I felt so disoriented and confused for a second. I went back outside, and there was my grandmother with the neighbor. She was wearing a completely different outfit, too. I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to freak anybody out. I just kind of hope whoever that other person I saw got help passing on, or whatever they needed. Long story short, I signed my grandma up for a clothing subscription. You know, the kind that you fill out a questionnaire and a stylist picks things out for you and sends them to you in the mail. You try them on and keep what you like. It's like a subscription box. Anyway, my grandmother called me and said that she wanted to keep everything, so I logged into her account to mark everything. Guys, I shit you not. The sweater that my grandma was wearing when I had seen her on the floor she received it in that pack. I'm kind of freaking out. I want to tell her, but again, I also don't want to come off like a weirdo. I mean, she already knows I'm weird, I just don't want her to think I'm that kind of weird. I guess I'm safe for a while because it's the summer and that's definitely a winter top, but I don't know. It makes me nervous. This all started a few months ago. My friend and I found out about skinwalkers, and for a while I just knew that I had one following me. But after a while everything stopped. But now things have progressively gotten worse. It all started as one night I was talking about creepy things on the phone with a friend of mine. Some things started happening. Lights would flicker, my phone wouldn't charge, the fan would turn on and off, things like that but there was never an electrical problem in the house. Then the nightmares started. Every night for weeks, I would have a nightmare about a skinwalker or moving to a new house and it being haunted with demons or losing somebody that I love. The dreams don't sound that bad, but trust me, they were terrifying. One of the skinwalker ones was so bad that I didn't sleep for days because quite frankly, I was too afraid to. I've never had nightmares like this before. And then the sleep paralysis started. It's always a girl or a monster that stands in the corner and gets closer every time I blink until it's right on top of me, choking me, and then I snap out of it. It's terrifying, and now every time I'm by myself in the darkness, 
I have this heavy feeling of being watched. It's so bad that it gives me immediate anxiety. I hear things calling my name out of my window and it smells like rotting meat. Things scratch the side of the house. It's awful. I can never fall asleep because I'm afraid of what's in store for me when I do. And it's always the same demon in the dreams. Sometimes when I wake up, I see it and it fades into the darkness. Once in my nightmare, it whispered into my ear and said, I will follow you throughout your life. If you look into the darkest corner of your room, you will always see me staring back at you. Someone please help me with what this is. No one will listen, and I think I'm losing my mind. I know what you're going to think, but I really need you to hear me out. I firmly believe in the existence of aliens, but I'm also very skeptical of evidence that's presented. But after what happened to me, I don't know what to believe. So a couple of years ago, I had picked up my sister from her school dance, and we were on the drive home. The road we took to get home had no streetlights and about three homes along the side of it. This road was in the middle of wine country. It was about 9 p.m. in the winter, so the sun had gone down a while past and the road was pitch black. The road was hilly, so when you reached at the top of one of the hills, you could see all the way down the road. There were no other cars on the road. As I was driving, some kind of machine or craft went by about 30 feet in front of my car from the left side of the road to the right. The speed is not something I can be 100% sure of, but I know that it was going by fast enough that I couldn't make out its shape. All I could see was that it had what appeared to be headlights on all sides, no brake lights in the back. It had to be about six to eight feet long, but again, it went by so fast that I cannot be positive on that number. At first I dismissed it as some kid riding around on a dirt bike or an ATV. On the right side of the road was a huge field, so I figured that once I got to where it had gone by I would have been able to see whatever it was in the field. I reached where the craft had gone, but there was nothing. I drove around a bend where you could see the whole field, and there was nothing to be seen. I was and am so confused about what I saw that night. I mean, maybe it could have been somebody on a bike or a cart, but I've never seen any man-made vehicle that has white headlights on all sides, that moves that fast, and that can disappear in moments. About two years ago, I had a dream where my friend and I, I'll call him John, were at an old abandoned barn seemingly in the middle of nowhere. We were on the outside of the barn just talking when dusk started to set in. So I told John that I had to be going or I would be late. I started down the path that led around the barn to wherever I knew I had to be going. I remember it just being a simple dirt path with a simple wooden fence running along the left-hand side of it, leading into a wood line about 100 to 200 yards away. As I turned the path around the barn, I looked up and noticed a humanoid figure in the middle of the path, about 20 yards away. Naturally, I was startled, so I turned to John. For some reason, he'd been following me, and I hadn't questioned it, to ask if he saw it too, but he was gone. I turned back and the figure stood in the same spot. For some reason I continued along until I got about 5 to 10 feet from it and was able to suddenly make out its features. The moment I looked upon the figure close up, I recognized it immediately as death or the grim reaper as traditionally pictured. But it was unlike any iteration I'd ever seen or have seen since. It had your typical dark hooded robe, 
but its skull-like face shimmered like an emerald in the sunlight with two small red orbs in its eye sockets. The part that I remembered disturbing me the most was his friendly smile that stretched from ear to ear. His mouth and teeth were like a bottomless pit of darkness, and his teeth resembled that of a shark. The part that I think really caught me off guard was when he spoke. He had what I remember being a surprisingly normal voice. It was actually fairly pleasant to listen to. His words are the main thing that still puzzle me, because I feel like there's some meaning to them. After making eye contact and smiling, he told me, you're a day late for judgment. And that's when I woke up. It's the only dream in my life that I remembered that vividly when I awoke, and the only dream or thought that I've ever been compelled to write down. I still carry that page folded up in my wallet. Does anyone have any theories as to what this might mean, if anything? I told my friend who was in the dream, and he thinks it's connected to the time when I was about 14. I drowned in the reservoir, but I was pulled back out by my brother, and I came back. The last thing I remember from drowning was letting go, and a peace overcoming me before I blacked out. Then, nothingness before I awoke on the boat with my brother over me. My brother estimated I'd been underwater for at least a few minutes before he managed to get to me. Maybe I was supposed to have died then and didn't. Maybe that's why I'm late for judgment. Whatever the reason, I'm very interested to hear what anybody else might think. So, I'm not really sure how to explain what has happened in my apartment recently, but I will give it a shot. So my girlfriend and I moved into our first floor, two bedroom apartment in February. One of the bedrooms seemed to have an odor that irritated my girlfriend and her mom's cat allergies. We just assumed that the previous tenant had a cat, even though they said they didn't. Anyway, the landlord had a professional carpet cleaning company come and clean the room, but the odor remained, just not as prominent. Usually, we just kept that door closed. I work from 1 p.m. to 1 a.m., so I'm not home until usually 2 a.m. My girlfriend started telling me that she would hear people in the kitchen during the night. You can't hear any of our neighbors talk, even during the day. I mostly just brushed it off, until one night when I woke up at 4 a.m. for no reason. I heard a deep voice right behind me say, Hey there and that was just the start. A few weeks later when I got home at 2 a.m., I was in the bathroom getting ready for bed. I was facing the door of the bathroom, looking out into the apartment, but I had my head turned looking at my back in the mirror. I saw what I thought was my girlfriend walk out of the room and go to the kitchen. It spooked me, and I looked out and didn't see anybody in the apartment. I checked our room, and my girlfriend was still in bed. The next morning, my girlfriend woke me up and asked if I had knocked her lunchbox off the refrigerator when I got home. I told her that I hadn't, but it was on the floor when I got home. It wasn't even on the edge when I put my ice pack back in the freezer. She also asked if I had gone into the other bedroom when I got home, because the door was slightly ajar, and I told her no. So we still aren't sure what's been happening in our apartment. It seems to only happen in waves because nothing of note has happened in a week or two. So this happened roughly six years ago in Pennsylvania, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I was working for Burger King at the time, and I had just gotten off the night shift at roughly midnight. I was driving home, and I saw a light that was about 50 feet off the ground. It had an orangish glow like a street light. I could see it very clearly. The night sky was clear, and there was no fog at all. I thought it was just a new street light that had gotten put up, 
I just kept staring at it. Out of nowhere, this thing shot straight up in the air and just vanished. It gave me chills and made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Ever since that day, I've always looked to the sky on my drives home from the job that I have now. I don't know if it was extraterrestrial or what, but it was something. So this story happened about 20 years ago. You know, before cell phones and fast internet. When I was little, my family used to make a really big deal about Christmas. They made it a goal every year to go and see as many of our relatives as possible. I have six uncles, two aunts, and a crap load of cousins, and that's just on one side of the family. Because of how many people we had and the fact that everyone's Christmas plans with their other family members were all at different times, we used to celebrate Christmas with this side of the family at around 10 p.m. on Christmas Day. We would all hang out until well after midnight and this was all at my grandma's house. My grandma's house is way out in the country. My grandpa was the pastor of a Baptist church that was conveniently located about 100 yards in front of their house. Religion was always a big deal, and we would always have church service first, and then presents. So this one Christmas, we were nearing the end of church service, and one of our elderly cousins, who was always there and spent the whole day and night with my grandparents every year, hadn't shown up. Let's call her Betty. Everyone was getting really worried about her. I was 10 at the time, but I could still see the worry in their faces, even though they tried to ease us kids. There was no answer at her house, and like I said, cell phones weren't really a thing back then. Also, to get to this tiny little town, you had to take this long, dark, curvy road way out into the woods, and we knew her eyesight was getting bad. Betty finally shows up, and as she pulls in, we all sigh in relief. But when she gets out of the car, she's white as a ghost. Everyone was trying to figure out what was wrong, but I think she was in shock because she wouldn't talk to anyone. Finally, after some time of resting, she told us that on the way there, it had been raining and a man was hitchhiking along this dark stretch of road. After nearly hitting him, she decided to have the Christmas spirit and pick him up against her better judgment because it just wasn't safe for him to be there. She made him sit in the back because she wasn't completely comfortable with the situation. And as she was driving along, she started talking to him you know, just pleasantries, and the man wouldn't talk back. Finally, trying to figure out what was wrong, she looked into the back seat at the man, and his face was changing colors, and his appearance was scary, as she put it. When he finally spoke to her, he said in a very loud voice, Gabriel's horn is to his mouth, and then he completely vanished from the back seat. Now, when it comes to the paranormal, I'm usually a skeptic, but this one makes my stomach turn because of the type of person Betty was. She was a God-fearing woman who was elderly and definitely not the type of person to lie in any fashion. She also wasn't really the joking or prankster type. So it being well thought out and some kind of elaborate prank is out of the question. To this day, it still gives me chills. During my childhood, I used to live in the city of Patna, Bihar. We used to live in a joint family. Back in 2006, my cousin's sister, I'll call her S, had relocated to Bangalore to attend her engineering college. S was always cheerful, respectful, and courteous. None of us could ever have imagined what was about to happen to her. One day, the doorbell rang and I went to open the door. When I opened it, I saw that S was standing there with a solemn look on her face. Our family ushered her in and asked her about her trip home, about 1,500 kilometers. She said that she had no recollection of the trip. 
We later found out that she had taken a flight home, although she claimed to have no idea she had done so. The next six months are as easy to recount as they were painful to live through. S started exhibiting signs of depression, although some in the family felt that there was something more sinister going on. She wouldn't talk to anyone. She wouldn't eat properly. At times, she would start burning up with a fever and scream for it to stop. At night, she would start laughing maniacally or sometimes wail and tear her hair out. If someone tried to console her, she'd outpour a filthy barrage of abuses in this gruff, animalistic voice. Since my other sister is a psychiatrist, she promptly diagnosed her with depression stemming from low self-esteem while in college and started a course of medication. The medication was administered to her regularly for six months, but her condition never improved. My maternal aunt and uncle had reached a breaking point and they decided to seek the help of a master tantric, an occult practitioner, and honestly, they would have done just about anything to get their daughter back. The tantric in question was supposed to be extremely clairvoyant and adept at the occult sciences. When he entered our home, S began to scream and wail at the mere sight of him. The tantric just stared at her for a while and then told us he would be going home to perform the exorcism ritual and we should ensure that S didn't leave the house during that time. After exactly three hours, S again started to scream, although this time she tried to run out of the house. It took four or five of the biggest guys in our family to pin her down to the bed so she wouldn't run out. She still tried jumping out of the window. Her screaming brought the entire neighborhood out who gathered around the house to watch the spectacle. After about an hour, she fell completely silent and slept like a baby for six hours. When she woke up, she calmly asked us what she was doing in her home and why she wasn't at the college hostel where she was supposed to be. She had turned completely normal, except that she had no memory of the last six months. My maternal uncle and aunt met the tantric and asked him what had happened to their daughter. The tantric nonchalantly replied that somebody had put a lower class of Muslim spirit called a jinn on her. He said that the spirit was induced inside her through first attaching the spirit to a hair, which was then mixed in biryani, a traditional Muslim rice dish, and fed to her. He also told them he knew the identity of the person who did it, but he wasn't allowed to reveal it to them. My uncle then went home and carefully asked S about the last thing she remembered from college without giving her any information about what the tantric had said. She told them that she had this Muslim friend who was in love with her and had proposed to her a few months ago. She wasn't interested in him and politely refused his advances. The guy begged her to remain friends, and she agreed. She said her very last memory was the day of Aid when the Muslim guy had invited her for lunch and served her biryani. She couldn't recollect anything after that. My aunt refused to let her go back to college after that, she continued her education in a local college and later moved to the U.S. and is living a normal life. We do avoid any mention of what happened to her, though. Sometimes it triggers pretty bad memories. The Fairbanks, Alaska area has an older cemetery, Clay Street, that I was drawn to for a while when I was 18. A boyfriend of the time had family buried there, and we visited to keep the graves clean. Me being the edgelord I was, I took a picture on one of the gravestones. It was the grave of a little girl, and it stuck with me, so I made peace with her by leaving a cute little picture. I often have dreams of this ex-boyfriend and that I'm pregnant with a little girl, not pregnant by him now, just a dream. There are a lot of areas in Fairbanks that give me a nope vibe. The gold dredge out by the Chatney Lodge, that always gives me a bad vibe and is said to be haunted. I spent a lot of my childhood in Valdez and we would always go hang out at the old Pioneer or Chinese cemetery out by Robe River. Old Town Valdez, the OG Valdez that had to be destroyed because of the 64 earthquake, 
has a weird vibe too. Valdez often has reports of UFO sightings. I believe I've seen one too. There are satellites that monitor the pipeline, but you can detect the pattern and know what they look like. Unless the pattern and lights changed for a few minutes for some reason on the satellite and then it was definitely a UFO. There have been reports of alien abductions in the Nome area. One day I innocently wore my alien shirt out there and I had to change. Apparently they get a lot of alien hunt tourism and it's not welcomed. In this area, there's really nowhere for people to go unless they fly out. People chalk up random disappearances here as people just getting drunk and falling into the ocean or getting eaten by wildlife. Considering the culture there, that is likely the explanation, but still. One of the dorms at UAF had a student there who was murdered with no witnesses, and the case has been cold for nearly 30 years. They never remodeled the bathroom she was found in. One day I had this weird urge to sit in the tub there, so a friend of mine went and did that. It felt surreal to just sit in an empty tub in this bathroom. We were both overcome with this overwhelming sadness, likely due to us sitting there in this tragic bathtub. All I know is the Fairbanks area is really weird, and so are a lot of areas out there. Who knows what any of it means. One time, my mom and I were going out for lunch. We have two dogs, one that's 100 pounds and another that's 50 pounds, so they aren't small. My mom told me to let them outside before we left. They were gonna stay out there and play, use the bathroom and all that while we were gone, so I did. An hour later, we get back and our dogs are not outside. Okay, I thought maybe I didn't let them out even though I know I did. We check the house, which is one story and about a thousand square feet, so not huge. Nothing. Well, maybe they are outside and they just aren't coming to us. There are plenty of hiding spots in our backyard, with two sheds, a lot of trees, and a sectioned off area that we call the squirrel yard. We once had a pet squirrel, but that's another story. The dogs can't get into the squirrel yard, so I go outside, searching everywhere for them. Nothing. Well, now we're considering the fact that somehow our dogs got out. So we check the perimeter of our yard. We have a six-foot privacy fence, so our dogs cannot jump it. But they have been known to dig holes under it. Here's the thing. No holes. None. Absolutely no way that they could have squeezed under that fence. So now we're thinking somebody stole our dogs. Our 100 pound dog looks like a pit bull mix, so it would make sense that they would get stolen because of dog fights and stuff like that. And maybe they took the 50 pound one for similar reasons. But the thing is, they would have had to climb the privacy fence because the fence is padlocked and the locks were still in place. And even if they did that, how would they get these dogs over the fence? The short answer, nobody could do that. So we nixed that idea and turned to checking our house locks. Maybe they came inside. Nah, everything was locked, even the windows. Well, maybe the dogs are inside and they're hiding. We checked everywhere, under the beds, in the closets, even in rooms that were closed off. Nothing. I go back outside and I end up taking the grate off from our access point to the crawl space. I crawl around under the house they aren't there. Our last bet is to go search the neighborhood, and even though there is logically no way that they could have gotten out, we still go. We leave the house, all the doors locked per usual, and we begin searching. Nothing. An hour later, we come home, dejected, planning our next move. I'm about to go into the crawl space again when I hear my mom shouting for me. There, Laying in their beds, sound asleep, were our dogs. No one else has keys to our house. No locks were broken. All windows were shut and locked. 
There's no logical way for our dogs to have left our property and suddenly reappear. And they were totally fine. One of them is scared of everything, so it would have made sense for him to be freaking out if something had happened, but nope. This took place over the course of three hours, from the time we got home to when they magically reappeared. We still can't figure out how our dogs just disappeared, where they went, or how they got back. I don't know if it's some glitch in the matrix or what, but we were pretty freaked out. My paranormal experiences started really early on. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12, and I was just seven. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but here are some of the shorter ones. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person crawling on all fours with dislocated joints, coming down the hallway and wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name thinking that it was me trying to scare her. When she saw that I poked my head out of the day room, which was added on to our trailer, her face lost color. She realized it couldn't have been me. She had me go into my room and dig out a Halloween mask that was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said the figure was wearing it, and she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit. When she looked at him closer, she could see that his skin was pale and that it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. One time when I was doing this, my dog started to whimper. Before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male voice breathe heavily in my ear. My dog proceeded to freak out and bark. These are the shorter stories that I have, but my entire life has basically been haunted. Moral of the story, don't mess around with Ouija boards. I'm fairly skeptical of the paranormal, so I don't really know what to believe. But the only stories that are even a little similar to what I experienced all seem to be paranormal. To give some backstory, my street and neighborhood are pretty quiet, especially at night due to the number of young families and elderly couples that live on my street, which makes staying up into the early hours of the morning more relaxing and also a bit cooler, knowing that I'm most likely the only person on my street that's awake. The only thing is that I've had some creepy experiences like hearing noises or even seeing a few drug deals, but most of that can be chalked up to living next to a big forest with lots of wildlife or just some sketchy neighbors. But for the past week, I've been trying to find a logical explanation for the strange events that keep occurring. It started at 2 a.m. last Tuesday morning. I was just sitting in my bed on my phone with earbuds in, something I do almost every night when I began to hear whistling coming from out my window. I took my earbuds out and began listening to the whistle, trying to come up with an explanation. Normally I'm not scared by anything in my neighborhood this late, and to be honest I get more excited that something's happening and that I'm there to witness it. But this time felt different. I wanted so badly to get up, to look out my window, but I was almost paralyzed with fear. I don't know what came over me, but every minute that went by of this whistling, I felt the pit in my stomach growing larger. It went on for almost an hour, 
and for the entire hour I waited for the whistling to start a tune or a song I could look up, but it just kept whistling the same note in a strange pattern. It would whistle one note for a good minute, then take a break for about 30 seconds, and then return to its one minute whistle. Until about 20 minutes in, when the whistles got shorter and closer together, only to return to the original pattern after about 10 minutes. What was even stranger was that whatever it was, was pacing in front of mine and my neighbor's house up until it stopped when it retreated back down the other side of the street. As I heard it leave, I almost immediately felt the pit in my stomach subside, and while I was still confused, I decided I should just go to sleep before I scared myself even more. So the next day, I asked my parents and even some of my friends that live close by if they had ever heard anything like that. Everyone assumed it was some kind of animal, which made me feel a lot better. But I wanted a definite answer of what I heard. I stayed up for hours that night, researching types of animals that were local to my area and the noises they made. I didn't find anything that matched. This only left me more frustrated that I had no clue what it was. So I continued staying up in hopes that I would hear it again, and that this time I would look out my window to see it. But with my luck, I've never heard the whistling again. Except, lots of weird things have been happening. After the whistle, I began hearing somebody, or something, walking around in mine and my neighbor's driveways and sometimes even yards, very late at night. But whenever I go to check, I can't see anything. Then about two nights ago, I swear I saw a figure of a person lurking behind my neighbor's car. And then the night after that, I saw what looked like a flashlight in the woods near my house. And whatever was holding that flashlight was running out of the woods. Then again last night, I swear I saw a person crouching near my neighbor's car, just looking around. I thought I was done researching because I couldn't find anything about animals, but now I've begun researching any stories even similar to mine, hoping that either I'm not alone, or even better, somebody has the answer to the strange occurrences going on. Because I would like to start sleeping at more normal times again, and not have to be worried about either a stalker or a poltergeist or something else, coming to get me in my sleep. I ride my bicycle at night. To me, there is nothing more freeing than the sensation that I have the world to myself and I can explore and adventure as I please. Last night, I was biking through the neighborhood of my childhood and teenage years. I was in a mood for a bit of nostalgic melancholy, I suppose. There's a road where the development ends that I called the Creepy Wood Street when I was a kid. One side has houses, the other is a train track topped hill. The name came from before the area was expanded, and it was a dirt track cutting through the woods. So I was on the former creepy woods area when I noticed something felt off. I felt a presence, and I can only say it felt like rot. It's hard to articulate it precisely. Around the time that I became aware of this presence, I became aware of something else. Silence. The crickets had stopped their chorus, and the air seemed to keep moving, but the rustle of the trees and bushes were somehow muted. Strangely, there was a sensation that these were faded out, rather than an immediate cessation. About this time, I began to feel hunted. I guess fight or flight told me in no uncertain terms that flight was the answer and I began to pedal like a maniac. I had the notion to not look back. I'm not sure why, but I didn't question it. When I got off the road, I felt a little bit better, but I still felt watched. 
It was then that I heard what a lot of folks would think is a blood-curdling scream, but I recognized it as a vixen's call. We have a ton of foxes in my area. I somehow felt drawn to it, and sure enough, as I turned off toward it, I saw her. A red vixen. This was a little unique, as I have only seen brown ones before. She regarded me a moment, and then ran off toward the creepy wood street. I didn't think a lot of it, until I saw a fox at the next turn who did the same, then again at the next intersection, which was the road leading out of the neighborhood. Granted I knew the way out, but I felt like I was being guided by them somehow, protected. All of them also dashed off after looking at me a moment, all toward the road where I felt like something was after me. I'm so curious to know what anybody else thinks. I'd like to know if anybody has any idea what the thing after me was, and why the foxes seemed to show me a safe path. It was a really cool experience, whatever it was. Growing up, I had a ton of weird experiences, but I think this is one of the hardest to explain. It happened when I was about three years old. For context, my mom fell pregnant with me a month after her aunt died in a fatal car crash. When I was born, I would often react to things that nobody else could see, usually with laughter or cute baby noises. Eventually, as I grew older, I had an imaginary friend. When I was asked what she looked like or what her personality was like, apparently I described my mom's aunt exactly. Anyway, back to the story. I'm a small child and can't talk properly yet. I'm walking to see my grandma with my mom, which was about 10 to 15 minutes away. We're walking down a small, quiet residential road that has a junction at the end and probably about 30 yards away from the junction. As we start to approach the end of the road, my body language changed and I started to panic. I grabbed onto my mom with both hands and started screaming, no mommy, no. My mom looked ahead and saw nothing, just a quiet residential street. She tried to calm me down, but with all my might, I held onto her and tried to physically prevent her from walking any farther. I just kept shouting, no mommy, no. She started to get frustrated as this went on for about two minutes. All of a sudden, there was a huge crash. My mom looked up and at the end of the road, a car had completely lost control, gone over the side of the road, and crashed into a front garden wall, exactly where we would have been walking if I hadn't made a fuss. Still to this day, we can't explain it. It was so out of character for me to have done something like that and I could honestly only speak a few words. It surely would have killed me, and probably my mom too. I literally owe my life to whatever it was that saved us that day. Since then, I occasionally have premonition dreams that turn out to be true, or I can wake with a sense that a friend I haven't seen for a while is upset. It isn't as often as I'd like it to be, and I'm still never 100% sure if it's coincidence or if I'm onto something. Any advice would be appreciated. This happened in Daytona Beach, Florida in 2012. It was the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in high school. A little background. My grandparents lived in Florida at the time, close-ish to Daytona, but not in Daytona. We decided to take a vacation within a vacation and spend a weekend at a hotel in Daytona. When we got there, for whatever reason, my grandparents decided that they didn't want to stay and that they would come pick up my mom and I at the end of the weekend since they only lived about an hour away. My mom and I asked them to please drop us off at Joe's Crab Shack for dinner and said we would walk back to our hotel. 
Somehow, we completely misjudged how far away the restaurant was from our hotel, so it ended up being this insanely long walk. We were expecting it to be about two to three miles, but it ended up being more like six or seven. On the way back to the hotel, it got dark on us. There was enough light from the street to be able to see pretty decently, but to get up to the street, we would have to go through an alleyway, and we just didn't feel comfortable with that. So we decided to stay on the beach. Now, I want to say, even though it was dark, there was a full moon and enough light from the street that whenever we passed a person, we could clearly make out their face if we were close enough. So while the dark may have played a small factor in this, I don't think it was enough of a factor to make me just dismiss the experience. So as we're walking, we see a light headed toward us about six-ish feet off the ground. We weren't too concerned because it looked like somebody going the opposite direction as us wearing a headlamp, maybe taking a nighttime stroll on the beach. As the light got closer, we noticed that it was extremely steady, not like somebody walking, and especially not like somebody walking on sand. As it got close to us, this is what we saw. A cloaked figure wearing a brown monk-like cloak with a large hood. It was not walking, but just gliding along. In fact, there were no visible feet. There was a light shining out from under the hood of the cloak, but there was no face. Except for the light, it appeared to be completely black inside, almost like an empty cloak floating through the air without a person inside it. It didn't seem to notice us and just glided on past. My mom and I remember this event exactly the same way. I'm a very scientific person, but I still can't really explain this, as it was definitely light enough that we should have seen a face and feet, but we didn't. Has anybody else come across something like this? What do you think it was? At the end of August 2016, I had open heart surgery, and while I was under, I had no heartbeat function for nine hours. I had an experience that felt like I went to the other side. I don't know what to call it, but this is what I saw. As a note, there was no fear. I was not afraid at all. I became aware that I was somewhere. I was holding on to, with my right hand, what felt like a piece of cloth. I felt like I was standing on a rock in space, like the dirt or soil or sand under my feet was gray and appeared like what you would see on the moon. To my left was utter pitch black darkness. Directly in front of me, I was holding on to with my right hand what felt like a piece of cloth, like I said, and this cloth was on a much larger thing or being in front of that which obscured my vision. I had to see or look around this being. It looked as though there was a cave or something. It was very dark in that cave and very gray where I was. Out of the cave of the darkness came what I can only describe as a worm-like figure as big as I was. It had a purple face and no facial features, just gaseous purple stuff. And it came right towards me, hard and fast. As it got close, it was repelled from me and made a squealing noise and scampered back into the darkness. Another one came out of the darkness and came toward me also. It reflected from what seemed to be some sort of force field around me. It also made a displeased sound and then ran back into the darkness, leaving behind the purple gaseous trailers, like tracers. I don't even know how else to describe them. I realize that the thing I'm holding on to is sort of like a Grim Reaper, for lack of a better description, but it wasn't a Grim Reaper. It was different. But it was clothed in the black cloth-like material that I was holding on to with my right hand. Then another really, really big worm came out of the darkness, and this thing just charged at me like a horse at full speed. I braced for impact. I wasn't afraid, I just braced for the impact I thought was coming. It screamed out as though it felt pain when it got close to touching me. It never actually touched me, it just got really, really close. 
It too left behind a purple trail as it scampered back into the dark cave that was ahead of this, I guess what we'll call a gatekeeper instead of the Grim Reaper. I looked to my left and there's nothing, just a void of darkness. But up and over to my right, I see a cluster of stars or lights. There were pink and blue with yellow and it looked so inviting. I felt like that's where I wanted to go. I felt my feet lift up off of the thing I was standing on, and it's as though my feet just came up off the ground. My body tilted and I began to turn toward that light or cluster of lights. I'm still holding onto the cloth and I can't seem to let go. And as I pretty much decided that I didn't want to come back here anymore, I was happy being where I was or wherever I was getting ready to go. The gatekeeper thing I was holding onto looked down at me and very condescendingly said, not today, not your day. At that point, I woke up in the ICU and I was intubated. You're not supposed to wake up intubated, I was told. I was on a fentanyl and morphine drip, so I would not wake up. But once I was awake, I couldn't fall back asleep. I stayed like that, conscious, for 25 hours until they finally decided to use propofol to put me back into a coma-like thing. They left me there for 30 hours. When I woke up, I was ready to start pulling tubes out. I recovered really quickly and life is great and it's been nothing but a journey since then. I guess it was a near-death experience or something weird. I don't really know what it was, but it was interesting and I thought I'd share. My girlfriend and I moved to a new apartment about six months ago. From the first night we moved in, I noticed weird things out of the corner of my eye. I see what looks like dark, static figures in our hallway and bathroom. Sometimes the figures move, but they mostly look like they're just standing still. I never see them fully, only out of the corner of my eye. When I turn to look, they vanish. We have a cat and dog who have both acted strangely when it comes to the bathroom. My dog demands to be with me, and if I do not let him, he freaks out, which is something he's never done. Also, our cat will sit in the dark bathroom for hours, also something that is a new behavior. There have also been many times where my dog will start growling or barking at the hall or bathroom. Whatever it is, it usually doesn't do anything physical except for one time. I had a migraine, so I was sitting in a hot shower with the lights off. Suddenly the cabinet door under the sink opened and slammed shut. When I looked at it, expecting to find the cat or dog, there was nothing. I was alone. That was several months ago, and it's the only time something physical has ever happened. I told my girlfriend about it, and she agreed the apartment has a weird vibe, but she hasn't seen the figures. I'm just curious if anyone else has experienced this. I feel like the stress is just maybe making me crazy or something. Maybe not. My stepdad was always a dry man. His humor was always what you would expect from someone born in the 1940s. He was devout in his faith as a Christian and hated superstition. It intrigued me then. In 2006, he confessed, and I say confess, because he tells his story in a tone that didn't really fit the mood of the night that he told us. We were all just eating dinner, talking about the Patriots football game. And that's when he tells me of a time that he took the train from Chicago to southern Wisconsin that stops in Kenosha. He was on the near-empty train, by himself, when he looks out the window and sees a frozen pond, very small, about ten feet from the train. He sees about a dozen small men in green outfits. Some have top hats. Some have pointed hats of red and gold. He was shocked. It was a traditional Midwest winter, lightly snowing. 
He was so shocked that he shared the experience with a random woman who was sitting across from him. She noticed it too, and the both of them watched in fascination and horror. They said that they were scared, that their train cart was so empty that nobody else seemed to notice. The train began to move, and they moved on. As a teenager, you can imagine my brothers and I asking many questions. In my rational mind, I thought perhaps it was an issue of scale. Maybe it appeared that they were short little men, but he said that it was so close to the train, and the pond was so small, that there was no issue in scale or perspective. He says that he knows he saw little gnomish men ice skating and doing acrobatics on a small little pond in the middle of winter. It's interesting because now that I'm nearly 30, my husband told me a story recently about when he was 19. He was playing Game Boy at 9 p.m. in bed, and a little man with a pointy hand was at the foot of his bed. And when he noticed him, the little man ran under the covers and disappeared. The following case was narrated during a famous radio program called La Mano Peluda, The Hairy Hand, around 2001. A civil engineer, who wishes to remain anonymous, shares his story. This happened in Tepotzitlan, Mexico City. When I was studying, I met my wife at Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, where she studied medicine. When we got married, my father-in-law gave me a piece of land in Tepotzitlan, where we decided to build a house. Little by little, we were building the home, and when it was finished, we decided to have a celebration with friends and family. The party transcended without eventualities. However, when everyone had retired, at dawn we heard strange noises inside the house, like laments, dragging chains, strong blows, etc. This worried my wife a lot, and as a strong believer, she prayed for protection. I used to be kind of skeptical of these things, and I didn't give it any importance, always trying to find a logical explanation. On one occasion, I went to work, and my wife called me on my cell phone, asking me about a pair of mining boots that she found near the basement. I usually wear this type of footwear due to my work in construction, but it seemed strange to me since I only had one pair and I was wearing them at work at the time she called. Upon arriving to the house, I found my wife somewhat worried and when looking for these boots, I found them just at the entrance to the basement over a puddle of water. None of this had a reason to exist since the boots were not mine and there was no water leak that could justify the large puddle that was there. At first I thought they were from one of my subordinates and that he had possibly forgotten them there, but looking at them carefully, they were not the type of boots or brand that we usually use, so not knowing who they belonged to, I threw them away. After that day, the wailing and the noises became louder and louder until the point that I got used to them. However, my wife spent terrible, horrified nights praying. For this reason, I decided to buy a firearm a 45 pistol, for anything that came along. On one occasion, we went to my nephew's christening and returned to the house late at night. But since we were already tired, we went to bed to go to sleep. The main bedroom is located on the second floor, and to get there, there's a wooden staircase that creaks when you step. In the early morning, the creaking woke me up, and I got very nervous. Then the creaking stopped. I prepared my weapon, thinking that it was a thief, and suddenly, someone started punching on the door as if it wanted to break it down, giving me the impression that this intruder had enormous strength. At this point, my wife woke up abruptly, and I, with weapon in hand, instructed her to lock it as soon as I left to confront the stranger. I opened the door suddenly, and clearly saw a man descending the stairs in a hurry when he saw that I was armed. I emptied the gun, hitting him more than five times in the back, and I watched him roll down the stairs. 
Call the police, I yelled to my wife. Then I ran to turn on the stair light. But to my surprise, there was no one. Instead, what sat there on the stairs were those boots that I had thrown away months ago, but this time over a pool of blood. My wife was so scared that she called a priest to bless the house. I personally set the boots on fire until they turned to ash in front of me. For some time, things seemed to be normal, so much so that we decided to have children. And to make my wife feel calmer, we took one of her uncles into the home. Her uncle was an old man who, due to an accident at work, had been disabled, but his company made her feel good. Everything was going along well, so I dared to work out of state without concern. More than three months had passed since the last incident. It was already dark when I returned home after a work trip. My assistant and another trusted employee were with me. Upon arriving at the house, I was surprised to find the lights off. At first I thought they had just gone out, but I listened to the television and it was on. I moved over to the living room to see what was happening. I found my wife's uncle out of his chair. He was dead and immediately I was alarmed. I began to scream for my wife. I finally found her hidden to one side of the dining room sitting in a large pool of blood, sobbing uncontrollably. Thinking someone had hurt her, I called emergency services. The paramedics immediately took my wife away, confirming that she was fine, but that she had lost her baby. Upon checking the uncle, they just confirmed his death. They said that it was due to cardiac arrest, but his face reflected absolute terror. Had it not been for my assistant and the other worker accompanying me and serving as witness, the police probably would have accused me of harming my wife and killing her uncle, as they found nothing that suggested the entry was forced. There was no evidence of a stranger in our home. My wife spent three weeks in intensive care until she finally began to show improvement. When she woke up, due to the trauma, she had lost her memory. She doesn't even remember me. I have taken her to psychiatrists, even with hypnosis, we've tried to make her remember. But as soon as she begins to relive what happened, she becomes completely hysterical. She'll just say, here it comes, here comes the one who will harm us, take care of him. We've never been able to find out who he is, what he is, or what he wants. Due to the state of her health, I was forced to confine her to a psychiatric hospital in Guadalajara City. I visit whenever possible, although she doesn't remember me. She believes that I am a friend. After everything was over, I returned to the house, and the first thing I saw when I opened the door were those damn boots in a pool of blood next to the basement. Since then, I haven't returned to the house, which is, to date, uninhabited, as it has been completely impossible for me to sell it. Last night, I had a very disturbing dream. I was driving the car with my wife riding shotgun. My kid was in the back seat. When we reached a sharp curve, I saw the headlights of a large vehicle coming down the wrong side. Turns out it was a bus. I tried to swing my car away from the oncoming bus, but I got hit on the side. We went skidding across the road and I could see the face of my terrified wife and my son flying in the back seat. Then I woke up and I had to calm myself down before I could go back to sleep. Just a dream, right? Well, this morning during breakfast, I turned the pages of the local daily over. Then I saw it. There was a story of a family that had gotten killed the night before in an accident when their car was sideswiped by a bus. The freakiest part though, is that the car is the same make of mine. The bus is from the same company as the one in my dream, and the location where they got hit was where I was in my dream as well. Am I just trying to fit things into my dream narrative, or is there something to this? I'm really freaked out.
This happened 14 years ago, and it happened while I was pregnant with my first, when my grandmother, who I was very close to, was dying. Anyway, my ex-husband was on the computer until he heard me screaming and yelling in my sleep. He came to wake me up and calm me down, so I did. He went to go to the bathroom, and while he was washing his hands, he saw in the mirror, which was facing our bed, a girl standing over me, looking at me. I was screaming in my sleep again. He said it was a shadow, and then he saw her walk away and disappear. He couldn't find her and thought it was bizarre, but he didn't feel that it was evil. A few months later, he saw her doing the same thing, only this time, I was sleeping peacefully. I had my baby and my grandmother had already passed away. We had a nightlight in our bedroom so that I could see my way around when getting up to feed the baby. He said that he could see her face more clearly due to the nightlight, but couldn't see who it was. She didn't look at him. She was just staring directly at me while I slept. And then she turned and walked away and disappeared. That was the last time that he saw it happen. What could that be? It's kind of creepy to hear that some girl is just standing by my bed looking at me while I sleep, even if he doesn't think it's evil. It still boggles my mind to this day. The house we had was brand new and we had built it only a year prior, so we have no idea where a spirit would have come from. I work as a visual artist for the topmost financial company in India. I met this lady in the cafeteria who I was introduced to by another friend of mine. And as I got closer to her, she told me about her paranormal experiences that were so bad they made her want to commit suicide. This is not my experience, but her and her families. They are Muslims and a family of four. Three months before I met her, her father had passed away, so it was just the four of them. The mother and the two sons who are in school, and she being the eldest sibling. After her father had passed away, they had leased a massive house for one to two years, maybe more, I don't remember, with four bedrooms, spacious halls, and two floors. It was a really big house that was leased for a very reasonable amount. The thought that the kids would have so much space and fun in a big house like that was really endearing to her. So as soon as they start living there, a lot of strange occurrences took place right from the beginning. They heard screams, like really loud screams that scared everybody. They could hear footsteps and banging from the first floor. None of them had a clue what was going on. All of them were scared and panicked, and they never left each other. They slept in the halls together and they never used any of the rooms. She told me that one night while the boys were sleeping in the hall next to her, one got up screaming in the night. When they checked on him, half of his hair on one side of his head was gone, just half bald out of nowhere. Their kids started to suffer from panic attacks and that was just the beginning. One experience that her mother went through made them decide to leave right away. While the kids were gone to school and my friend was at work, the mother was alone at home, cooking in the kitchen. She was just going about her day, and then all of a sudden she could hear somebody crying. She's confused and calls out to her daughter, thinking that she'd come home early from work, but she got no response. She goes back into the hall to check, and nobody's there. She goes back to the kitchen and continues cooking, when all of a sudden the sound of somebody crying becomes even louder. She sees something from the corner of her eye, on the ceiling, and notices that there is a lady sitting upside down on the roof, crying. The mother couldn't take it. She panicked and ran. She ran to her neighbor's house, which was quite far, and called her daughter. When she told them this, they all asked questions. The mother and daughter decided to go talk to the owner and tell him that they didn't want to live in that place anymore. The problem is, once you lease, you can't take back your security deposit until it's served its term, based on the contract. 
so they couldn't even move out because they would need more money to rent a different place. When they met the owner, he told them that he used to live in that house with his wife. She had committed side in that house on the top floor. Since then, he's been seeing her and hearing her walk around the house. So he doesn't want to live there anymore, but he never told anybody about it because he thought it would be bad for business. This family literally had no choice but to live there until they made enough money to move out and it was hell. They've gone through so many messed up experiences, many that they don't even talk about. They even got a dog, which their neighbors advised, and the dog won't even go inside. He lives outside. They even called a Baba from the mosque to bless the house, but they still suffer and they still see the lady in the house. Nothing ever really worked out there. And three months after they started suffering, the mother died and the three of them moved out to a smaller home. That house has just been left abandoned since then. And I think that's probably for the best. We moved into our first home in February of 2016. It was an old home built in the early 1900s in the historic part of town. I loved it. All the hand carved woodwork and glass doorknobs with skeleton locks. It was exactly what I wanted and it was perfect for myself, a 22 year old female at the time and my husband, 27 year old male at the time. I was three months pregnant with our first and we were so excited to start our family. As we got settled in, we noticed that the house was very noisy. I rarely have my home quiet due to having tinnitus and we always need some kind of background noise to drown it out. On the rare occasion that the house was quiet, there was always lots of creaking and mostly moving coming from the loft style attic we had. We shook it off as the house settling and being old. At least that's what my dad told us. So we moved on. Spring came and we were scrambling to get ready for the baby. The house needed a lot of work, but we were determined to get it done. The first major encounter was on a beautiful spring day. It was the weekend and my husband and I were spending our day off working on the house. I was cleaning the kitchen and he was working on my car in our detached garage. The way this home was built, you could see the detached garage from the window that's above the kitchen sink. I would glance out every now and then and see what he was up to. A little time passed and I hadn't looked out at him. I started doing the dishes and I heard him walking into the living room toward the kitchen. I could feel his presence there. So without turning around, I said, Hey, babe. No answer. Wondering why he didn't answer me, I looked back over my shoulder, only to be met with the dark silhouette of a man standing between the living room and the kitchen. In the blink of an eye, the figure was gone. Unsure of what I had just seen, I yelled through the window for my husband, who was still in the garage and had been the whole time. He came in and I frantically told him that somebody was in the house. He immediately went to grab his weapon and checked all over the house, but nothing was there. In all of the years we lived at that house, not once did my husband see our little roommate, but I, I saw him all the time, out of the corner of my eye, peeking around corners. But more than anything, I saw him looking into the living room from the staircase that led to the attic. In the beginning, he frightened me, but after a while, I just kind of got used to him being there. I even spoke to him sometimes, telling him that I'm okay if he stays in the attic and asking him to leave my baby alone. He seemed to have agreed since in the last five years, my son lived there and he never saw him. When we went to sell our home, the realtor brought us some historical information she had found regarding the house and our neighborhood. 
We found out that our house and our neighbor's house was built by a brother and sister. Our home was the brothers. Their last name was the same as our current neighbor, so I figured he was most likely a descendant. I asked him one day, and he told me that the sister was his mom, and his uncle owned our home. He said that he was a kind man, who lived alone and died in the home many years ago. I asked him about the attic, and he said that that was his uncle's favorite place in the whole house. He kept all of his trinkets and projects up there, and would just spend hours working on things up there. I didn't tell him I believed my house was haunted. He didn't seem like the type who would believe me. Our home was listed and it sold within the same day. Sometimes I wonder about the man in the attic, if the new owners are nice to him, or if they've even noticed his presence. I do hope they'll give him his space, as they are only passers-by in his home, like we once were. So I finally talked my friend into moving from Seattle to Texas. We decided to split it into two parts, the first one last week moving her stuff in a rented SUV. Since we both had some time, we decided to take the trip on all the back roads. We stayed at a mineral springs resort in the middle of nowhere of Oregon, and that was amazing. On the second day, we got up to drive to Vegas. We took US 50 which is known as the loneliest highway in America. So I'll admit before this, it was eight to 10 hours before we had any human contact. I'm a former over the road trucker and a US veteran. So I'm used to traveling to different places and being in new surroundings every day. But it also taught me to listen to my instincts. Let me tell you, did they come in loud and clear while on this trip a few hours away from Vegas? We stopped to get gas, and as we rolled into the place, it just looked very aged and dated. My friend decided to get gas, and I walked inside to look the place over and get some snacks. I can honestly say that I can't point to any one thing that was wrong, but the feeling that overcame me was indescribable. It basically told me that this place was out of place, and if I wanted to leave or be able to, I needed to go, right now. Now I'll admit that it could just be my own experience and maybe because I had such a bad feeling, I was imagining things. But the minute I decided to leave without buying anything or even using the restroom, I swear everybody in this place started looking at me. I don't just mean the employees, but the patrons too. I walked quickly to the car and told my friend that if she believed in instincts, we should get in the car and leave right now. We did, and we didn't breathe easy until we were 10 miles away from that place. I've heard a lot of people have weird experiences and spooky encounters in the middle of Death Valley, and I guess now I do too. This story is definitely not the only paranormal experience that I've had, but it certainly was a unique one. I have a guardian ghost, or at least I think so. As long as I can remember, there have been weird things happening in my house. As a child, my parents purely blamed it on my imagination, but it continued and got even more visible during my teenage years. While a lot of the things that happened belong to another story, I'll concentrate on the very nice dude that seems to live there with us. He made his first appearance when my step-siblings and I were about five years old. I remember vividly playing hide-and-seek with them, walking into my room and seeing a ball rolling across the floor from behind the sofa. But nobody was hiding in that room. When I mentioned this to them years later, they confirmed that they also had had this feeling of another person playing with us. I've always heard footsteps in our house, up the stairs at night, 
behind me while walking up or down them. It was quite common. Then it started to become the whole house. When I was about 13, I used to spend about two hours home alone every day after school until my parents got home. Usually I would spend this time in my room. What would happen every day is that I would hear somebody unlock the front door and walk into my living room. And every day I would go downstairs thinking that one of my parents must have come home, but nobody would ever be there. It got me so paranoid that I started locking the door to my room when I was home alone, thinking somebody must be in the house with me. Then I started to hear breathing at night, in my room, like right next to my head when I was lying in bed. The first time it happened, I got so scared that I stuffed my blanket above my head. The next morning I told my mom about it, who said that I must have just heard my stepdad snoring in their room. That would mean that I had heard that through multiple closed doors between our rooms. Sure, Jan. Anyway, the breathing started to get more and more common. Not every night, but quite often. Then there was the first incident that now, looking back, makes me think that this paranormal roommate had tried to protect me all along. When I was 14, I had a friend. As it turned out, she was a very toxic and backstabbing person, but I hadn't realized that yet. She was over at my house after school, and we were upstairs playing Sing Star on my PlayStation 2. My mom came up to inform us that she would go to the store to get some groceries, and that we would be alone there for about a half an hour. This was okay with us. We waited until we heard her lock the front door, and then we closed the door to the room we were in and started to sing to all of our favorite 2000 hits. That was until my friend suddenly stopped and started staring at the door. I paused the game and asked her what was wrong, and that's when she just turned pale and told me that somebody had just knocked on the door very loudly. I hadn't heard anything, so I told her that she must have just heard something else. We continued our game, and about a minute later, the same thing happened. My friend stands there, just frozen, completely panicked, telling me that she needs to leave the room immediately because something is trying to get inside. Great logic, by the way. But I, who still hasn't heard anything, slowly opened the door. Nothing was there. My friend wanted to go downstairs, which we then did. But when we got to the middle of the staircase, she starts screaming. Of course, both of us start running, me being scared because she's screaming like bloody hell. Our first instinct was to open the back door and run outside where we waited for my mom to come home as my friend refused to set foot in the house again. When she calmed down a bit, she told me that when walking down the stairs, somebody started talking right next to her, right into her ear. Needless to say, she never visited again, which was good knowing now all the things she did later on. Anyway, I was very paranoid still that somebody might be in our house. Right under my window was our back door, which I didn't trust one bit when it came to protecting us from an attempted break-in. Every now and then, when I was lying on my bed at night, I would get afraid of any noises coming from that direction, because oftentimes it sounded like somebody was trying to open it. But anytime I got scared by it, this breathing would start again, and eventually it didn't feel scary anymore. It started to feel like somebody was trying to comfort me, trying to tell me that everything was okay, and that I wasn't alone. Which, looking back on it now, is not so comforting, because I was alone, but I digress. After what happened with my friend, I was glad to change schools. At my new school, I avoided topics like ghosts and stuff. I wanted to use the opportunity of making new friends without being the girl with the haunted house. Also, a part of me was thinking straight enough to acknowledge that the breathing only occurred when I was feeling scared, and might just be some kind of mental mechanism to calm myself down. That was until I had a sleepover with two of my friends at age 17. 
For reference, my room was kind of long. On the one side, it had my bed, and on the other, it had a sofa. There were like three meters between them. So Sarah slept on the sofa, while Ella slept in my bed next to me. Next to my bed was a rocking chair that my grandpa had once gotten from a garage sale. Keep in mind that I hadn't told them anything that had happened to me in the last couple of years. Since it was the first time having them stay over, I wanted to be a good host and asked them how they slept. Ella didn't say anything, but Sarah said, Okay, I know this is gonna sound super weird, but I couldn't sleep for most of the night. It was like somebody was just breathing into my face, but when I looked, nobody was there. I was shocked because this confirmed everything that I thought I had just imagined. Around this time, the thing with hearing the steps got worse. So much worse that my mom started asking me if I was jumping around my room in the middle of the night. My stepdad asked on several occasions what in the world I was doing in the kitchen at 3 a.m. because he kept hearing somebody walk around downstairs. I hadn't been doing either of those things. About two years had passed since the sleepover with my friends when Ella and I were talking to a friend of ours who had just gotten his first apartment. He told us to come over later on and I jokingly asked him if he had any furniture yet or if we would have to sit on the floor. He then proudly told us that he even had a very cool rocking chair. That's when Ella told us that she hates rocking chairs because she had a really creepy experience regarding one. Our friend wanted to know what happened, so she started telling her story. Well, I spent the night somewhere and there was a rocking chair in the room. When I woke up in the middle of the night, there was this tall stranger sitting on it, just watching me sleep. I was confused and said, that's so creepy, where did that happen? She said, it was at your place. And no, it wasn't my stepdad. Ella knows my stepdad and he isn't that tall. And also he wouldn't just be sitting in our room in the middle of the night. I wanted to get more information about it, but she refused to ever talk about it again afterwards. That's why she had been so quiet that next morning. The following years continued as usual. I even started communicating with this ghost. Whenever I got scared and heard the breathing, it always made me feel calm. So I started thanking him for letting me know that everything was okay. And whenever I thanked him, the breathing stopped. I once saw the guy that Ella mentioned too. I was walking down the hall past an open door and there he was just standing, a tall man with some kind of hat. I could only see the silhouette. And I left as fast as I could because it was still kind of creepy. Later on, after finally believing the stories that I had told them, my parents became more aware of everything. Even after I moved out, my stepdad continued to tell me that there was some ghost guy living with them. Like, yeah, I know, I've been telling you for years. On the rare occasions that I am at my parents' house, he rarely makes his presence known to me. Sometimes I can see a shadow passing by an open door or something small, but my mom still sees him. She just decided to ignore him. We're still not really sure what this could be. I can rule out any deceased relatives as there aren't many and nobody has ever died in the house. My parents built the house, so we were the first to live there. I thought that maybe he was just attached to me and that when I moved he might follow, but he never did. I also don't think he's attached to the rocking chair because it started before I ever placed that in my room. I guess he just thought it was comfortable? I don't know. Still, I hope someday I find out where he came from and why he's in our house. My house was built in the 70s, not particularly new, not particularly old. We moved here in the early 2000s. I don't really know any of the history behind the house. 
We've always joked that there were ghosts here. Doors slamming shut, creaking, and things randomly disappearing have always been blamed on ghosts. But around five years ago, it started to get a bit more aggressive. Sounds of light footsteps could be heard in the hallway, scratching from the second floor and from inside the wall. We have no rodent or pest problems, we checked, so it seems unexplainable to the entire family. Then, one day, about three to four years ago, I was home alone, sitting in the living room, when a loud bang happened on the second floor. It was so loud that I was worried the upstairs cabinet had fallen down to the floor. When the bang hit, my lights flickered and the TV turned off and then back on. I could feel the shake all the way from downstairs. I went up to check what had happened, but everything seemed the same. This has happened several times, and it is almost entirely identical. A loud bang, a shake, flickering lights, but nothing really happening. What makes this worse is that you can't hear it when you're upstairs. You can only hear it when you're downstairs. I've had people on the lower floor call my phone when I'm upstairs saying, stop slamming the door so hard, when I'm laying silently in bed and I can't hear it. In the past year, I have started to actually see things. I thought I was just imagining them at first. At one point, I saw a toddler sleeping in my brother's bed. I saw her very clearly. She was young, maybe three years old. She had long blonde hair and her arm hung over the edge of the bed. When I approached her, she disappeared. This was probably a year ago, but it still spooks me. Then a few weeks ago, I encountered her again. I was home alone when somebody knocked on the door. I was a bit confused as I wasn't expecting anyone. As I approached the hallway, I heard the door closing and a young girl say, hello, like she had just come home and was announcing her arrival. I felt chills run down my back, but I still opened the door to look. My brother is five and I thought maybe he had just come home early, but nobody was there. I closed a door today, like properly shut it, and then she opened it again. And when I looked at the open door, she shut it. Now I'm hearing banging sounds from downstairs and I don't know what to do. The dreams that I get in this house are always so vivid too, compared to when I'm not at home. Sometimes I wake up with the sheets off my bed and the blanket on the ground because I sleep so uneasily. This never happens when I'm out of the house though. Anyway, I don't really know what to do. I don't think speaking to her works. I tried, but then she just stops being noisy for a bit and then it picks back up. I really have no idea what's going on. As a kid, I was a huge fan of the paranormal, mostly due to my love for movies like Ghostbusters but never in my life did I think that I would live in an actual haunted house, or in my case, a haunted mobile home. This all started when I was around four years old. We lived in a pretty nice mobile home. Growing up, my aunt would babysit us, as both of my parents worked crazy hours to support our family of five. Before we went to sleep, my aunt had a habit of telling us ghost stories. One night, as my paternal grandmother was visiting from Puerto Rico, my parents moved my twin and I to the living room as my grandmother claimed our room for the night. I was already creeped out about sleeping in the living room, which was pitch black. What made it worse was that they decided to put the cup with my grandmother's dentures next to the sofa. Having a very overactive imagination, I started to scare myself with ideas of what those teeth could do to me in the night. I struggled to go to sleep as my youngest sister, who was about three months old, was getting fussy and not wanting to sleep herself. On what took my mom a while, she finally got my sister to sleep before 10pm. 
I was relieved, and then I went back to trying to get some sleep myself. As the night progressed, I was sound asleep until I was awoken by the noise. I didn't know what it was at first, and then I realized it was a girl laughing. Scared out of my wits, I hid under the blanket. I heard the laughing get louder and closer. I shook in fear and attempted to look up, but I heard the girl run away from me and start running all over the living room and into my baby sister's room. It was then that I heard my baby sister crying hysterically. I heard the laugh through all of the crying. I just laid on the sofa, trembling in fear as I heard both the laughter and the crying. Merged together, it was truly eerie. A few moments later, I heard running, and this time it was my mom getting up to get my sister and take her to the master bedroom on the other side of the trailer. I don't know how I did it, but I did manage to go back to sleep. The following morning, I asked my mom about it, and she told me she was getting that trailer blessed by a priest. A priest did come, and all of the activity stopped, or so we thought. After the first incident, I started elementary school. I became a very avid reader, as my now late maternal grandfather had gotten us to start reading at a very young age. I would read books on ghosts every chance I had, which I actually still do. Nearly two years after my first encounter with the ghost, my little brother was born. Everything had been okay, and that's when it started again. Around this time, I wasn't sleeping in the living room, but I could still hear the running from my bedroom. The reason being that the nursery was in the room next to the room that I shared with my twin. I started sleeping with the radio on just so I could avoid hearing that ghost running and laughing. One day, I was told to shower, as I had gotten pretty dirty from jumping into all the puddles outside. I heard my mom say that she was taking my siblings with her to the store and she'd be right back. The store was just two blocks away, so I figured it would be about 10 to 15 minutes to shower. I was singing in the shower, and then I heard that laugh. It scared me, as I had only ever heard that laugh at night and when one of my siblings was around. I immediately shut off the water, got a towel, and went for the doorknob. I kept trying to open the door, but I couldn't. It was jammed. I started crying, and the ghost started pounding on the door and laughing at me. It seemed to have gone on for a while, until, as suddenly as it started, it stopped. I then heard my mom call my name. She very easily opened the door and saw me on the ground sobbing. I had told her what happened, and she yet again called another priest to come and bless the trailer. Nothing happened there after that last blessing, since we moved about six months later. I don't know what's going on there now, though. The whole experience is a big reason that I usually shower with my door open halfway now. I also recently looked up the history of that neighborhood. As typical as it sounds, it seems that the area where I lived was at one point a makeshift cemetery before our city had an official cemetery. Our trailer had been positioned on top of the grave of a little girl. The whole neighborhood is known for a lot of hauntings. Sometimes I wonder if they removed the bodies or not, but I'll never know as it seems the trailer I lived in was moved and it's now a garden and parking spot for a house that was built on the lot next door. So this happened around seven years ago, in 2012 or 2013. I started high school, and the place I attended was in a different city from my hometown, so I stayed in the school's dorm. The place was on the outskirts of the city. It was a large area with two school buildings, two separated PE buildings, a study hall, a kitchen and cafeteria, and the dorm. It was a custom for freshmen to stay in the big bedrooms, the ones that could host up to 12 people. In the room that I was staying in, there were only seven girls, including me, throughout the whole year. Seven is a bad number in my country, similar to how some people don't like 13. Through the school year, we experienced really weird things happening. 
Every month, we gathered a handful of screws that weren't missing from anywhere. We found weird candy wrappings, old-style ones that nobody had had in the room. Once, three of us had to go home during the week because all of us had had some sort of accident. One time, our lock broke, which locked half of the group out and the other half in. The room was separated into three sections, and all three had double windows. One time, the middle inside window broke during the day, and there were just a lot of other small things that happened. We usually joked about them, even though we were all a bit uneasy, because they were happening so often. And because they were so frequent, we just shrugged them off. Then, the scariest thing happened. It was March 13th. I remember this vividly because we have a national holiday on the 15th and that meant a long weekend. One of my roommates was a sleep talker and she usually fell asleep before everyone. We had a habit of making fun of her a bit because it was always gibberish to us. Well, not that night. She fell asleep pretty early and talked about her boyfriend in her sleep. We silently laughed at her and after a while the others went to bed. Three other girls and I were sleeping in the last section, far from the door. We pushed together three beds and slept cuddled up most of the night. I was sleeping on one end of the beds, and the sleep-talking girl, Henriette, on the other end. There were two other girls between us, Yvette and Ata. I almost fell asleep when Ata let out a small scream next to me. I quickly sat up, and saw that Henny was pulling Yvette's ponytail and was choking her. We quickly get her hands off of Yvette and cuddled up on the bed, trying to stay away from her while calling her name, hoping that she would wake, but she didn't. Then she started to talk to us about, quote, the people who were locked up in the attic. She was talking about how they were free now and they were getting closer. She told us that these people would kill us all. By that time, everyone in the room was freaking out. The girls in front kept telling her to cut it out, but the people in the back, where I was, we feared for our lives. I'm not a religious person anymore, but I was back then. So at one point, I started to quietly pray, hugging the two sobbing girls. I didn't even say two lines when Henny said in a menacing voice, don't pray, that won't help you. One of the girls in the front screamed and turned the light on. It took us five minutes at least to wake up Henny, and when she woke up, she seemed terrified and started to cry and kept asking us what had happened. I left that school at the end of the school year, but that night still haunts me. About 10 years ago, my mom, two sisters, and I, and another small family that we were friends with, took a short trip to Northumberland. It's not too far from Alnwick Castle, where the first and second Harry Potter films were shot. My dad and the father of the other family had to work, so it was just our two moms and us seven children, aged between 5 and 15 years old. Because the other family was quite wealthy, and we were not, they paid for the accommodation, which turned out to be an old country house built in the late 1700s, Newton Hall. It has since been stylishly refurbished into a wedding venue, but was then an eerie and isolated shadow of its 19th century preoccupants. I remember us all being shuffled through dark wood paneled passages into a large staircase lined with old portraits. We joked about it being like Hogwarts, the portraits' grim inhabitants with their eyes alive and moving, following us as we climbed the stairs. What was first a joke soon became a genuine concern in the following couple of days. As a side note, I'm still amazed at how we had the whole place to ourselves, me being young then and not fully appreciating what the cost must have been to rent it out. My mom still claims it was because there were no more holiday rentals available in the area during summer implying that this grand hall was a sort of last resort, but 
I don't think so. Anyway, in addition to the creepy paintings, there was a huge Native American style totem pole with its garish peeling paint and beady eyes glaring from multiple heads. This stood watch on the landing of the second floor. In a so-called playroom were various animal heads mounted on the walls, and in the tall corridors on the ground floor were benches, their legs fashioned from a brutal mesh of deer antlers. It was the benches that were the first cause for alarm. On the first morning, upon waking up, we noticed that one or two of these benches had moved a few inches from their proper placement at the wall's edge. However, this strange but subtle event was not given any thought, at least until the next morning when it happened again. I remember distinctly that the blame was put to the eldest of the seven children, Michael, who had a sort of mischievous manner about him, but he denied it. This physical disturbance in the already extremely scary house was enough to make us sleep in pairs. I remember that my older sister and I were taking turns sleeping on the side of the bed that faced the wall, rather than be exposed to anything that might come in the night. Only one other thing happened that seemed poignant enough for me to remember now. Three of the girls developed some kind of rash while we stayed at the hall. The doctor diagnosed it as empedigo, an infectious skin rash which explains the coincidence. However, the cause still remains completely ambiguous and was never discovered. I don't know if it was a natural infection or something more sinister. Either way, the home was the scene of one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced, before or since, and I genuinely hope to not experience anything like that again. I personally don't believe in ghosts. Nonetheless, I am very interested in paranormal stuff, mostly because I enjoy a good horror story. Everyone experiences something creepy now and then, and even though I am a large skeptic, I too have found myself in some situations that creeped me out a bit. In the end, I always found a satisfying explanation for what I encountered. And then I probably just forget that it ever happened. Or I remember it and just find it funny because of how silly I was for being so scared. Most people experience their creepy stories at night, which is no big surprise because it's just natural to be more aware at that time. We tend to feel more vulnerable in the darkness. Our eyesight is no more reliable, which leads to the fact that sudden sounds or noises can't be easily explained. This leads me to some very strange encounters that I experienced in the middle of the day on a crowded street. It was May. The weather was very pleasant and warm. The local city marathon took place that day in which some of my mother's co-workers took part, so she took me with her to cheer them on. While the running track led around the inner districts of our city, we took shortcuts to get to the checkpoints in time. After a while, we crossed a bridge, which ended at an intersection. You could say there was quite a lot of traffic that day, and many other pedestrians and spectators of the marathon were crowding the street. As we waited for the pedestrian lights to turn green, I looked at the ground and my mother was holding my hand. I was around 11 years old. The sidewalk was very crowded, so there was hardly any space for everyone. I looked at my shoes, and then on the shoes of the other pedestrians. All of them were pointing to the street that they were just about to cross in a minute. When I looked up again, a young woman was standing right in front of me, looking at me and moving her lips, whispering strangely with tears in her eyes. She was standing so close that I would have touched her if I had just reached out my index finger toward her. I looked around, but nobody showed any kind of reaction, not even my mother, who was always very cautious and sometimes even snapped at me when I just looked at weird people on the street. 
It felt like no one else but me saw this strange woman. I'll never forget what she looked like. She was very skinny. Her skin was pale, dry, and kind of dirty, just like her clothes. She wore a beige worn-out cardigan, a long skirt, and damaged leather shoes. Her hair was light brown and short, chin length, and like the rest of her skin, her lips were very dry. Yellowish chunks of skin stood off of them as they moved while she was whispering straight into my face. I couldn't hear what she was saying. She was probably only moving her lips, but I really can't tell what exactly was going on there. I couldn't look away, and I was so in shock that I couldn't even say anything. When the pedestrian lights finally turned green, everyone moved forward. The woman stepped aside, and I guess she just stayed there on the sidewalk. I didn't see her crossing the street with us, and when I turned around on the other side, she was gone. How did she even get there? In the middle of the bridge was a lane of traffic. You couldn't access the bridge from any other side, because on both the left and the right was quite a large riverbank with bushes. It puzzles me to this day. This woman looked as if she'd been falling into muddy water and had let her clothes just dry onto her body. A few years later, I tried to find out if this bridge with the river underneath it was a common spot to jump off, or if something tragic had happened there. But in my country, it's nearly impossible to get public access to that kind of information. As a skeptic, I don't believe she was a ghost. It's more likely for her to be a deranged person roaming the streets. But I don't understand why everybody acted as if nobody was there. Even my mother looked over to me during the incident and didn't seem to mind at all. I wish I knew who this woman was and if she needed help. And if she did, why would she talk to a little kid instead of an adult? I would like to share a personal experience that I had in my childhood home in the early 90s when I was six years old. This isn't the first experience, and it definitely wasn't the last, but it's the only time that I ever truly saw her. A quick backstory. The house is a brick colonial, built by one of the very first families to settle outside of Philadelphia. They were a very affluent family who owned a large portion of land in the area and worked in the city. The house was lived in by their descendants well into the early 1900s, so, as you can imagine, a lot of history, births, deaths, and such were going on within those walls. As a child, I suffered from nightmares, a lot of them. It was commonplace for me to wake up in the middle of the night, jarred awake by some terrifying dream, and this time it was no different. On this particular night, I had awoken from a scary dream, and in order to calm myself down, I laid quietly in my bed and scanned the dark corners of my bedroom for some unknown threat. I have no idea what I expected to find, but I definitely remember the feeling of what could be hiding here in the shadows. As I looked around, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary at first, but then all of a sudden, there she was, standing in my doorway, staring directly at me. Her face was emotionless. She was very beautiful, with shoulder-length brown hair that had large waves toward the bottom, and she was wearing a long white nightgown. Forgive me for the cliché, but that's what she was wearing. I stared at her in shock and confusion, and she just stared back. I didn't understand what was happening, but what I did know was that there was a woman in my house in the middle of the night that I didn't recognize, and she was looking directly into my eyes. She was clear as day, as if somebody was just standing there, watching over their child as they slept. The wheels in my head were turning and all I could come up with was, this person should not be here. The next thing I remember doing was throwing the covers over my head, as you do, with my heart racing and thinking over and over, please go away, 
please go away. I have no idea how long I hid under the covers, but when I emerged, she was gone. From what my mother tells me, I didn't tell her right away what had happened. I think she said that I told her a couple of days later that I saw a woman in the house. From that point onwards, even to this day, when I visit my parents, who still live there, you had better bet that that door is shut. Friends ask me how on earth I could live there. The way I see it, her presence has never been malicious, and she lived there first, so it's just as much her house as it is mine if she chooses to stay. She does seem to have a sense of humor, though. I thought about saving that story for a different day, but it does directly correlate to the original, so I will add it here. Fast forward to last summer. I was back home for a short time helping to run the family business, which is also on the same property but in a separate building. The topic of hauntings came up with one of the employees that I had grown close with. I told her that we have a resident ghost in the family home, and told her the story that I just told you. She jokingly said to remind her never to come to visit. I reassured her that it wasn't that bad, and that I personally hadn't experienced anything recently when I visit. I even made a joke that perhaps she had moved out. We laughed, and that was the end of it. Or so I thought. That very same evening, I came downstairs to ask my mother something, and found that I was alone in the house. The property is pretty large, so it's not uncommon to be around and not know where somebody is. I went into the kitchen and found some almonds to snack on. Just then, I felt like someone was in the house with me. I figured it was my mom coming back, and I checked around the corner, but there was no one there. I called out to her and received no response. It was strange, but I shrugged it off and went back to snacking. I had my back to the entrance to the kitchen, and I was just sort of standing there, staring out the kitchen window and daydreaming. That is when I felt it. Someone poked me on the back of my arm. It was a playful poke, the kind you do when you sneak up behind someone and tap them to get their attention. In the time it took me to turn to see who was there, I remember wondering who it could possibly be. My parents really are not the type to sneak up behind you and poke you. It was no one. No one was there. I fully expected someone to be standing there, so when there wasn't, I was so taken aback that I let out a startled yell. I power walked straight for the front door and left the house. The feeling I had was like reality slapped me in the face. I'm completely convinced that it was her giving me a playful nudge, saying, I didn't move out, guess who's still here? That really freaked me out. I can handle little things here and there, but being physically touched? No thank you. Anyway, that's all. I just wanted to share my story. A few weeks ago, I was talking to my mom. It was a Monday night, and she looked pretty tired. So I asked her what was up. She told me that the night before, at about five in the morning, she was woken by the sensation of being watched. She had her back to the wall, but she felt as though someone was behind her, laying in the bed with her. She felt a cold chill and was paralyzed with fear. After a few minutes, she finally convinced herself to look. Of course, there was nothing there but it took her quite a while to fall back asleep. The funny thing is, at the same time in my room in the basement, which is nowhere near her, so her moving would not have woken me up, I was awoken by a sound, so I sat up to look, and there was a man standing at the end of my bed. Of course, it scared me so much, within a second I flung my covers off to sit up, but he was gone. There's a chair at the end of my bed, with no space to stand, and he couldn't have been that tall while sitting. We were both spooked. Today, I was sitting alone in my basement working on homework, and someone ran their fingers through my hair. I'm pretty sure our house is haunted. I 
I grew up in several haunted houses. Even now, we have an entity in our kitchen who we jokingly call the fridge ghost, as it likes to hang out by the fridge and occasionally open it in the middle of the night. But for now, I'm going to talk about a house I lived in until middle school. It's located on a street called Cherry, which my friends and I always joked about for obvious reasons. However, nothing about the feeling I had when I lived in that house with my family was anything to joke about. My friends never wanted to spend the night at the house I grew up in. All of them had the same bad feeling staying there. The sinking feeling that formed in the pit of their stomachs before something would happen. And unusual things inevitably would, more often than not. Doors would regularly open and close on their own. And this was something that I chalked up to the tilt in the foundation, at least at first. But when you hear your doors, cabinets, doors leading to the house, essentially anything with a hinge, slam in the middle of the night, you start to question if it's just regular house noises. The windows would open and shut on their own as well, which is a little harder to pin on a shifting foundation. There were a couple of times that the televisions would turn on and off on their own. Sometimes the volume on the TV sets would go up and down as well. And there were other times the channels would show up on the television sets that I've never seen. I could probably blame the odd television behavior on magnetism or the fact that both television sets were quite old. However, the strange things I would see on those off channels through the static are enough to convince me that there might have been something else going on there. I would often hear noises in the vents, like things were crawling around in them. Sometimes it sounded like bodies were being dragged through the ventilation shafts. Sometimes I would hear scratching on the walls or the windows or other out of the ordinary sounds like footsteps on the floor when no one else was there. My mom used to tell me that it was little woodland creatures who got into the insides of the walls, but I never saw these animals. The closest I came to seeing anything close to that was one family of skunks we found living under our porch. But after moving them out safely to the woods, we never saw any other animals that could account for making the types of noises I was hearing. Sometimes I heard whispering, and other times I heard yelling, like a faint cry through the walls. There were other times I would find weird yellow liquid on the walls or other similar substances. My mom used to tell me it was mold and not to touch it until she could clean it. But it didn't look like any mold I've ever seen. It didn't look like any of those substances could be made by anything living. I would also see ghostly figures wandering through the house. When I was young, I used to talk in great detail with what I think was a child female entity. It was more like a one-way conversation with the entity, although sometimes it would answer in its own way. I wrote an essay about my friendship with that ghost for one of my classes later on and submitted it as fiction so the teacher wouldn't think I was crazy. But the truth is that my friendship with that ghost and some of the other presences was very real. Of course, there was the typical haunting stuff too. Objects being thrown, pulled, or just simply going missing altogether. I used to joke with my mom that the wall trolls or house gnomes had made off with our stuff, to which she would just roll her eyes. When my mom started seeing some strange entities peering at us through the windows or as we were sleeping, she started to take my stories a little more seriously. She won't agree with everything I have claimed to see in that house, but she will definitely admit that there were presences that would appear. I often saw toys come to life, including a doll my aunt had brought me back from Russia. I had a dream that the doll was trying to kill me by choking me to death. When I woke up, the doll was sleeping next to me in my bed. No one had ever moved it there that night. I ended up blessing the doll and throwing it away. To this day, I don't like dolls and I won't sleep in the same room with one. I remember that the landlord who lived in the house next door was always asking us how things were going there. My mom told me to keep quiet about the things we saw because the rent was cheap and she didn't want to upset her. But even though I never got any direct answers from the landlord, 
I could see by her behavior that she must have known something was off with the house. Perhaps the strangest thing was that the house didn't particularly have a dark past or a history attached that would make it stand out as a hub for spiritual activity. The landlord was cranky and her attitude could have contributed to the overall negative energy. But other than that, we never knew what in particular made the house so haunted. I didn't exclusively see evil entities in the house either. Like I said, I made some friendships with the ghosts. And I even saw other entities, what I can only describe to be little people and entities that looked like what people say greys are, but they weren't aliens. This leads me to believe that the house was built on top of some kind of ley line or portal that opened up into other realms. Maybe instead of a haunted house, we just had a house with the gateway. I'm not sorry that I had the experiences that I did. In fact, I think it broadened my horizons and showed me from an early age that there's more to the world than what we can physically see. I will always think of the friendships I formed with the spirits and other entities fondly. For some people, my experience might have a rational explanation, and that's fine. I've always had an open mind, and I'm happy to listen to many sides of an argument. But for me, the experiences I had in this house growing up were tangible, and not just the imagination of an elementary school kid. They are something that has colored my view of this beautiful and mysterious world, and has opened my eyes to all kinds of realms of possibility. My story is about the house I lived in until I was five. My dad lived there after the divorce, and I visited often. It had been a family house on my dad's side of one kind or another since the late 1940s. It's also a house that's haunted. The whole family has ghost stories, most people more than one, and most of them involve the staircase that goes to the second floor. It's the first thing you see when you walk into the house. The staircase has been replaced six times, and I'm fairly sure that that's not normal in any house. Family legend says that the house, which was built in 1920, was the site of a murdered side in the early 1940s. Supposedly, the owners right before my grandparents told them that the owners before them were a young man and his new wife, who were hoping to start a new family. The story goes that the husband came home from work early one afternoon and went upstairs looking for his wife. One of the bedrooms has a door that opens directly to the top of the stairs, which was also my bedroom as a kid in the 70s. As he comes up the stairs, he's treated to an ever-expanding view of his wife and the neighbor guy having a good time in the guest bed. Instead of yelling or anything, he quietly goes downstairs into the back room, grabs his hunting rifle, and then goes back upstairs where he kills the wife and the neighbor. Then he calmly gets a length of rope from the garage and hangs himself from the second floor banister in the stairwell. The house sat empty for a while. The next family, the one selling the house to my grandparents, got the house for dirt cheap they redid the stairwell, staircase number two, and supposedly lived there 18 months before deciding to sell. My grandparents didn't really think much of it, mostly because they were pregnant, had three kids, the house was cheap, and they were poor. They went on to have nine total kids, and every single one of my aunts and uncles has stories about ghosts in that house. I have over 40 cousins, and they all have stories about ghosts and unexplained events in the home. Most of the stories involve seeing a hanged man, or a dark shape in the stairwell, a young nervous woman on the second floor, or an older woman that tends to sleeping children. Some experiences involve strange occurrences, like furniture and items that move or break when no one else is in the room. Some of the stories are scary, some are nice, but everyone has at least one, and usually they have several. 
After graduating high school, I was in and out of college and in and out of jobs. For a short period of time, I lived in this house during a summer when I was between jobs. My grandfather and my dad technically lived there, but stayed with other family members and girlfriends and were almost never home. A friend of mine was with me on the night that some weird things happened. She didn't officially live there, but she was basically living with me. I had told her about all the ghost stories and paranormal stuff, and we decide to dig out my grandmother's old Ouija board, the same one that I have now, and try to contact the spirits. We get everything out, put our fingers on the planchette, and nothing happens. The planchette doesn't want to move. So we set the mood, get out the incense, light the candles, and nothing happens. By now, I'm bored. It's 3 a.m., it's summer in New York, and it's kind of stuffy and hot inside. So I decide that I want to go to the back porch where it's cooler. My friend agrees, and we get up leave the board on the bed. And as we're grabbing shoes, we hear something fall off the bed. It's the planchette. We both jump up and then laugh because it was obviously on the edge and just fell, right? Except we were both pretty sure the planchette hadn't been anywhere near the edge and had in fact been in the very middle of the bed. We try and nervously shrug it off and then we're like, ooh, maybe it wants to talk to us. Being silly, we decide to ask one more question before we go out. This time, the planchette wants to move and starts circling as soon as our fingers touch it. Before we finish the question, what is your name? It goes to no. We laugh. Okay, all right, you don't wanna tell us your name. How old were you when you died? Planchette slips quickly across the board to no. Fine, all right, all right, what message do you have for us? Again, it goes straight to no. Now I'm figuring by this point it's my friend pushing it, because this is not any weak tentative moving around the board. It's forceful, and she is known for kind of messing around. So I basically grab the planchette and half jokingly, half seriously, throw it next to her on the bed. I was a little bit miffed at her for pushing it around and not giving it a chance. Besides, if you're going to be so obviously pushing the planchette, you should at least make the answers interesting. I say, I'm done, that was fun, but let's go to the back porch and smoke. As soon as I stand up, we hear the sound of a door slamming downstairs so hard that the windows rattled from the force of it. There are only three doors downstairs. The ones to the front door and back room had been closed and locked for hours, and the bathroom door was a piece of crap that could barely close, let alone slam. My dad and my grandfather were out of state visiting relatives, so I knew it wasn't them coming home. Neither of us wanted to go check on what had made the noise, but we left the room and we went to see that the stairwell was oddly dark. It was like all the shadows had just collected there. Like that part of the room was way darker than the rest. It was just so pitch black in that stairwell that I couldn't see beyond the first step of stairs. The rest of the landing is lit normally by some moonlight coming in the lone window on the second floor landing. But it just seemed as if that bit of light stopped at a wall as soon as it reached the stairs. The dark cloud in the stairwell seemed to move and shift a strange inky blackness that looked thick. At this point in time, the stairs are a wrought iron spiral staircase that my dad had put in. This was the fourth time the stairs had been replaced. They weren't very safe to climb down even when you could see. So I inch to the center of the room and pull the light switch so we can see what we're doing and not break our necks on the staircase. And of course, the light pole comes off in my hand. No light. I look to my friend thinking, okay, the roiling pitch black shadows in this stairwell must be my imagination. She can probably see just fine, so I would just follow her down. But no, she's staring at the stairwell with wide eyes full of terror. She turns to me and says, 
why the hell is it so dark? At this point, I realize that she can see it too, so I push her back into the room and slam the door shut behind us. I had one of those push button locks, so I quickly locked it. I turned back into the room, and my friend is stock still, staring at the floor by the bed. The Ouija board and the planchette are sitting perfectly centered on the floor. The planchette on no. And that would normally be fine, but we were sure that we had left the Ouija board in the middle of the bed with the planchette a good few feet away from it. I have never done a room cleansing and protection and closed a Ouija board so fast in all my life. We went on the rest of the night chain smoking, huddled in a corner, twitching and just trying to tell each other happy stories. Morning comes and of course everything is fine and normal and we laugh at ourselves because it was probably just the nerves and staying up too late. By the time the coffee was done brewing, we had all but convinced ourselves that everything that had happened was due to overactive imaginations. We go to the backyard to check the vegetable garden and hang out on the porch drinking coffee. We find some crushed tomato plants next to the tree by the porch. And then we find some cigarette butts in a spot behind the tree where you can see my bedroom window, but can't be seen in the dark. I guess it's a good thing we didn't go out at the witching hour. Coincidence? Overactive imaginations? Still freaks me out to this day. In a weird way, it was like the house was protecting us. Like it knew that we shouldn't go outside. I've looked for years trying to find any shred of truth to the murder side story. I was able to find that the house was built in 1920, and although I can't find any paper evidence of specifically a murder side, a search of the county coroner's records do show gun murders and hanging sides in that town in the 1940s. In town, the story was common knowledge. Everybody in the family knew it. The neighbors knew it. Was it true? I don't know. I would think that there would be more records of something as sensational as that, especially in the early 1940s. However, while researching the history of the house, I did find another true tale that's even older, from a regional newspaper dated March 16th of 1896, which is coincidentally the same day I found the story. It read, killed a woman and himself, Thomas P. was enraged because Minnie M. scorned him. Thomas P. killed Minnie M. this morning at the farm half a mile north of here and then killed himself. Both were in the employ of Mrs. M. He was infatuated with her, but she gave him no encouragement. He threatened a few days ago that he would kill her. The farm mentioned in the article is where my house was built and the street is named for the family that owned the farm. My girlfriend landed a gig where she has to watch this eight-year-old and she decided to bring me along as well. When we got there, the mother was running late, so we sat in the living room and talked to the kids. The little girl that we were babysitting and also the teenage daughter were in there. So as the conversation naturally runs its course, the little girl mentions the ghosts that she's seen and met and even felt. I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky sort of dude, so I edged along the topic of these ghosts to which the little one happily obliged. However, I noticed that the older sister started to get a little nervous or anxious and tried to talk over her younger sister. This intrigued me. The girl went on to describe all the ones that she has seen and felt, explaining that there are good ones and bad ones. So whatever, right? Just a silly kid's imagination running wild at night. Apparently they had already had somebody come in and cleanse the house though meaning that it was a reality for the family after all. On a final note, the little girl also mentioned that she thinks they missed one. The cherry on top is that the most active room in the house was right beside where we were sleeping in the basement. 
Fast forward to the nighttime, and when we were trying to fall asleep, my girlfriend and I started to feel a bit nervous, and that feeling kept multiplying until I started conversing in my own mind with whatever was in the room with us. As I finished my sentence, saying something like, I know you're here, I felt ice-cold chills run from my left side to my right side, and as they took over my body, I stood up and said, Hello? Right to my girlfriend. Safe to say we spent the rest of the night upstairs. I don't know if it was just nerves or my mind playing tricks, but it was definitely weird. My story is from when I was growing up at my parents' house in Burton, Michigan. Since I was about seven or eight, all the way up until I moved out, I witnessed several odd occurrences. My dad was an over-the-road truck driver, so I was home with my mom most of the time. Weird things that have happened include tapping on the walls, voices, being touched, feeling like you're being watched, and even a full-on person that disappeared in front of me. There have been several instances where I, and my friends who I have never told this to, have heard chunks of conversation coming from other rooms or downstairs. When I went to investigate, it would immediately stop. I was home alone, the TV was off, and the windows were closed. There have been a few other events, such as tapping on walls, doors shutting, and very clear footsteps walking along the hardwood floors. Once, they even went past me so close that I could feel it in the floorboards. The creepiest thing was one day a friend and I were down in the basement, which consisted of a large family room, a laundry room, and my dad's workout room. The door to the workout room did not have a doorknob since they were refinishing the house. There was only a hole in the door for one. I don't remember why, but my friend and I looked through the hole and clearly saw a man sitting on a weight bench. She thought it was my dad. We didn't think anything of it until shortly after at dinner when I asked my dad why he wasn't at the table. I then learned that he was a few states away out on the road still. I had thought he came home. I told my mom and she immediately called the police thinking that there should have been someone in the house. She said she heard commotion in that room earlier in the day but she thought it was us. There was no sign of anyone being in there. Another creepy thing happened in the basement. Some friends and I were in the family room playing Nintendo 64, and clear as day, a man walked right past the double sliding laundry room doors. The room is like 30 by 8 and has a set of the bifold closet doors as an entrance. Almost all of my friends saw this. The man walked past, and right before he was out of sight, turned toward the wall and made a motion like he was opening a refrigerator door and putting something in. He then walked out of sight. We went in there to see who the hell it was and there was nobody there. I've been living on the other side of the state for three years, but my mom still lives there and is most of the time alone with the dog since my dad is still on the road a lot. She says that she still hears the conversations and the footsteps quite often and has seen the guy in the basement twice. I'm skeptical, but honestly, I don't know what to make of it. There have been multiple witnesses, and I've tried to debunk everything, but I just don't know how to explain it. house has always kind of had weird, unexplainable events happening in it, but nothing worthy of really telling. I've heard sudden scurrying footsteps, slight banging in the kitchen, stuff like that. I don't know where it comes from or why it happens, but I usually just figure it's a ghost. Today though, another weird event happened, except that it was way worse than anything else. I was home alone while my dad was at work. I slept very late the night before, so I was still asleep late into the afternoon. 
I woke up at about 12.30 p.m. to my dog barking. I sleep with her in my room, so it woke me up instantly. She was on the floor in front of the bedroom door. I went over to comfort her to make her stop barking. I didn't really think much of it. I figured she had just heard a noise outside. So I picked her back up, checked the time, laid down and turned over to try to continue sleeping. I was slightly worried because her barking usually means that she heard something loud. But I tried not to think about it and went back to sleep. I suppose it's also worth noting that I was facing the window next to my bed when I fell asleep. About two or three minutes later, I heard loud footsteps in the grass outside. My dog started barking again, so I tried to silence her out of panic. It sounded like it was right by my window. A big black silhouette sprinted past the window. My window has blinds over it, so the details were obscured. The window is about four feet tall. If you were five foot tall and stood by the window outside, your head would barely be visible. But this silhouette covered the entire window top to bottom. So given the height of the window and all that, and based on what I could see, I figured this thing had to be like 10 to 11 feet tall. It was also about as thick as a third of the window. Whatever it was, this thing was huge. It basically looked like a tall rectangle running by. There was a small crack in the blinds near the bottom where you could peek out and see outside. I only had time to glance at it, but I saw the color black, probably part of that figure. Another thing about the footsteps, I didn't hear any footsteps indicating that somebody was approaching. The sound of the footsteps basically just appeared next to my window and quickly faded out as soon as the thing passed by. There was no sound indicating that it had run off either. It just stopped. It was like it only existed to pass my window and then vanished. I heard some leaves crunching when it ran by, so I definitely would have heard it if it had approached or departed in the same way. This all happened in the span of one or two seconds. I was scared, so I picked up my dog and stared at the crack in the blinds for about a minute, expecting to see something happen again. Nothing did, so I just went back onto my bed and decided to call my dad. I asked him if he could come pick me up and take me to his work since I didn't want to be home alone anymore. I tried to whisper and tell him everything that had happened. He agreed and began to drive to the house. It took about a half an hour. I just sat on the bed, trying to calm myself with phone games. I occasionally looked over to see if anything happened, but luckily nothing did. Eventually, my dad came home. I left my room to go talk to him about what had happened. And apparently something else happened that I didn't know about. Outside on the porch, we have a big umbrella pole placed inside of a hole in the wooden table so that it wouldn't fall over. It's been through extremely windy nights, but it's never fallen over. The umbrella is practically embedded in that little hole, so it's very sturdy. My dad told me to look outside. The entire umbrella was on the ground, as though somebody had pulled it out and then tossed it there. The wooden table was still oriented upright, so the umbrella wasn't just knocked over. If it were, the table would have fallen with it. The only thought that I have is that the weird creature I heard is what knocked over the umbrella, or rather took it out and threw it on the ground. And that's when my dog first started barking and woke me up. I probably just didn't hear it since I was asleep. I left to my dad's work and I'm still there telling the story. I honestly don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's haunted, I don't really know what's going on, but I definitely feel unsafe at home. I've had some crazy things happen to me at my house. My neighborhood sits on top of a Native American burial ground. 
There are even some ruins and a burial mound in my friend's backyard, literally. Also, there was a revolutionary war battle about a mile down the street. Fun stuff, right? Ever since I moved into that house with my parents about 13 years ago, I was four, my little brother was around one, now I'm 17 and he's 14. A lot has happened. My brother, who was six at the time of this story, used to run around the house claiming to be chased by a monster. My mom and I were sitting on the couch one day and he was standing in front of the TV, but then he started shaking and ran to my mom and sat on her lap. He said that a lady tapped him on the shoulder and asked if she could speak with his father. You could bet my mom picked up both of us like footballs, got in the car as fast as possible and went to my grandma's. For the longest time after that though, things have been quiet. Something happened, it was very minor. Within the last five years, however, things have really kicked up again. For example, once I was standing in the kitchen at around age 13, I was staring out the window and I heard my name whispered in my ear really softly. I remember saying, yeah mom, only to look and see her fast asleep on the couch in the next room. Another time at around three in the afternoon, while I was home alone with my brother who was napping upstairs, I heard a knock on the door and a couple of kids giggle pretty loudly. I answered the door right away, too fast for them to have run off, but no one was there. My mom heard a loud crash once and the little kid giggle while in the living room. She ran into the kitchen to call my dad and tell him about it. While she was in the kitchen, the garbage can lid started swinging. My dad, who's never experienced anything paranormal until last month, was working in the garage. The cap that keeps the air inside of a bike was thrown at him from across the room. I don't know why all of a sudden these things just started happening out of nowhere after all these years of silence. My mom runs around the house with holy water after every experience because she's scared that it's going to hurt someone. I kind of doubt that. It's never hurt anybody before. It's only given us inconveniences and scared us, but I guess anything is possible. Does anyone have any explanation? All of these things happened at my now ex-boyfriend's house. I would spend a lot of time at his house overnight, as his neighborhood had more things to do, and his bedroom was more private than mine. We were both 19 to 21 during this time period. First, I should mention that his family practices the Yoruba religion, and would leave water and offerings for individual deities. They were very in tune to that aspect of the universe. I had also felt growing up that I could feel things and spirits. Not necessarily communicate, but I could feel them and acknowledge them if I didn't think they were dangerous, and was generally chill and not really scared, as long as I knew that I wasn't doing something to upset them or vice versa. Whenever I encountered these things, I just sort of had this thought of like, oh, that's a ghost, and then I kind of moved on. In his house, his bedroom had a door that led down a flight of stairs into the backyard, and also into the basement. Basically, you come down the stairs, do a U-turn, and bam, you're looking at the basement. If you go straight just a couple of steps, then you're in the backyard. He has a washer dryer down there, and there was also some storage. It was dark, damp, and had a concrete floor not really a place you want to hang out in. Occasionally, we would go down to get the laundry, and I always found myself looking into the back of the basement and just knowing that I was not welcome to pass any farther than the dryer. Even at the dryer, I can only explain it as clear words popping into my head. You're not supposed to be here. It was in my own voice, but it would always leave quickly. And sometimes, just in case, I would give a nod of respect toward the back of the basement. I avoided going down there as much as I could. Additionally, sometimes when in bed late at night, I would hear creaking on the stairs. 
At first, I summed it up to an old house settling and changing with the temperature. But over time, I could not deny that it was the distinct sound of footsteps. It would always stop by the door to the basement, and I would stare at the door, waiting for it to open. But it never did. One day, we were sitting at the kitchen table with his mom and dad, and I don't remember how it got brought up, but I mentioned that I always felt unwelcome and like I wasn't supposed to be in the basement. I also mentioned that the words, you're not supposed to be here, would repeat in my head. His mom and dad shot a wide-eyed glance at each other. I said, what? Very matter-of-factly, his mom says, there's the ghost of an old man who stays down there. I immediately felt validated and got chills and described exactly where I felt unwelcome. She confirmed that he does hang out in the very back of the basement. She also told me that sometimes she'll leave a shot of whiskey for him when his activity picks up. He's apparently cranky by nature, but that seems to calm him down for a few weeks. She said that he was harmless, but I already felt that. He just didn't like me in his space. She left some whiskey for him the next day, and I think spoke to him and somewhat told him who I was. The feeling of unwelcomeness never left, and I would still hear the creeping on the stairs, but I made sure to acknowledge him whenever I went to the basement, and I never went into his space at the back. Bonus, his sister's room is on the same level, and when she was a kid, she used to have nightmares of a girl crying in her room, and swears that as she got older, she has seen her curled up in a ball on her floor when she wakes up in the middle of the night, and she'll hear a random cry if she's in her room alone during the day. All in all, a very strange experience. So, my family moved into the house in question in 1999. I was five at the time. The house isn't too old, built in the 70s, and I live in a very small community. So as far as I know, nothing bad ever happened there. Just to give you a quick layout of the house. When you come in the front door, to the left is a hallway, and the last door on the left is my bedroom. But there is a bathroom at the very end of the hallway. And the way the house was laid out is such that whenever the bathroom door is open, the mirror reflects back down the hall toward you. Things only happened after the sun went down. Ever since I was young, I would always wake up in the middle of the night either thirsty or hungry, so I would go to the kitchen to make a snack. While walking back to my room down the hall, I would always feel something right behind me, reaching trying to grab a hold of me, which of course forced me to speed walk or light sprint back to my room, where I would sit quietly trying to calm my heart. Whenever the bathroom door is open though, and you could see your reflection in the hall, I never felt like I was being followed, but I would see shadows running around behind me or peeking their heads out around the corner like they didn't want to be seen. Shortly after we moved in, we got a dog, since then we always had dogs in the house. We've had three in total, and most of the time, if I was ever home alone, they would come and hang out with me. And every dog, even to this day, will occasionally just stare at my bedroom door that leads to the hall, or even snarl at it. Fast forward a few years to 17 to 18 year old me, I'm working a part-time retail job where I keep the keys to the store. On some occasions, I had the mornings off, and someone would need the keys to open, so I left them in the mailbox outside my front door just so I wouldn't have to wake up early. It happened on two occasions where my coworker John would come to get the keys in the morning, and as he was getting back in the car, he would see somebody staring at him through my dad's bedroom window, which was the room next to mine. John stared at him for a few minutes and waved a little, but the figure didn't move or react. He would just look down to start his car, look back up, and the figure would be totally gone. 
He described the figure as a wrinkled old man with a bald head. Nobody in my family has ever matched that description. And at the time, my entire family had left for work, and I was still sound asleep in bed. I'm also not an old man. John had refused to ever go back to get the keys again after that. I don't know how many entities I have in my home, and though I have an uneasiness and nervous feeling, I never felt outright threatened. Until one day. I was 22 at the time. I was just in the basement getting laundry on a normal day. Nothing was off. Nothing felt weird. It was 100% normal. I was finished folding all my clothes, so I went to carry them upstairs to my bedroom. And as I was climbing the stairs, I heard loud stomping coming from behind me, down the hallway where the laundry room was. Then they sped up, as if somebody was running full sprint toward me. I spun around, and I saw this black figure round the corner and barrel up the stairs. It made it to within an inch of my face, and then disappeared. I almost shat myself. I've never felt such anger and malice in my whole life. I ran to my bedroom, slammed the door, and just sat there in silence, listening for any bit of movement at all. But it was completely still. Those are the experiences that I have had so far. I can only guess what might come next, but I think it's safe to say I definitely live in a haunted house. I've had many paranormal experiences but I thought I'd share this one in particular. My mother-in-law died quite unexpectedly during Christmas in 2013. She was in a coma for about a week before she died. She lived in a senior living community in Southern California called Laguna Woods. While my mother-in-law was in the hospital and following her death, my husband, one-year-old son and I stayed at her place at the time, we lived in Texas, but we're from Southern California, and all of our family are here too. One of my first experiences was in the middle of the night. I picked up my son out of his pack and play because he was crying. I held him as I walked to the living room to sit on the recliner and rock him. I didn't turn on any lights, as there was enough ambient light to see. Just as I was about to sit on the recliner, I was startled because it looked like someone was already sitting there. I immediately stood back up because of my natural reaction of thinking somebody was already there. It sure did give my heart a jump. From about then on, I felt a presence. It didn't scare me, but I was definitely aware of it. I don't believe it was my mother-in-law. I believe it may have been a previous owner. I felt that it was probably a woman but sometimes it felt like a man. So my mother-in-law's death brought together some of my husband's family who had been estranged. My husband's uncle has an adult son with whom they had a falling out for several years. Word of my mother-in-law's passing got to the estranged son, which is a cousin of my husband, and he showed up at the memorial and surprised his family. They had a positive and emotional reunion he only stayed for the memorial and then left for home. After the memorial, my husband's side of the family and I went back to my mother-in-law's house for an after-party visit sort of thing. They stayed for several hours and it was a great reunion. We ordered pizza and I called my sister, who lived in the neighborhood, to come over. She came and socialized and it was nice. Nothing remarkable happened until the next day. So my sister calls me the next day to catch up and see how we're doing, and we talk about the previous day and night's events. She commented on how nice it was to see my husband's family, and how great it was that my husband's uncle reconciled with his son. She added that it was so nice that the son had come over to the house afterward. I said he didn't come over. He went home immediately after the memorial. My sister said, really? I could swear he was there. 
I explained that the only men present were my husband, his uncle, and an older cousin. My sister said she saw a man, maybe in his early to late thirties, wearing khaki pants and a sweater vest standing between the living room and kitchen. She said she made eye contact with him a couple of times and he smiled. She said he looked like he was listening and observing the conversations that were going on in the kitchen and living room, but he wasn't talking to anyone. She said her intention was to go and chat with him, thinking that it was the formerly estranged son, but was caught up in conversation with other relatives. She said that when she was finally free to go and chat, she couldn't find him anywhere. She didn't think anything of it at the time, she figured he just left. Since I already had an experience with the recliner sitting person, this made my blood run cold and honestly gave me the chills. Eventually, my husband had to return to Texas to work. My son and I stayed in California for a few weeks to clean out my mother-in-law's house. It was during my stay that more weird things happened. One night, I was lying in bed reading when I felt someone watching me from the hallway. My body had its own reaction to the presence that I couldn't control. I felt anxious, but not scared. Just that I knew someone was in the house besides me and my son was an eerie feeling. I finally made a deal with the ghost or ghosts. I said, listen, I know you're here and that's okay. Just don't scare or harm me or my son. Otherwise, you're welcome to stay. I can't recall the exact timeline, but one morning I found my one-year-old son completely unclothed in his pack and play. He had never ever removed his clothing before this and he's never done it since. Even his diaper was missing. At the time, I thought it was some new phase with him taking off his clothes, but he never did it again. Not even a sock. I truly believe some entity was responsible. It was just too out of his character to take off all of his clothes. Again, I reiterated our commands to the ghosts. You're welcome here, just don't scare or harm me or my son. I had help from my family packing away items that we wanted to keep. During this time, another sister of mine came from the hallway and said that she smelled perfume strongly in the hallway like Chanel number no. 5. There were only three of us at the house that day and all of us were working together in the kitchen. No one had been in the hallway other than to pass through to get to the restroom. I smelled the perfume a couple of times too, on different occasions. My mother-in-law had all kinds of aversions and I never knew her to wear perfume, so I didn't think it was her spirit. Also, during this packing day, I was packing up her china from the china cabinet, and I suddenly got an overwhelming scent of body odor. I even did a pit check of myself, and it wasn't me. I did a covert sniff of my sister and friend helping me that day, and they didn't smell like it either. I was hesitant to tell them, but then I just had them come over to the china cabinet area and ask if they smelled anything. They both said B.O. and it wasn't any of us. I just chalked it up to another spirit encounter. Another time, I was getting ready to host the estate sale in the house. Everything was prepped and ready for a 7 a.m. start time the next day. As part of the setup, I had my mother-in-law's shoes neatly displayed on a shoe rack in the master bedroom just a few feet from the side of the bed that I was sleeping in. I got up that morning and showered. Nothing was amiss. When I came back into the room, the racked shoes were on the floor next to the bed that I had just woken up from. The rack was still in place properly, it's just that now all of the shoes were on the floor. I froze in place when I entered the room and saw the shoes. I was like, what the hell is going on here? There's no way they could have just fallen over by themselves and then been neatly placed there. They had been squarely placed on the rack the night before. I would have had to step over them to get out of bed. Additionally, some of the shoes were far from the rack. Even if they had fallen, there's no way they could have rolled that far. And it wasn't my son because I immediately checked on him and he was still sound asleep in his pack and play in a completely different room. Fast forward to later in the day of the estate sale. Another couple of friends came over to help me. After a busy morning, we had a lull in the afternoon. We tidied up a bit and put things back in place that had been handled by shoppers. 
We took a break and sat on the porch and chatted while we enjoyed the lull. I recounted to my friends about how I thought the house was haunted. One friend was really spooked when I told her about the perfume. She said that she too smelled it in the hallway earlier that morning. She said that she was walking behind a man in the hallway and she had an overwhelming scent of perfume. She thought it was odd that a man would be wearing such strong women's perfume. I said, well, you've met my ghost. Now for the really freaky stuff. So after I recounted all the incidents above to my friends during our break, I did a walk around of the house just to double check that things were in order for the next round of shoppers. I go into the master bedroom and the frigging shoes are on the floor again. I screamed this time. My friends came running to see what happened. They saw the shoes and they were like, you're messing with us. I said, I swear to God, I'm not messing with you. These shoes were not on the floor before. When we tidied up, I re-racked all of them. And the shoes were almost in the same exact position that they had been in that morning when I found them on the floor after my shower. Freaky, man. We eventually sold the house. I asked the realtor if there was a disclosure law for haunted houses. She said she's never heard of such a thing. I told her about how I thought the house was haunted, but she probably just thought I was crazy. Either way, I definitely experienced some paranormal activity there, and I would be so curious to find out if the new owners did as well. So a few months back, I moved into this beautiful two-story house with my mother, and we had a roommate with two kids in a great neighborhood. The price was suspiciously cheap, but at the time, we didn't think twice about the price. Anyway, the first night was a little creepy. I thought I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. My mom was close to the stairs on the second floor, so I always heard who comes up and down, but... I just dismissed it, thinking it was just the house settling, as they say. Plus, I thought to myself, people always get a creepy vibe the first night they move into a new place, right? So after a few tosses and turns, I eventually fell asleep. Now this was the first night, and the next encounter didn't happen for a few weeks, but this definitely got everyone in the house spooked. That night after work, I came home, happy that I had the next day off. So as soon as I got home, I got ready to play a game. As I sat down, I felt this presence in the room. But it was only me, and it literally felt like something evil was looking directly at me. I felt drained, but at the time, I didn't think much of it. Looking back on it now, it was almost like something was stealing my energy or feeding off of it. But as normal, I dismissed it and went to go ask my roommate if she wanted to smoke and she said yes. So we went outside and we were talking for a good bit. But out of nowhere, she brought up how she felt about the house. Then she told me what happened to her earlier that day. She told me that when she came outside to smoke as she was sitting on the stairs, which is where we always smoked, she happened to turn and she saw the blinds from our living room open. She saw a figure looking directly at her, but when she turned to get a better look, it vanished. She said she didn't go back into the house for a few hours, but when she did, nothing was there. To me, it seemed like nothing. I honestly thought she was just seeing things, but we both felt like there was always something watching us. This is when things get a little scary. About a week or two passed and my roommate and I were down in the basement smoking because it was snowing outside. We finished up and then her two kids wanted to play, so we both stayed downstairs and watched the kids play. We were sitting a good bit away from the stairs when we saw her youngest son look up the stairs. The creepy thing is the way he turned and made it look like somebody had called him. Mind you, we were both looking at him at this time, so when he turns, he then slowly looks up the stairs as if he was trying to make out what he was looking at. As soon as his head stops, I'm assuming that's when he saw whatever it was he saw, and he started crying, 
like literally bawling. When his mother called his name, he just smiled and ran towards her. From our point of view, we couldn't see up the stairs because there was a wall covering it. But we know he saw something. That's when we knew the house was probably haunted. Since she was home more than I was, and more than my mother was, she had stories about doors being opened that were originally closed. You know, the normal haunting stories. But now we started to believe her even more. My mother said she started to feel depressed whenever she got home. This was the scariest thing that happened to me personally. We were moving, and at first everything was going smoothly. I was packing up the living room, and my mother was packing up her room. The roommate had already moved out, so it was just the two of us. After a few minutes of moving, I heard a loud bang. It was as if a bowling ball had fallen off of a countertop. It came from upstairs. So I went to go check it out. Nothing fell. Nothing was on the ground anywhere. My mom and I were pretty spooked, so we left to get some extra boxes and then we came back. When we got back, it was nighttime, and I went upstairs to pack up the kitchen. As I was doing so, I heard this loud, demonic screeching sound. I know it sounds far-fetched, but it's true. At the time, I didn't think much of it. In my head, I knew it came from in the area I was in, but when you're in a situation like that, sometimes defenses take over and you just try to brush it off. So I brushed it off. Thought it was just a car from outside that had a bad break or had to brake hard. Anything other than what I'd actually heard. I proceeded to pack the kitchen. When I opened the cabinet, I heard the loud bang again. So I looked around. And then I looked back into the cabinet, proceeding to close it and run downstairs. Literally nothing had fallen in that room. I was running downstairs when I heard the screech again. But this time, it came from inside the cabinet. I was still close enough to tell. It was almost like I felt a gust of wind blow past my head at that point. And I swear it felt like something went through my forehead. It felt like a punch. It wasn't like a fist punch, but like an energetic punch. It didn't hurt, it was more like a force that went through my body that I could physically feel. I booked it downstairs and told my mom what happened. Needless to say, we moved a lot faster than expected. If anyone has any experience with this stuff, please tell me what really happened to us. I always find it kind of odd, ghosts and demons and stuff like that, but maybe they are real. Something clearly was going on at that house. I just wish I knew what it was. I used to live with my mom and her ex-boyfriend in a really big house. It was around 6,000 square feet and it gave me bad vibes from the very start. Whenever I voiced it to my mom and her ex, they would just brush it off and tell me that I was imagining things. They were always traveling and going places while I had to stay behind because of my job. I was okay with this. I enjoy being alone. I was about 19 and after my friends had left for the night, I did my nightly rounds throughout the house. I would always check to make sure that all the doors were locked and all the lights were off. Once I made sure of that, I went to my bathroom to get ready for bed. My bedroom was the only one on the main floor. It was a four bedroom house, meaning that there were three upstairs, one being directly over my room and bathroom. My room and bathroom are separated by a small hallway, which can be closed off by a sliding door meaning that there was a door to my bedroom and to my bathroom, which I always left open because I could close off that little hallway, so it was still private. I start washing my face, and as I'm doing so, I hear what sounds like footsteps directly above me. I freeze in place and listen. They stopped. I shrug it off and continue. It's late, and I'm just hearing things, so I go back to washing my face. Then it happens again, but this time a little louder. Again, I freeze. 
I know that I'm not just hearing things. But what can I do? They stopped, and so I went back to washing my face. Then it happened again. I stop again. And then I hear, and actually feel, one of the loudest bangs I've ever heard in my life. It was like a 400 pound person jumped off of a bed onto the ground. That's what I heard. I felt the rumble. If that wasn't enough, right after that, my bedroom door slams shut. I'm freaking out at this point. And I run into my room to grab my machete. I thought that somebody was in my house. So I run to the kitchen yelling, whoever's in here, I'll kill you. I still have soap like dripping down my face onto the ground too. Seeing that all the doors are still locked, I run back into my bathroom and rinse off my face. I packed a bag and called my best friend. I told him what was happening and he says, get the F out of there. So I keep him on the phone as I finish packing a bag and get outside into my car. As I'm pulling out of my driveway, I notice something upstairs. Every single light is turned on. And I know for a fact that just 20 minutes before when I had checked everything, they were off. I didn't even think twice. I just kept reversing and didn't look back at the house. I've seen enough scary movies to know that there would have been a figure in one of those windows staring at me had I looked back. I'm sure of it. I went back the next day to see if somebody actually did break in, but there was no sign of forced entry. All the doors were still locked. Nothing was missing. All of the light upstairs had also been turned back off. Fast forward six months and we move out. My mom then tells me that the house was turned into a hospice after the original owner from the 1930s was widowed and got lonely. She turned the house into a place for those who didn't have any family to die peacefully so they wouldn't be alone. That explains an awful lot.